this afternoon. We are covering the latest blow of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg's apology tour for you, the people of the Internet. And in about 30 minutes, Zuckerberg will begin his highly anticipated testimony before Congress. But how did we get here? What are we expecting to hear today from the tech giant? Jacob and I will hopefully have you covered. Yes, it is. Uh, lots, of, lots to cover today. Um, we're, we're wondering if we have a quick rundown. Mark Zuckerberg is going to testify in front of the Senate today, the House of Representatives. Tomorrow, today is a jam session of the Commerce and Judiciary Committee. We begin with this company handling of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Mark's going to miss it. Uh, and if you have a second edition, we will explain it to you all uh, today. Uh, that is the Significant Consulting Group, a dollar of $87 million. It's among a departure guide and uh, users data, at least the same group, uh, of course, that had that sunken team in 2016 to run data operations for the campaign. Uh, that brings in U.S. elections analysis, Russia meddling, the credit for you, uh, Congress wants to know very important questions. Most importantly, what role does Facebook play uh, in all of this today? And we saw in Zuckerberg's planned remarks that were released just that's exactly what he's planning to address. And some questions that he will likely be asked are, why did it take so long for execs to disclo disclose what they knew about what Cambridge Analytica had? And should Facebook allow users to opt out of targeted ads? And how can it prevent another data breach from happening? And uh, we are getting right now some live looks into that hearing where you can see the cat uh, in there. Probably not from uh, the, the company, uh, Mark, on behalf of the world of privacy, data, uh, Internet regulations, uh, and something that has not touched as much as we hear in the United States, but it's global. We have regulations uh, in many other countries that we don't have here in the United States. Those are some of the big questions that will be on the table today for Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, ultimately, what comes of Facebook? Uh, what might the new rules be over there? Since Mike, uh, the global giant, uh, faced right off the bat, one of those headlines comes here. Ben Ackerhead following Mark Zuckerberg on his apology tour. He has been basically on what uh, I'm sure they call a chronophone, but he's been on those beautiful long intros on both sides of the aisle now. And here today for the next two days of hearings. Jill? Hey, Jacob. Thanks again. I was here at the House Senate Office Building where Team was sitting down there. In just a little bit, Mark Zuckerberg is going to be taking this seat right here, and he's going to be sitting here and facing off with about 43 senators, and they have a lot of questions for him. In fact, the demand to attend this hearing was so high that they added more seats to the senators and tables here, as you can see. Among the topics that uh, he's expected to discuss include the apologize and the responsibility of the government for what happened in the lead-up to the Cambridge Analytica data scandal. He'll also be talking about Russian meddling and Facebook privacy and looking ahead to possible regulation. That's really going to be a big focus of this bipartisan group here uh, in the Senate. He stayed in yesterday for about five hours with the Energy Senate meeting with the Senate leadership. He declined to take even one question. He nodded, and then later last night, he waved to use the Facebook Messenger. But overall, he's very tight-lipped in advance of his Senate questions today. And, of course, it's not going to be over after today. Tomorrow is going to be another marathon before Congress is done. That is fast approaching. Jill, in the cat shed, the room where this is all going to go down uh, in just a little bit. You know, um, Mark Zuckerberg, Savannah, has never waved to me. Yeah, I know. Ever <laughs> in my life. Ignores all questions but then waves. It's a pretty amazing detail. I know it's extraordinary to see. Jill and Ken did uh, an admirable job, as she always does, chasing Mark Zuckerberg down. Chasing, uh, through literally. The, through the halls of Congress <laughs> yesterday. Didn't get uh, one single question. She got uh, some nods and actually smiles. Actually, yeah, a lot of nods and smiles. Um, but uh, a lot of silence. Look at this. Uh, let's just watch this play out for a second as Mark Zuckerberg uh, walked through the halls of Congress. Look at that. Notice the this outfit. is yesterday. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, go ahead, Savannah. I'll <laughs> preach about that. The suit, I just, I think it's so amazing. You know, yesterday, Larry Kudlow, I wrote it down because I thought it was so amazing. He was asked, does the administration feel that Facebook should be regulated? And his only response was, well, is he going to wear a suit and tie? Is he going to have a clean shirt on? Is he going to act like an adult? Or phony baloney hoodies and dungarees? Which is kind of amazing that that's part of the issue is this reputation that they've created around his total, you know, he does not want to be at all in that mix of being a businessman, but you got to be if you're trying to be what Facebook's trying to be. Could this be, you know, ultimately one of the most consequential days uh, in the history uh, of Facebook's short uh, short history? The New York Times says, of course, pa Facebook hired an outside team to help Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> project humility uh, and charm. I guess that's something that he needs an outside uh, team for. Uh, he even traded his T-shirt, as Savannah pointed out, uh, for a hoodie, uh, for a suit. He's got this reputation for being a bit stiff, a bit robotic. Uh, SNL, by the way, poked yeah. fun at all of that <laughs> on Saturday. Yeah, let's watch that. Hello, Colin. 
begin eye contact. Two, three, and away. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> wow. Nailed it. <laughs> I think it's pretty amazing that humility and charm, it's reported he was taught. So maybe you can uh, thank you very do much. some humility. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, Savannah Sellers. Um, by the way, if you guys are watching live, you have questions <laughs> for us um, or you have questions uh, for any of our guests, you can tweet uh, us at Watch Savannah, uh, at Jacob Sober. We're going to try to get to some of that stuff uh, on the air. But before we go any further, we want to um, do some important setup for you. How did ultimately we all end up here? In 2010, Facebook's, uh, of course, launched launched its uh, Open Graph API, which allowed outside app developers to access uh, user data. And then in 2011, Facebook agreed that the company won't share um, users' data without their permission. Uh, that uh, was part of a federal consent decree based on what happened back uh, in um, 2006. In 2013, the UK-based firm Cambridge Analytica, uh, again, uh, central to all of this, begins to pull data on Facebook users in violation of Facebook's terms of service. And that's another Thing that we'll talk about today. How closely, you know, are we all looking at those terms of right, service? Right. How much do we all know what's at? I mean, is that something that you've ever looked at? No, it's not. And not only that, but the fact that it, it might not even be about your terms of service. You have to know so much about things that are connected to you via friends. That's exactly right. And so some of this data is not just from you opting in, but from your friends exactly. uh, opting in. You know, in 2016, this is when it all really started to hit the fan. Cambridge Analytica is hired by President Trump's uh, campaign, then candidate Trump. And in 2017, uh, special counsel Robert Mueller requested requested files from Cambridge Analytica in relation to the Russian interference investigation into the 2016 election. And then finally, just last month, the New York Times reported uh, just how much user data face, uh, Cambridge Analytica actually had access to surprising the public, Shocking. surprising lawmakers. First, we thought it was only 50 million uh, users. You say only 50 million. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, add 37 million to that uh, as of today, 87 million. It's crazy. And regulators are now demanding Facebook explain itself. And that's why we're here today. That's why Zuckerberg's where he is today. So what can we expect from the hearing? That's really what we're trying to get to the bottom of. As you've mentioned, it's a lot about will regulation come from this. So we're going to bring in our first guest, Edmund Lee, managing editor of Recode. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the table, man. Yeah, welcome yeah. to the it's internet. It's fun to be here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to talk to us about, I mean, what do you expect from today? I think, you know, first things first, you guys follow this day in uh, and day out. Is this, as I said, could it be one of the most consequential days in the history of Facebook? Yeah, no, this is a huge moment for Facebook and for Mark Zuckerberg. It's unprecedented for this company. Uh, this is the first time that, well, one of the rare times that Mark has faced a really contentious setting, right? So he's usually had been in sort of scripted scenarios. Uh, he actually sat down with uh, us at Recode years ago for our conference, which, which he was sweating. It was a hard moment for him. I remember it's that. It's not his natural element, that's for sure. Hence the charm offensive, hence all the, tr the, the training. Uh, I think he's actually gonna do fine. I think he, you know, he's matured certainly in, in, in his time. But what are the stakes here? Two things, regulation and reputation, right? So regulation is, as we all know, what can or will Congress do to sort of tamp down how Facebook operates in terms of how they do advertising, how they collect data, how they use the data. But I think a bigger issue will be the reputation because it will be one of the few, few times that the American public, that regular Facebook users will get to see the CEO in an unscripted setting, right? So he'll be there for a bit of time. The best 15 seconds or the worst 15 seconds of his testimony will be the thing that will be edited right. and shared around the internet and everywhere else. <laughs> and you know, that could do reputational harm. In, in a way, those stakes are kind of bigger. So what do you think that, what kind of questions are going to be asked? We know some of the right. big questions. What do you think they're really going to drill down on him, given that we've seen his prepared remarks? Yeah, so, I mean, he, he's clearly admitted fault. He's a, he's expressed a contrition for, you know, what they did or didn't do. Uh, I think there is definitely going to be a bunch of political theater, right? You know, a bit of grandstanding to make sure Congress alerts the American people we're looking out for your interest. And I think that's a fair thing to try to do. At the same time, what is it going to result in? Is there going to be real regulation? Is there going to be real protections put in place? I think one fundamental thing that we should look for in terms of what the Senate should ask is the degree to which Facebook is willing to change the system to be opt-in versus opt-out, right? Right now, when you sign up for Facebook, you got to grand deep, bargain. man. You got exactly. to looking right here yeah, at the you screen. You have no you, idea. It is right. unbelievable how hard it is to find your privacy settings to actually get to the stuff that right. regulates what type of information that you're sharing on Facebook. If you wanted to do it, I don't even know yeah. that people at home would be able to and go and there's find so many it. variations to it as well it's not a simple on off switch either there's so right. many different elements you have to take off so the thing is the grand bargain of facebook it's free service it's ad based it's ad supported so when you sign up the default is your data will be shared period right now the eu has rules in place that that, that goes the opposite way which right. is you default to not share mm. you have to you know get consent you have to choose to share and i think that actually 
if it goes that way in the U.S., I don't think that's actually going to happen. But if it does, that could really hamper Facebook. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you about that, just from a business perspective. What ultimately uh, are the financial stakes um, that are on the line right now for Facebook? If the data operation were to switch to an opt-in yeah. versus an opt-out, an opt-in uh, versus, versus opt an opt-out. I mean, how much money does Facebook stand to lose? Data is their business. Data Think, is assuming their business. that people would choose to start not sharing right. data. Let's, let, to be clear, it's not simply that they're selling data. What they're really selling is you, the user, to as the their advertisers. Target. Yeah, right, exactly. The more specifically the advertisers can target the person, hence the data, the more money they can charge. So if there's only so much data they can target, the less money they can charge. So it, it's a big premium to the advertiser. And advertisers specifically seek out Facebook because there's data on Facebook they can't get elsewhere. Right? Right. Let's right. talk about this for a minute and how this all works. So basically, we've all been on Facebook um, and seen an advertisement pop up for right. something that you might have Google searched. Right. Or like, oh, oh, this I is like creepy, right? How do they know? What a shirt yes, looks exactly. like and it pops Why, up the next day. Exactly. So it, it, when that pops up there, how does that play into what Facebook's basically uh, revenue strategy is? And then how is that uh, ultimately you know, going to be affected by what happens yeah. today on the Hill? Well, so again, I think, I think that's the key question, right? I think a lot of advertisers will pay a premium for Facebook to be able to target in a way that you can't do on, on, on other services online and you can't do in other mediums, right? So I think that's a big part of Facebook's value proposition. It's why people buy Facebook stock and make it worth billions of dollars. So if that's ever switched to the other, to the other format, it would do huge damage to their to their profits. At the same time, I don't think that's going to happen. We're still in a Rep Republican controlled Congress. They're not generally for regulation, and so it, it's anathema to them, right? Mm -hmm. I think there is certainly a danger around. Well, you know, could it have swayed the election? Could there be a lot of misinformation flow through there? These are good and legitimate concerns to to, to delve into, but in terms of whether it's going to fundamentally affect their business, I, I'm, I think Congress will stop short of that point. And speaking of swaying the election, we now know they've said that they've set up this committee. That that's going to be looking at how Facebook, social media in general can affect an election. What do you think can come of that? Is that going to really, is that help him at all? Uh, well, look, I, think it, I think it's a good step. I think it's good to have an independent body. I think there is a bigger liability though, right? If the, if the research comes back and says, yes, Facebook had a huge impact on the election, much more adversely than even anyone recognized, if Mark Zuckerberg as the CEO, the founder, the, the, the head of the board basically decides, you know what? I think it's still okay. We're going to have other processes in place that will prevent this from happening again. There's no check or balance against his leadership. The way that Facebook ownership is structured, he has full control. The board can't vote him out. Shareholders can't vote him out. You can't really do He's anything. The only, the only constituency is himself and the users. Of course, the users could leave, but then the next question is, where do they leave to? There's no place mm -hmm. to leave to. And I just want to reset for anybody that's joining us right now on our live stream on NBCNews.com or elsewhere, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, uh, ironically, all of the places that you might uh, like to look us up. We're sitting here with Ed Lee, managing editor uh, of Recode. Uh, you know, we have Mark Zuckerberg's testimony. We know what he's going to say, yeah. Yeah. ultimately, when he goes and sits in that chair for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. And we know also sort of how this is all going to go down. We're going to have Chuck Grassley, the chairman of Judiciary, uh, come up, make a two-minute introductory remark. Uh, John Thune is going to make a five-minute opening statement from the Commerce Committee. Uh, and eventually, it gets to Mark Zuckerberg. One of the things that he's uh, slated to say at the very end in his conclusion is, my my top priority has always been our social mission of connecting people. Uh, he then goes on to say advertisers and developers will never take priority over that as long as I'm running Facebook. I think a lot of people would beg to differ and say that's already yeah. happened. <laughs> it's, or, it's already happened. That's, that's where they make their money. It, it, I mean, the, the sense of idealism that comes from him is a little disconcerting. I think that's why this problem happened. If he approached it as, you know what, I've got this really good platform that I've created, but I know people are going to exploit it. It's better to start from that position instead of sort of thinking like, oh, this is going to connect people and make the world a better place. It might, but you should assume the opposite first. And that way you'll, you'll cover yourself better and actually find these flaws ahead of time. This was only this was broken by the press. This was not something that right. some engineer necessarily discovered and, and sort of blew the whistle on. It came to light because of reporting. Uh, and, you know, that's a good thing. But at the same time, Shouldn't Facebook be the one to figure this out in the first place? Isn't it their system? Don't they employ the it. smartest people in the world? So they should be able to figure that out before the rest of us do. Right. Absolutely. And, and once and once they do, you know, act on it, and that's yes. part of the yeah. that's part of the conversation here. Why didn't they act on it in a bigger way, in a more in-depth way? Why once didn't they we did know ultimately, what they knew. I figured this out. I know you got to go get on the actual television, leave the people <laughs> of the internet. So Ed Lee Manjing, sure. editor of Recode, thank you very much for uh, for stopping by our stream. Good to see you. Thank that's you so time. much. Appreciate right. it. Uh, this just in from our Capitol Hill producer Frank Thorpe. The line for the Senate.
President Zuckerberg hearing starts on the first floor in the Dirksen <laughs> office building. It snakes upstairs to the second floor of the Hart building where the hearing room actually is. There is extraordinary interest, as I said earlier, not just Savannah uh, from, and here we are, another live look uh, into that hearing room uh, right now from uh, media, uh, from lawmakers, uh, from people uh, in the United States, but around, around the world. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And so at the heart, Zuckerberg has just arrived, actually, is what we're seeing here. He's on. And so we're the picture. It's happening. Yeah, we're hoping to get pictures of that uh, in just a little bit. Um, but we know that Mark Zuckerberg is now on the Hill, most likely uh, in a suit and tie uh, yet again. Um, <laughs> at the heart of all of this is, of course, the Cambridge Analytica data breach. So. Um, Here's the question. What kind of data did Cambridge Analytica collect from Facebook users? How did they do it? Check out this explainer from NBC Mock. It's uh, fantastic. It all began in 2013 when University of Cambridge professor Alexander Kogan developed an app that included a personality quiz that was installed by around 300,000 Facebook users. The app collected their quiz responses as well as their profile data. And here's the key. It collected information from their Facebook friends, too tens of millions of them. Cambridge Analytica used this trove of data to build the valuable personality profiles at the heart of the service it sells. They matched quiz responses with quiz takers' profile data. Then, they developed algorithms to find patterns in those responses and predict results for other users, training the algorithms with the huge supply of Facebook profile data they had collected. This shows that even seemingly innocuous data can be turned into highly powerful information and you can build a rich analysis of the American electorate. Just how bad was the Cambridge Analytica data breach? Bringing in Anna Schechter, who has been following the Cambridge Analytica scandal since it broke. Before we begin, I want to play a clip from Sheryl Sandberg's interview with Savannah Guthrie last week. This is what she had to say when pressed about why Facebook didn't check that Cambridge Analytica deleted Facebook user data. So why didn't you? because we thought that the data had been deleted and we should have checked. You are right about that. What Why we're doing we now, check? we thought it had been deleted because they gave us assurances and it wasn't until other people told us it wasn't true. But, but why go on but faith here's with someone who's already violated you know, in spirit, if not in the letter, well, of Facebook's principles? We had legal assurances from them that they deleted. What we didn't do was the next step of an audit. It's also worth noting that the whistleblower on Cambridge Analytica says that it's possible that that data is actually still stored in Russia. So, Anna, did Facebook do enough there to protect its users? What do you think? Well, Facebook took on faith that Cambridge Analytica had deleted all of this data off of their servers. But we know that uh, what Cambridge Analytica says are rogue employees, they held on to that data. So that data does exist. So this is a big problem. We know, Anna, first of all, uh, thank you uh, again for joining us. And really the only way uh, and reason I know anything about this is following the reporting <laughs> and the notes that you've been putting uh, throughout our organization. Talk to me about what, what ultimately Facebook has implemented since this all went down, since this came out to the public. It was a huge huge egg on the face of Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg. Um, is it enough? Is it enough? And, and, uh, and how much more do they need to do ultimately? Well, what happened is in 2015, Facebook knew that all of this data had been passed on to um, to uh, Cambridge Analytica. So they did nothing between 2015 and just a few weeks ago when they learned that The Guardian and The New York Times and our British partners at ITN Channel yeah, and 4 the were intercept, about to and the intercept it. And the intercept before that. That's exactly right. So they tried to get ahead of it and announce in a big uh, Facebook communications post that Cambridge Analytica was barred from Facebook and it kind of went and I don't know that that was the right approach. I think it's too little too late. Mm -hmm. So can Facebook prevent this from happening again? Is that possible that they can put in enough protections that something like this isn't going to go on? It's a great question and I think it's going to be extremely hard to contain because once you go in and you enter in your information, it's really hard for that to not get passed on to developers who are developing apps on your platform. Does anybody care? I mean, I hate to ask it in that way, but do, I mean, Facebook has, what, 2 billion uh, active users worldwide. Um, is, we haven't seen revolts in the street. We haven't seen a massive delete Facebook movement, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but what's been the backlash to all of this? Other than from people on the Hill, I mean, it, it, it seems to me there's sort of a sense that, you know what, I guess I signed up for Facebook. If this happened to my information, that sort of sucks, but 
And that's the right. cost of living with Facebook. That's true, but you have had people delete their accounts, pretty high profile people, Tesla, um, people in Silicon Valley even, and people at Apple have come out. Steve Wozniak came out, he deleted his account. So people kind of in the know uh, are doing so. But I think your average American does assume that they're just used to putting their credit card information online. They're used to their data being out there. I get, I get, sorry, well, go ahead, Savannah, sorry. Well, so I, as I mentioned when we were coming into this conversation, Christopher Wiley, who sort of blew the whistle on Cambridge Analytica, had said, um, that he he couldn't be sure, and he didn't necessarily think that it wasn't possible. That, like I said in the beginning, this data is now in Russia. How, what do you feel? What's the extent of where information that you wouldn't want shared could be off to at this point? What he's talking about is Alexander Kogan, who's the academic who built that app, which was a personality test. He was traveling back to St. Petersburg, where he was also an academic working at a university there. Now, Mr. Kogan tells me that he absolutely did not pass that data on to anyone else. He happens to have been born in Russia. That's just kind of how it played mm. out. I think the issue here is that Facebook could never nail down who did and who didn't have it. I think there was a lot of naivete. And moving forward, all of these band-aids that they're putting on will help. I think it's impossible to fully contain it. it and, well, go ahead, Samantha, yeah, please. Well, well, I was just going to say, I think it also feels like how you were saying, do people really care? It's all, I feel that if my data was taken already, then what is deleting my Facebook going to do now? That's what I'm How saying. Are there people like, out there watching right now? And again, you guys tweet us. Yeah, please. Uh, hit us up on Facebook, uh, Instagram, whatever. Um, if, I mean, that just shows the ubiquity of this company. All of these places we're talking about communicating with people through, those are owned by Facebook um, right. and, and WhatsApp, yeah. okay? And yeah. so is Facebook, in essence, and that's part of the conversation that's going to happen on the Hill today, too big to fail. Is there anything that can be done at this point to Facebook that's going to stop it from being able to collect the data um, and have access to all of this data that all of us are freely providing it? Right. I think, for better or for worse, Mark Zuckerberg did change the world, and I think he feels very proud of that. This is a big reckoning. This is a maturity that is coming to Silicon Valley, hopefully. He is not the only one in the tech world who has not been... Uh, uh, conscious of the consequences of the work that he's done. I think the other thing we were talking about this before we started is that it feels crazy that you know, I personally might never do have downloaded the personality test app that they sort of say that this all came but from. But they might have every piece of your information. Because your up, friend did. And I, I have so many friends that, that I've seen share those results. Yeah, I woke up to that message on my phone that they might have my hometown, the city where I'm in, um, my name and information. This was a message that you got. I saw you had. Do we have yeah. that, guys? Can we yeah. put it up on the yeah, screen? Do I don't know if we have it or not. But you. So talk yeah, a little bit more it, about that. You, you received the message. Here it is. When you logged on yeah. to Facebook that that said, yeah. um, so it said Anna. And it said, <laughs> Protecting your information. And then the next page, I entered it into News Connect. I'm not sure it's it's up there right now, but the oh you I, you have to click on that link mm -hmm. and then it says that okay, they got all your public information, but you know what? They might have gotten your Facebook messages, which you assume are private. They no, might no, have those are messages those that you write right. as if they're emails with it. Right, Let's go right. back to that screen for uh, one more second, guys, just so we can take a look uh, at the language that Facebook has put out for everybody to see. It says you can learn more about what happened, how you can remove other apps and websites anytime if you no longer want them to have access to your Facebook information. That doesn't mean that all <laughs> kinds of information is already out there. What type of information are we talking about beyond uh, your name, email. your age, everything your email. you've Picture. liked? And they could even do scraping of, you know, whatever they is on that screen. There's technology that you can suck up anything you've liked, clicked on, that sort of information, in addition to those messages. Talk to us more about that, because the whole idea here with Cambridge Analytica is that they were looking to build and selling, frankly, as part of their business, psychological profiles of voters to candidates right. across the country. Ted Cruz, um, uh, yeah. Ben Carson were some of the first clients here domestically in the United States from That's Cambridge right. Analytica. And then the Trump campaign bought into it. When we they were trying to build psychological profiles of the people that are watching this right now. What does that, what does that mean? What that means is they took all of those likes, where you're from, your age, sexual orientation, whatever, and they built models. They aggregated the data and they built models to figure out what kind of person lives where. They coupled that with this personality test and they decided, okay, are you a neurotic person? Is, are, is fear a motivator for you? Okay. Yeah, by the way, Savannah just looked at me. <laughs> are you a neurotic person? She looked well, we're all in New York, self. right? We're in like, New York. Hey. But they, the would, yes. they could then come That's up with a message. That's why I don't download this personality test. I don't <laughs> want to know that. They went further than just data analytics. They would come up with the message for 
you know, Carson or Cruz mm -hmm. targeted to that neurotic personality and make sure you saw that at Facebook. And they also knew if you were a likely voter for Cruz or if you were a persuadable voter. That's who they really wanted to reach. So this right. is really... This and that's why stuff. it's more than a targeted ad being sold so that the shirt I saw on Revolve yesterday pops up, so I buy it. It matters because we're getting into the fact and that it could have swayed the election. This is approved by the candidate. It's just it could be very subtle. That mm -hmm. it couldn't it could be something that's not overtly a political ad. Right. All right, Anna, let me hold you there. Unfortunately we got we have to move on because we've got some developments happening now. Anna Schechter, thank you very much. And I want to make sure that to get you yeah. watching this hearing as soon as possible because we yeah. need your insights Thanks. and your analysis. Go watch and come back and talk to us. Uh, one other thing that we wanted to talk about about before the hearing starts, just in a matter of minutes, is the Delete Facebook movement. It uh, hashtag deletes Facebook. Of course, it continues to build momentum. So far, Elon Musk, as Anna referenced, has deleted uh, SpaceX and Tesla's Facebook pages entirely. Think about what a big deal that is. Among celebrities who have deleted Facebook pages and profiles, encourage their followers to do the same. Will Ferrell, Cher, uh, Jim Carrey, all Savannah's favorites, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Uh, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak openly criticized Facebook yesterday right here uh, in this building on MSNBC calling Mark Zuckerberg and his company's practices disgusting. Take a listen to that. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg buys all the houses around his for privacy and buys extra lots in Hawaii around his for privacy. But, oh, our privacy has not been respected and watched over. Facebook could have done a much better job just of, uh, you know, of being honest. Now, Zuckerberg has been contrite, repeatedly apologizing, trying to win back the trust of Facebook's almost 2 billion users. I don't want anyone to be unhappy with our services or, um, or what we do as a company. still uh, speaks to people's feeling like this was a massive breach of trust and that we have a lot of work to do to repair that. A massive breach of trust, and we have a lot of work to do uh, to repair that. It feels like we've heard Mark Zuckerberg uh, say that before. So, again, is it really that big of a deal if Facebook knows, say, what type of car you drive, uh, what restaurants you visit? Uh, I want to bring in Ben Popkin, business reporter for NBCNews.com. Ben, what's going on, man? Hey, just uh, another day, huh? Yeah, just another uh, day in the Facebook mill. Okay, so um, let's just simply put it this way. Sure. What's the big deal with what's going down on the Hill today? Well, the big deal is your data. You know, Facebook is this huge, massive platform. It's so powerful that to criticize it, we actually have to go on Facebook right now <laughs> to talk about it. Um, they make money by, uh, you know, collecting your data and letting advertisers target ads to you. And these, um, you know, people are kind of waking up to this ac across the country. These ads could be for selling you a car or selling you a president and it, it turns out that by collecting that data um, you know maybe people can be manipulated one way or the other so uh, Zuckerberg's on the hill to talk about are they protecting that data are they the good guardians of that and you know should we continue to trust them we heard Cheryl Sandberg say in her interview with Savannah Guthrie that um, you know yes we are making money off of these ads but it's a free service sure. how do you think that the general public the two billion users weigh those things it's free for them but is it worth having their data Sold. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's free, but do you have a choice? I mean, is there a, a paid version of Facebook or a competitor to Facebook right. that will allow you to connect to Aunt Sally and, and share your kids' first steps videos or that funny cat video to people as quickly as possible as mm -hmm. Facebook? There's not really another option out there besides not participating in Facebook. And, and that's what I found so interesting. Sorry to interrupt you, Ben, but the yeah, question sure. between uh, Chris Hayes and Kara Swisher and Tim Cook the other day mm -hmm. when he sort of made a pot shot at Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg, uh, talking about, I wouldn't put myself in that situation. He talked about sort of the paying customer base yeah. of Apple, and then Zuckerberg hit back saying, we never intended this to be something that basically we had, uh, we needed people to pay for. Right, yeah, I mean, so many things here are sort of the law of unincon unintended consequences and what happens when a little idea that starts in a dorm room, you know, explodes globally right. and we cannot really imagine the exponential consequences of connecting everybody at every time uh, in this totally flat way. But you know, the, the, the idea that we're here now discussing, do we pay for Facebook, should, uh, where was my data being sold? And people are waking up to the fact that, that there's da their data is out there and that they're being exposed. Yeah, take a look quickly, Ben, at the Hart Senate office building. Let's, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's take a look at what's happening on the floor there right now. This is a spectacle. I mean, yeah. you don't often see this. Look, I think it looks like those are some protesters from Code Pink. Yep, it is protesters from Code Pink. You often see uh, them on the floor of the uh, Senate and House hearing rooms protesting um, look at military that sign, just intervention. Just like you said, like <laughs> us on Facebook. Is that what it said? Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> 
you know, how tied up, again, talk to us more about that, and how tied up is Facebook in our lives? Code Pink that's there protests almost right. uh, regularly on the floor of the House and Senate hearing rooms uh, actually says, like come, on, come on, on Facebook, Facebook and like us in order to get our information. Sure. I mean, it, Facebook is the big blue uh, gorilla on the room and in the room and sort of. Uh, for a lot of people, Facebook is the internet. Facebook has become their first right. step. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, it's, we're kind of back to uh, AOL days where we had this walled garden yeah. and um, people who are maybe not super, just the average internet user, one of their first steps is, is to, go, to go through Facebook to get online. Um, so they, they have a lot of power. What are the questions? I mean, some of the big names that are going to be here, and I mentioned them earlier, are uh, the chairman of the Jud Judiciary Committee, Senator Chuck Grassley. He's going to be able to introduce this hearing in just a little bit. We're also going to hear from chairman of the Commerce Committee, Senator John Thune, uh, Diane Feinstein, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, and Bill Nelson from Florida, the ranking member uh, of the Commerce Committee. Everybody is going to get uh, a specific amount of time to ask questions of Mark Zuckerberg after his opening. Uh, testimony. It's going to be in that room that you're looking at on the right-hand portion of your screen uh, right now. Ben, what are some yeah. of the questions that you anticipate coming out of the ranking members of the uh, of these committees uh, when uh, this all gets underway in just a couple minutes? Sure. I mean, this is kind of one of those, you know, what did Zuck know? When did he know it? Uh, how, how involved are they? Um, and also a lot of questions about how was Cambridge Analytica Lydica able to access so much data about so many people sort of so quickly. And I think uh, the other question is, is how many other Cambridge Analyticas are out there? Cambridge Analytica exploited not a bug. They didn't break into Facebook. That's a great question. They yeah. used Facebook. They used the version <laughs> of the what is called the social graph as it was designed. Right. Um, and the question is how many other developers were out there doing that before 2015, before they you know, added some protections. And that's the thing we see over and over again. These companies, these tech companies, they, they get big, they, they, uh, they, they go big, and then they kind of iterate, oops, we need to kind of fix that. We need to uh, close those things that, that we didn't imagine happening. Is it possible that until something like this happens where there's some type of leak of information that we will even know how many other companies could potentially have data like this, like Cambridge Analytica did? How could we know? In America, we have almost zero privacy rights after you, you know, play that Farmville app, after you right. uh, log into Facebook. Once you've given up your data, the companies have it, and we have no right to request it back. With It's very hard to find out who has it. There's a shadowy industry of data brokers that are trading this between one another, from big companies to guys in basements selling spreadsheets to each other. And, uh, and again, I think what's so crazy, like we talked about, is you have to go so far into your own settings to understand what you are allowing to be out there. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, not that I would ever go and download one of those apps or play one of those games, but I have friends who do. You see, like you just said, Farmville, people sharing their You have asked me to play Words time. with Friends before. Oh, I'm going to say it right and now. You're you've asked me to play fan. Words with Friends. No, but in all seriousness, what happens to all of those apps? I mean, we talked about this a little sure. bit with Ed Lee. What does it mean for the bottom line of Facebook? Does anybody care, number one? Number two, what happens for, with all these apps and all these app developers in the future on Facebook? Sure. I mean, even if we edit our privacy settings, even if we ed download our data, even if we delete Facebook, that doesn't stop everyone who already has our data from using it and exploiting it. The fact is, and this is what people are waking up to, that once you go online, you are being tracked and you are being sold. It is very hard for the average internet user to go online and not have their data being spread. They're Facebook's business, isn't it? Right. This and That's the key thing here. This Monetizing your data is their business model. So they can add on whatever widgets, add on whatever controls, whatever privacy protections. That doesn't change that they make money by collecting as much data from you as possible and allowing ad advertisers to deliver highly targeted ads. But this is not the European Union and what, you know whatever yeah. transpires here today, you know, in the uh, in the Hart Senate office building, um, the reality is we're still in a world where Donald Trump is the president of the United States. We're still in a world where we have a Republican-controlled House and a Republican-controlled Senate. Is there any likelihood of any additional regulations coming into play here? And then the other question I have for you is: Facebook right now is not, I don't believe, regulated by the FCC as a media company. Correct? What happens if ultimately Facebook is it's decided that it is a media company and has to face regulations like we do in this building? Right. So, uh, you remind me of your things. first question. Uh, <laughs> legislation. We live in a Republican yeah, world. Uh, we yeah. live in a Republican world yeah. at this point. I mean, always with these hearings, there's the question of 
is this just going to be, you know, street theater for the people? Is anything going to come out of it? Uh, let's if, just pause for a second since this is the internet. There is a, <laughs> there is a troll in the audience uh, at, oh the, uh, that's a legit at, troll. The, at the hearing in the Senate oh building boy. right there. Um, there's there's so, no Bushko on top of that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. <laughs> um, so, Ben, uh, back to you. Yeah. What happens ultimately? We're, we live in a Republican-controlled uh, government yeah. right now. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, conceivably, if they're aggressive, we could be looking at fines. We could be looking at additional protections maybe for users. But... Uh, it's, it's really a question of what will really come out, out of today besides seeing Zuckerberg sweat. Ben Popkin, NBCNews.com. We wouldn't be able to do it without you, man. Thank you so much sure. for Thank being here. For appreciate, yeah. appreciate you coming by. Uh, Savannah, do you own a troll wig like that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little jewel for the belly. Isn't that what they have when they're the little doll? <laughs> uh, you, what you can see down there in the front most likely is media that's lined up. Um, all those computers that are open are people that are going to be interested uh, in covering this hearing uh, and are in real time live blogging, live tweeting, uh, and sharing content uh, from that room across the world. One of the people that I have a feeling will also be sharing content related to this is David Gura, <laughs> host of MSNBC Live, joins nice us right segment. now here on set uh, in, uh, in studio, whatever studio what, we're yeah. in. The we're top of the, the stairs. In the, open. Uh, the studio <laughs> at the top of the stairs. stairs. What's up, man? Good to see you. Now, so, this is fascinating. I mean, you're talking about the Hart Senate office building. This is a radically different environment for Mark Zuckerberg than the compound he's used to out okay. uh, in Silicon Valley. And I think and in you know, a different outfit. Decent, absolutely. <laughs> but you know, this is where the 9-11 Commission hearing was. It had, there's august history there before, in front of that marble facade there in uh, Hart 216. So. Rumor has it uh, that you are one of the Americans that may have hashtag deleted your Facebook account. Uh, many years ago. I mean, it's been like four years. So I didn't get this thing this morning. <laughs> but yeah, four years back uh, out of some unease about data, but also just curiosity how addicted to it was I. But that was part of it. Yeah. No, I think that back then I was thinking, how much are they getting from me? What am I giving away? What am I getting out of it? Uh, and now it looks mm. totally foreign to me when I... But not many people think that. I mean, not many people think the way that you did four years ago, you know? And so we've sort of been talking about, does anybody really care other than right. us here, what's going on in that room today? What are, the, what are the real consequences for Americans? I think it's a great point, and it'll be interesting to see sort of how these lawmakers react. I've just been wondering about the threshold of just knowledge about these social media platforms that these senators are going to have, many of whom are 70, 80 years old. Yeah. And Diane Feinstein is not tweeting bear. herself, I yeah. can guarantee I you that. 84, whatever she is. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, that aside, uh, I think people are, at least, if they're not more angry about it, they're more cognizant of it. And I mm -hmm. think that's something that we should see today. And I think that these senators think, rightfully or wrongly, they're channeling some of that uh, some of that anger today. But I just want to go back to something Ben was saying a moment ago. He was talking about uh, just the way that this company is so radically different from what Mark Zuckerberg envisioned. That's true from a business perspective, but I think that as he talks about it as like an optimistic enterprise, something that can change the world, he's got to reckon with what that means. And there's this conversation that's going to take place today about should the government regulate the company or not. I think that the, the company has way more breadth globally than he ever thought it would. And you Absolutely. look at what's happening in Myanmar, and he's just the, the, the physical presence of this company has changed so much. And I think that that's something that's going to come up today as well. And it almost seems at this point dangerous to be so idealistic. You know, even in his prepared remarks, we see that he's talking about how we were always used to connect people. And then, you know, now we need to make sure the connections are positive. I think it's a little bit more than making sure they're positive. It's about making sure that the information there is going to be, A, correct, and then, B, that people feel comfortable with the reason that they're seeing that information and being targeted. Totally. And you look at how this company has to respond to that and to these concerns and something he said is they're going to hire thousands of more people to vet all of this stuff. I wonder, are those people out there? Is that skill set out there? How difficult is it going to be to develop the infrastructure to match what he says the company needs to do? And as, uh, as we're talking here, you can look at Senator Patrick Leahy uh, from Vermont right here walking in uh, to the hearing. This is about the time, I think, is that Dick Durbin on the right there? I can't quite it tell. It looks like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Imposing himself. Exactly. <laughs> he's doing some meditation. Yeah. It is. He's doing a little meditation. He might be checking his Facebook app yeah. uh, before the hearing starts um, on their way into this room. Talk more about that, David. I was thinking the same thing that you are, is how much do these, send, I mean, how much are they relying on their staffs right now to brief them about what this is really all about? How much, uh, uh, how many members of these uh, committees actually have any idea of how these apps uh, actually work? I imagine they've gotten a crash course, but I think when you look at the Senate versus the House, the Senate relies on staff much more. They have a bigger permanent staff than right. congressmen do, and you know, maybe a good parallel is to look at the Russia investigation, how that's been run on the House side versus the Senate side. A lot of that investigation has been spearheaded uh, by Senate staffers. Uh, you know, you saw Mark Zuckerberg on the
on the Hill yesterday, meeting with the chairs and ranking members of these two uh, committees. Uh, I imagine they're well prepped. Uh, I'm sure there are some more savvy than others. Chris Coons this morning, the Democratic senator from Delaware, expressing some anger that he had to uh, fake accounts uh, in his name that and was corrected fake pictures. by Facebook. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think they've gotten a good primer on it, and um, you know, it'll be interesting to see sort of how much personal experience they bring to bear in the questioning versus uh, you know what they've been prepped to bring to bear by the staff. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and again, we're just watching this live. The, the hearing is supposed to uh, scheduled to start uh, at around 2:15, uh, if I'm not mistaken. It's now 2:24 uh, in the East. Uh, as always, things don't go uh, always on schedule in Washington. <laughs> but we're on the internet, there so it's go. fine. <laughs> we have all the time in the in world. In the world. <laughs> um, and, but uh, again, we're seeing the lawmakers now start to file into this hearing room in the Hart Senate uh, office building. You know, one of the things, Dave, that you also mentioned is that Mark Zuckerberg um, sort of uh, struck this idealistic note, or at least he's supposed to, uh, given his prepared testimony, that I set this company up to be this thing to bring people uh, together. Is, is there an expiration date on that messaging for Mark Zuckerberg ultimately? This is one of the biggest companies in the world at this point, uh, and uh, is that good? Will, will that goodwill ever go away? I mean, the company has gotten huge. We have to admit that. 2.2 billion users worldwide. You listen to Mark Zuckerberg it's unbelievable. speak. unbelievable. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, when he talks to investors, when he talks at conferences, he talks about his ambitions for everybody to be on uh, Facebook. And there is some blind uh, ambition and idealism to that. But uh, he wants it to keep growing. And, uh, you know, you were asking about the, the business perspective of this earlier, how that could take a hit. I mean, advertising is a huge component of that. I think that what Facebook's been really effective at, at doing uh, is having that idealism sort of supersede the fact that this is a big business with a lot of money uh, at stake there. It's been interesting to see Sheryl Sandberg sort of as the face here, mostly. It's rarer that we hear from Mark Zuckerberg than we hear from, from Sheryl Sandberg. Um, and she is somebody who has a big background in, in business. She is someone that investors want to hear from. And I think that um, something else that strikes me today, just thinking about this, is there's been this gap. It's a huge geographic gap between Washington and Silicon Valley. Just having Mark Zuckerberg there in Washington is, is really the end of what has been a years-long effort to sort of bridge that gap. I don't think this is the way that he would have elected to do it, but um, there's a, a gap of, of, of understanding, certainly, between Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. Right. that hasn't been closed over well, these last few well, years. Just real quick, Savannah, there's yeah, Ted yeah. Cruz. We're taking a look at Ted Cruz right now, who's uh, assumed his uh, seat mm. and position there. We also saw Diane Feinstein, ranking member of the Judi Judiciary Committee and chairman of the Commerce Committee. Hometown rep. Uh, yeah, Facebook hometown rep. Well. That's right. Yes, yeah. that's exactly right. A San Francisco uh, native and uh, former local politician there uh, in San Francisco. Um, you make a great point. Mark Zuckerberg does not want to be in Washington, D.C. No, he looked at, you know, we've made fun of the suit. And yes, <laughs> to testify before Congress, you often wear a suit. If it's not required, you'll do it anyways. But uh, he's not comfortable there, clearly. Uh, and you've seen the apparatus around these tech companies grow in Washington, D.C. Uh, over the years. They've hired big lobbying staffs. There are reports that he was prepped by former administration officials and law firms, how he's going to comport himself at this testimony uh, today. But it is a different world. Uh, for Facebook, and we have this conversation about what regulation looks like, what federal regulation looks like. Um, I imagine part of them not wanting that has to do with the fact that it is such foreign territory to them, that Silicon Valley has existed in this kind of isolation in, in California with geographic remove again for such a long time. Um, there is a foreignness to being in Washington and dealing with folks who, as we've just been joking about a few moments ago, might not use these services day in and day out themselves. <laughs> One of the things that I think is pretty astonishing is his total refusal at even thinking about stepping aside. And Savannah Guthrie asked Cheryl Sandberg about that in her interview, saying, you know, when something like this happens in most places, heads roll. And it's really up to the two of them and he has no check on his power. So where does this go if you're one of the two billion, which more than likely you are, and knowing that the, the person who's sort of at the helm of this whole thing like really says he's not going anywhere, it's only that is, him. That is such a great question, and he's just 33 years old, which is sobering for all of us, but uh, you know, it is his company, and there has been for such a long time in Silicon Valley this uh, idea of the founder governing what the company looks like. You look at Uber, another one of these huge companies that had Travis Kalanick, yeah. uh, Kalanick running it for such a long time, he stepped aside. People thought that might be the death knell for it, despite all the problems that Uber was having there. But you're right, he structured this company when it went public in such a way that it's very hard for others to push back against him. Uh, it's a board that still uh, has confidence in Mark Zuckerberg. Sheryl Sandberg still works with him, hand in glove, seemingly very well. So, uh, you know, to get back to your point, Jacob, just sort of about 
Where's the outrage and what does that look like? It's hard to channel that into investor outrage at this point because the company, with the exception of these last few weeks, has been doing pretty well. Uh, Anna Schechter, who was sitting in that seat where you are just a couple minutes ago, has sent out uh, a reminder to all of us that 146 million people uh, through Facebook might have received content from the St. Petersburg-based Internet Research Agency. This is the mm. firm behind uh, much of the cyber meddling in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, there will be overlap in this hearing room today uh, from the types of conversations that we've been having around the Russia investigation, uh, not only into uh, 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 collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, um, but Russian just uh, straight up interference uh, in the election. Is that the man himself? Yeah, there he is. Yeah. Yeah. Man and himself. Grass Mark is Zuckerberg. also in there now, chair of the Senate. Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg has entered uh, the hearing room. Besuited again. Besuited again, <laughs> indeed. And uh, there you go. Look at the attention around him. It, you know, that's got to be an uncomfortable position, uh, back to what I was talking about before, for Mark Zuckerberg to be in. He doesn't want to be there answering questions uh, about uh, Facebook's role in the election of Donald Trump as president of the United States? No, and he hasn't wanted to. I mean, after the election, he was subject to a lot of questions. He didn't field them. Again, Sheryl Sandberg did the bulk of the interviews that took place after the, the 2016 presidential election. But this is an uncomfortable position for anybody to be in on Capitol Hill. You see, I, I would venture to say nearly 100 cameras there uh, really in his face trying to yeah, get some definitely. sort of distinguished or different shot from the others. <laughs> uh, you mentioned two of the chairman are there. I saw the ranking members uh, at the dais uh, as well. So he's going to take his seat. And uh, you know, we've seen previous of these prepared remarks, so we have some sense of what he's going to say. And as you've said, this is a place where we have seen people testify uh, on uh, all kinds of issues throughout the years. Mark Zuckerberg uh, sits down in that seat now, uh, being uh, be, being under the spotlight, I think it's uh, fair to say. Uh, I, I think it's also fair to say none of us have ever been in a position where there are that many cameras uh, stuck in our face. What happens now is those cameras will scatter after they get what's called the spray, um, go back to their respective publications, upload those photos to the Internet, uh, and for the front page of newspapers around the world uh, Where tomorrow. Where we will retweet them. That's, right. That's exactly right. And settle into the seats for uh, the members of both of these committees uh, to start asking questions. Uh, but first, uh, we will hear an opening statement from the ranking members, from the chair people of these committees, and then Mark Zuckerberg will be given an opportunity uh, to speak for himself. Let's uh, let's just take a look at what's playing out in this room right now. And, and uh, I'm not sure there's much to listen to, but uh, let's just watch. It is amazing if you think about, too, how you said that he really stays. He's not a D.C. guy. No. And so he's sitting there in this room in front of this committee with all those cameras in his face. I mean, this is. Yeah, behind him there, uh, just behind him, is the uh, vice president for public policy mm. for Facebook. His name escapes me, former administration official for George W. Bush. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's his team. I but now it's just him. For one second, don't go far. You're going to be back for the post show. Uh, but for now, I want to thank everybody at home for watching us here. Uh, for, for watching us here on our live streaming show. Our coverage will continue in just a little bit with NBC News, st but stay, stay with us uh, right here on NBCNews.com. Uh, uh, we are also on Facebook. We are on Twitter, and we are following these live... We are following these live pictures out of the Hart Senate uh, office building. Mark Zuckerberg uh, doesn't look happy, uh, but he's there. Uh, <laughs> he's tired. He's ready to undergo questioning from a joint uh, Senate Judiciary and Commerce uh, Committee meeting uh, about Facebook's role uh, in the sharing of data of tens of millions of users, uh, not just throughout the United States, uh, but throughout the world. Um, so I'm, I am here with Savannah Sellers and David Gura at NBC News World Headquarters in New York. It's an extraordinary moment, Savannah. Uh, what's going through your head right now? Yeah, I just, uh, commenting on how he does look scared, he does look tired, this is going to be pretty intense for him and just, it's kind of interesting to think about what looks like success here. I mean, is it just not regulation, but this is going to be tough for him right now. Yeah, and it's, it's a question of how much is this going to be about him apologizing, which he has done in statements on Facebook uh, to these ranking members and chairmen uh, over the last couple of days versus getting into the details of what he intends to do. And I think we're going to hear from a number of senators some pushback on that. Yes, mm -hmm. Facebook has outlined plans on what it intends to do. Why hasn't it happened yet? How long is it going to take to do? Uh, why did it take this pretty cataclysmic event for Facebook to take uh, these privacy concerns more seriously? And how can we be sure that we feel like when they know something, we know it? Unless it's going to take reporting. Absolutely. And how much is he going to push back on this issue of, uh, of regulation as well? Um, that's certainly what's knocking at the door uh, at Facebook headquarters, whether the feds could get more involved here, whether the FTC could take a bigger role. It sounds uh, like right now we are hearing a little bit of the first introductory remarks from Chairman of the Ju Judiciary Committee, a word that I haven't been able to say all afternoon. Yeah, know, Senator Chuck Grassley, let's listen in here. Uh, uh, Chairman Thune for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. 
Today's hearing is extraordinary. It's, it's extraordinary, extraordinary to hold a joint committee hearing. It's even more extraordinary to have a single CEO testify before nearly half of the United States Senate. But then Facebook is pretty extraordinary. More than 2 billion people use Facebook every month. 1.4 billion people use it every day. More than the population of any country on Earth except China, and more than four times the population of the United States. It's also more than 1,500 times the population of my home state of South Dakota. Plus, roughly 45% of American adults report getting at least some of their news from Facebook. In many respects, Facebook's incredible us. reach is why we're here today. From South Dakota, we're the here because of what you, Mr. Zuckerberg, of the Commerce Committee. He is one of the many senators that we will be listening to, five to be specific, uh, speak before Mark Zuckerberg uh, makes his opening remarks. Those remarks are uh, out there for everyone to see right now, and the real drama in this hearing room will take place uh, once uh, the senators on that platform are able to actually question Mark Zuckerberg. And that could be a hearing that lasts three, maybe four, five hours. Yeah, just picking up on what uh, Chairman Thune said just a moment ago, this is a pretty extraordinary thing to have two committees meeting together. We're going to hear from 43 senators uh, in keeping with senatorial procedure. They will not be there the whole time. I'm sure they will be ducking in and out uh, probably after the, the opening statement takes place. But this will be a, uh, a long grilling, a searing uh, of uh, Mark Zuckerberg there on Capitol Hill. And each senator gets up to five minutes for their questioning. And uh, after those five go, the first five and their open introductory remarks, and basically this is all protocol because of their uh, positions on these committees. Mark Zuckerberg will get his opportunity to uh, Sit down when she's already doing it, that microphone, and uh, let her rip. Uh, you know, this is Mark Zuckerberg, uh, not unplugged and not unfiltered, certainly uh, quite the contrary, very well coached. Um, but what happens once those questions start, I guess all bets uh, are off. Let's take a listen in again to John Thune from South Dakota. To making their data available doesn't make most people feel any better. The recent revelation that malicious actors were able to utilize Facebook's default privacy settings to match email addresses and phone numbers found on the so-called dark web to public Facebook profiles, potentially affecting all okay. Facebook users, only adds fuel to the fire. What binds these two incidents is that they don't appear to be caused by the kind of negligence that allows typical data breaches to happen. Instead, they both appear to be the result of people exploiting the very tools that you've created to manipulate users' information. I know Facebook has taken several steps and intends to take more to address these issues. Nevertheless, some have warned that the actions Facebook is taking to ensure that third parties don't obtain data from unsuspecting users, while necessary, will actually serve to enhance Facebook's own ability to market such data exclusively. Most of us understand that whether you're using Facebook or Google or some other online services, we are trading certain information about ourselves for free or low-cost services. But for this model to persist, both sides of the bargain need to know the stakes that are involved. Right now, I'm not convinced that Facebook's users have the information that they need to make meaningful choices. In the past, many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle have been willing to defer to tech companies' efforts to regulate themselves. But this may be changing. Just last month, in overwhelming bipartisan fashion, Congress voted to make it easier for prosecutors and victims to go after websites that knowingly facilitate sex trafficking. This should be a wake-up call for the tech community. We want to hear more, without delay, about what Facebook and other companies plan to do to take greater responsibility for what happens on their platforms. How will you protect users' data? How will you inform users about the changes that you are making? And how do you intend to proactively stop harmful conduct instead of being forced to respond to it months or years later? Mr. Zuckerberg, in many ways, you and the company that you've created, the story that you've created represent the American dream. Many are incredibly inspired by what you've done. At the same time, you have an obligation, and it's up to you to ensure that that dream doesn't become a privacy nightmare for the scores of people who use Facebook. This hearing is an opportunity to speak to those who believe in Facebook, 
and to those who are deeply skeptical about it. We are listening, America is listening, and quite possibly the world is listening too. Thank you. Now, Ranking Member Feinstein. Diane Thank Feinstein, you very much, California. Mr. Chairman, Chairman Grassley, Chairman Thune, thank you both for holding this hearing. Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for being here. You have a real opportunity to, this afternoon to lead the industry and demonstrate a meaningful commitment to protecting individual privacy. We have learned over the past few months, and we've learned a great deal that's, that's alarming. We've seen how foreign actors are abusing social media platforms like Facebook to interfere in elections and take millions of Americans' personal information without their knowledge in order to manipulate public opinion and target individual voters. Specifically, on February the 16th, Special Counsel Mueller issued an indictment against the Russia-based Internet, Internet Research Agency and 13 of its employees for interfering operations targeting, targeting the United States. Through this 37-page indictment, we learned that the IRA ran a coordinated campaign through 470 Facebook accounts and pages. The campaign included ads and false information to create discord and harm Secretary Clinton's campaign. And the content was seen by an estimated 157 million Americans. A month later, on March 17th, news broke that Cambridge Analytica exploited the personal information of approximately 50 million Facebook users without their knowledge or permission. And last week, we learned that number was even higher, 87 million Facebook users who had their private information taken without their consent. Specifically, using a personality quiz he created, Professor Kogan collected the personal information of 300,000 Facebook users and then collected data on millions of their friends. It appears the information collected included everything these individuals had on their Facebook pages, and according to some reports, even included private direct messages between users. Professor Kogan is said to have taken data from over 70 million Americans. It has also been reported that he sold this data to Cambridge Analytica for $800,000. Cambridge Analytica then took this data and created a psychological welfare tool to influence United States elections. In fact, the CEO, Alexander Nix, declared that Cambridge Analytica ran all the digital campaign, the television campaign, and its data informed all the strategy for the Trump campaign. The reporting has also speculated that Cambridge Analytica worked with the Internet Research Agency to help Russia identify which American voters to target which it's with its propaganda. I'm concerned that press reports indicate Facebook learned about this breach in 2015, but appears not to have taken significant steps to address it until this year. So this hearing is important, and I appreciate the conversation we had yesterday. And I believe that Facebook, through your presence here today and the words you're about to tell us, will indicate how strongly your industry will regulate and or reform the platforms that they control. I believe this is extraordinarily important you lead a big company with 27,000 employees, and we very much look forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. The history and growth of Facebook mirrors that of many of our technological giants. Founded by Mr. Zuckerberg in 2004, Facebook has exploded over the past 14 years. Facebook currently has over 2 billion monthly active users across the world, 
over 25,000 employees and offices in 13 U.S. cities and various other countries. Like their expanding user base, the data collected on Facebook users has also skyrocketed. They have moved on from schools, likes, and relationship statuses. Today, Facebook has access to dozens of data points, ranging from ads that you've clicked on, events you've attended, and your location based upon your mobile device. It is no secret that Facebook makes money off this data through advertising revenue, although... So we're listening to Chuck Grassley, the senator from the great state uh, of Iowa. He is the uh, penultimate speaker, I think, before we hear uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, open that microphone and give his uh, opening statement. Bill Nelson from Florida will be the final speaker before uh, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, and uh, so far, you know, what we expected, right? Everybody's sort of teeing up uh, why David Mark Zuckerberg is there uh, and what issues he will be put on the hot seat uh, over in the coming hours. I was struck by something that John Thune, the chairman of the uh, Commerce Committee, said in his remarks, uh, essentially that Facebook Silicon Valley has regulated itself, to paraphrase him, maybe not for much longer. Uh, and that's important to me because John Thune, of course, a Republican, a Republican from South Dakota. Right. And that willingness to at least weigh uh, regulation, I think, is significant here. I just want to mention, um, there was for a time some speculation that Mark Zuckerberg had political aspirations. You might remember he took this year-long road trip across, across the country. country. That's right. Photographed with farmers, enjoying steak dinners in places like Iowa in Chuck Grassley's home state. Uh, this is giving him, I guess, another perspective on what uh, all of that might lead to or what it all uh, might be like there. But again, I just think that comment from John Thune, of all that we've heard so far, a lot of what Senator Feinstein was saying in her opening remarks, they're reiterating what we know uh, about what's led to this hearing today. Um, that, to me, is the most pivotal thing we've heard so far. And as we were kind of discussing uh, before this began, sort of these they might not be the most native users to this platform because of their age, but they are mentioning, Feinstein saying, private DMs between people. You know what I mean? She's literally mentioning direct messages. You, you know what I mean? So they're they're really becoming aware of exactly what it is. Um, Grassley right now mentioning totally. and your location, she there, of events course, you went the, to. The ranking member of the Judiciary Committee bringing to bear what we've seen from Bob Mueller and his investigation uh, as well. So clearly of keen interest to her uh, is how this dovetails with or overlaps with the investigation that's taking place by the special counsel right. by the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, as well. Mark Zuckerberg finding himself there in the middle of this. And uh, as you were saying, Jacob, just at the beginning here, uh, I suspect a lot of questions are going to center on the election and Russia, maybe not getting into details of those uh, investigations. But uh, I think members of that Judiciary Committee in particular certainly have an opportunity here uh, here to hear from, uh, from Mark Zuckerberg about some of those issues that were at play in the 2016 election. I do want to give one very uh, special shout out uh, as we listen to senators here. There are 44 senators total on the committees that are going to question Mark Zuckerberg today. Uh, there are only 43 uh, there. Senator Tammy Duckworth, the Democrat of Illinois, of course, just gave birth uh -huh. to a daughter. And uh, she uh, uh, she is uh, taking a well-deserved uh, day off of this uh, committee. So congratulations to Senator Duckworth. Uh, Chairman Grassley, who's supposed to be keeping the time uh, for this committee, the rules and regulations, five minutes apiece, is taking a little bit uh, longer. But really, this is sort of uh, the... Uh, the formal portion of all of this, where uh, basically everything that's being said right now, if you really wanted to, you could log online, download each yes. one of these statements, uh, and hear in advance what he's, they have He's to taking say. advantage of Chairman's prerogative there, uh, taking a little more time. Interestingly, he, not an attorney, but Chairman of the, uh, the Judiciary Committee uh, in the Senate. Something else that stood out to me that I think is important here is this is a chance, John Thune said this as well, uh, for people in the U.S., around the world, to hear from Mark Zuckerberg uh, on these issues. We've been talking about the statements that Facebook has issued, the posts that Mark Zuckerberg uh, has made. Um, um, Mark Zuckerberg is not somebody that we hear from an awful lot. Um, we've talked about how uh, uneasy a public speaker he is. He doesn't like to give speeches. He'll uh, talk occasionally around earnings or at conferences. He's not out there. I think there's a, a conversation to be had about the role of the Silicon Valley executive, not as somebody that is immediately familiar, at least in terms of what he or she thinks to people in the way that other executives are. Um, this is a chance. We'll be, we'll be calling sound bites from this, of course, listening closely to what he has to say. Just hearing Mark Zuckerberg talk, I think, is a big deal. Absolutely. It was pretty interesting, too, hearing John Thune say, I think we both wrote this down, you know, we all know that Facebook was born out of Zuckerberg's college dorm room, and yeah. him pointing out, for you, it's the American dream, and we both wrote that down, but this can't turn into a privacy nightmare for the users, which is exactly what it seems we're facing. Nothing was born out of my college dorm room <laughs> other than good times. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, and that's about it. Um, 
Again, a consequential moment here uh, for Facebook, a consequential moment uh, for Mark Zuckerberg. David Gura is going to rejoin us on the other side. As I was saying earlier, our coverage uh, continues in just a moment. Thank you so much for joining the live stream pre-show. Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie are going to take it from here. Maybe we'll see you on the other side. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie. Good day, everyone. We're coming on the air on a very busy news day to bring you live coverage of Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg about to testify before Congress. He will likely face some very tough questions about his company's failure to safeguard the personal data of tens of millions of Facebook users, information improperly obtained by the data firm Cambridge Analytica. And the scandal has put the normally low-profile T-shirt-wearing 33-year-old billionaire under intense public scrutiny, triggered a crisis of trust for Facebook unlike anything in the company's 14-year history, Lester. We're also following developments on possible new U.S. military action in Syria, the surprise resignation of President Trump's advisor on homeland security, the cancellation of the president's scheduled first trip to South America later this week, and fallout from the FBI raid yesterday on the offices of the president's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen. As you can see, there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of things we're watching. We're monitoring all that. We'll bring you developments as they warrant. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, though, as you see there, Mark Zuckerberg is set to make his opening statement in just a few moments. This is a joint Senate committee, one of the most eagerly anticipated and potentially explosive congressional hearings in recent memory. No fewer than 43 U.S. senators set to question Mark Zuckerberg. NBC's Jolene Kent covers business for us. She's been following the Facebook story. She's right there in the hearing room watching it unfold. Joe, we expect to hear the words, I'm sorry, a lot today. But Savannah, that's right. We expect the 33-year-old Facebook billionaire, the seventh richest man in the world, person in the world, to apologize multiple times. The focus of his remarks today are going to be taking responsibility and issuing a new level of action and addressing the privacy concerns that come in the aftermath of the Cambridge Analytica scandal that may have impacted up to 87 million Facebook users, most of whom live in the U.S. And his testimony, which he has not yet spoken just yet, but he's expected to address not only the senators, but users out there who have begun leaving Facebook and deleting this uh, particular app and migrating to other social media. So what we're expecting to hear is not just an apology, but solutions. But lawmakers here on Capitol Hill are telling me they are not satisfied necessarily with what Zuckerberg has put forth so far. He's already rolled out some privacy changes, more centralization of your privacy settings, but there's going to likely be some regulatory uh, scrutiny as well here. Savannah. All right, we're still just starting to keep an eye on it, Joe. Thank you. Let's bring in Kara Swisher into this now. She's the co-founder and executive editor of the technology news website Recode and has been following the Facebook story closely. Kara, we know he's going to apologize. We know there's a certain PR aspect to this. But from a business standpoint, what are the goals that, that uh, uh, Zuckerberg faces here? Yeah, well, I think he's got to staunch the, the criticism and, and at least have some answers that they're going to be fixing some of the problems they've created. And it's a giant mess. Um, and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, probably isn't going to cut it here today, although he's going to say a lot of I'm sorries, I'm guessing, right when he reads his statement. And then we'll see what the questions are from, from these. There's so many politicians there asking questions, and there's some ones that are pretty hostile to what Facebook has done. And, and he's been noted as a guy who is not necessarily comfortable in front of crowds, certainly cameras, and there's a lot of attention on him right now. Does that, does that play in his favor in some ways in terms of perceptions? Well, I guess. I mean, I, I wrote his column today talking about this idea that these are boys and they're under scrutiny and it's real hard for them. He's a man who runs a major company. He's a billionaire. He started one of the most powerful companies on the planet. Uh, he can handle it or he should be able to handle it. And if he's not able to handle it, he shouldn't be CEO of Facebook. All right, Kara, thank you very much. Uh, Zuckerberg is now being introduced after the uh, opening statements by the uh, chairman and ranking members of these two committees. Remember, this is a combined Judiciary Committee along with the Commerce, Science, and uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, Chuck Grassley now introducing Mark Zuckerberg. Let's listen. As I mentioned previously, his company now has over $40 billion of annual revenue and over $2 billion monthly active users. Mr. Zuckerberg, along with his wife, also established the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to further philanthropic causes. I now turn to you. Welcome to the committee. 
uh, and uh, whatever your statement is orally, if you have a longer one, it'll be included in the record. So proceed, sir. Chairman Grassley, Chairman Thune, uh, Ranking Member Feinstein, and Ranking Member Nelson, and members of the committee. We face a number of important issues around privacy, safety, and democracy. And you will rightfully have some hard questions for me to answer. Before I talk about the steps we're taking to address them, I want to talk about how we got here. Facebook is an idealistic and optimistic company. For most of our existence, we focused on all of the good that connecting people can do. And as Facebook has grown, people everywhere have gotten a powerful new tool for staying connected to the people they love, for making their voices heard, and for building communities and businesses. Just recently, we've seen the Me Too movement and the March for Our Lives organized, at least in part, on Facebook. After Hurricane Harvey, people came together to raise more than $20 million for relief. And more than 70 million biz small businesses use Facebook to create jobs and grow. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, for foreign interference in elections and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. So now, we have to go through our, all of our relationship with people and make sure that we're taking a broad enough view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just connect people. We have to make sure that those connections are positive. It's not enough to just give people a voice. We need to make sure that people aren't using it to harm other people or to spread misinformation. And it's not enough to just give people control over their information. We need to make sure that the developers they share it with protect their information too. Across the board, we have a responsibility to not just build tools, but to make sure that they're used for good. It will take some time to work through all the changes we need to make across the company, but I'm committed to getting this right. This includes the basic responsibility of protecting people's information, which we failed to do with Cambridge Analytica. So here are a few things that we are doing to address this and to prevent it from happening again. First, we're getting to the bottom of exactly what Cambridge Analytica did and telling everyone affected. What we know now is that Cambridge Analytica improperly accessed some information about millions of Facebook members by buying it from an app developer. That information, uh, th this was information that people generally share publicly on their Facebook pages like names and their profile picture and the pages they follow. When we first contacted Cambridge Analytica, they told us that they had deleted the data. About a month ago, we heard new reports that suggested that wasn't true. And now, we're working with governments in the US, the UK, and around the world to do a full audit of what they've done and to make sure they get rid of any data they may still have. Second, to make sure no other app developers out there are misusing data, we're now investigating every single app that had access to a large amount of information in the past. And if we find that someone improperly used data, we're going to ban them from Facebook and tell everyone affected. Third, to prevent this from ever happening again going forward, we're making sure that developers can access as much information now. The good news here is that we already made big changes to our platform in 2014 that would have prevented this specific situation from Cam with Cambridge Analytica from occurring again today. But there's more to do and you can find more details on the steps we're taking in my written statement. My top priority has always been our social mission of connecting people, building community, and bringing the world closer together. Advertisers and developers will never take priority over that as long as I'm running Facebook. I started Facebook when I was in college. We've come a long way since then. We now serve more than two billion people around the world and every day, people use our services to stay connected with the people that matter to them most. I believe deeply in what we're doing. And I know that when we address these challenges, we'll look back and view helping people connect and giving more people a voice as a positive force in the world. 
I realize the issues we're talking about today aren't just issues for Facebook and our community. They're issues and challenges for all of us as Americans. Thank you for having me here today, and I'm ready to take your questions. <clears throat> I'll remind members that maybe weren't here when I had my opening comments that we are operating under the five-year, five-minute rule, and that applies to uh, the, <laughs> the five-minute rule, and that applies to those of us who are chairing the committee as well. Uh, I start with you. Uh, Facebook handles extensive amounts of personal data for billions of users. A sig significant amount of that data is shared with third-party developers who utilize your platform. As of this, early this year, you did not actively monitor whether that data was transferred by such developers to other parties. Moreover, your policies only prohibit transfers by developers to parties seeking to profit from such data. Number one, besides Professor Kogan's transfer and now potentially CubeU, do you know of any instances where user data was improperly transferred to third party in breach of Facebook's terms? If so, how many times has that happened? And was Facebook only made aware of that transfer by some third party? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're now conducting a full investigation into every single app that had a access to a large amount of information uh, before we locked down platform to prevent developers from accessing this information in around 2014. Uh, we believe that we're going to be investigating many apps, tens of thousands of apps, and if we find any suspicious activity, we're going to conduct a full audit of those apps to understand how they're using their data and if they're doing anything improper. And if we find that they're doing anything improper, we'll ban them from Facebook and we will tell everyone affected. Uh, as for past activity, I, I don't have um, all the examples of apps that we've banned here, but if you'd like, I can have my team follow up with you after this. Okay. Have you ever required an audit to ensure the deletion of improperly transferred data? And if so, how many times? Mr. Chairman, um, yes, we have. I don't have the exact figure on how many times we have, but overall, the way we've enforced our platform policies in the past um, is we have looked at patterns of how apps have, have used our APIs and accessed information as well as looked into uh, reports that people have made to us about apps that might be doing sketchy things. Going forward, we're going to take a more proactive position on this uh, and, and do much more regular spot checks and other reviews of apps, um, as well as increasing the amount of audits that we do. And again, I can make sure that our team follows up with you on, on anything about the, the specific past stats that would be interesting. Um, I was going to assume that sitting here today, you have no idea uh, and if, if I'm wrong on that, uh, you're able, you're telling me, I think, that you're able to supply those figures to us, at, at least as of this point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I will have my team follow up with you on what information we have. Okay, but right now you have no certainty of whether or not, uh, wh wh how much of that's going on, right? Okay. Facebook collects massive amounts of data from consumers, including content, networks, contact list, device information, location, and information from third parties. Yet your data policy is only a few pages long and provides consumers with only a few examples of what is collected and how it might be used. The examples given emphasize benign uses, such as connecting with friends, but your policy does not give any indication for more controversial issues of such data. My question. Why doesn't Facebook disclose to its users all the ways the data might be used by Facebook and other third parties, and what is Facebook's responsibility to inform users about that information? Mr. Chairman, I, I believe it's important to tell people exactly how the information that they share on Facebook is going to be used. That's why every single time you go to share something on Facebook, whether it's a photo in Facebook uh, or a message in, in Messenger or WhatsApp, uh, every single time it, there's a control right there about who you're going to be sharing it with, whether it's your friends or public or a specific group, uh, and you can, you can change that and control that in line. To your broader point about the privacy policy, um, 
this gets into an, an issue that I, I think we and others in the tech industry have found challenging, which is that long privacy policies are very confusing. And if you make it long and spell out all the detail, then you're probably gonna reduce the percent of people who read it and make it accessible to them. So one of the things that, that we've struggled with over time is to make something that is as simple as possible so people can understand it, as well as giving them controls in line in the product in the context of when they're trying to actually use them, uh, taking into account that we don't expect that most people will wanna go through and read a full legal document. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yesterday when we talked, I gave the relatively harmless example that I'm uh, communicating with my friends on Facebook and indicate that uh, I love a certain kind of chocolate. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, I start receiving advertisements for chocolate. What if I don't want to receive those commercial advertisements? So your chief operating officer, Ms. Sandberg, suggested on the NBC Today show that Facebook users who do not want their personal information used for advertising might have to pay for that protection, pay for it. Are you actually uh, considering having Facebook users pay for you not to use that information? Um, Senator, people have a control over how their information is used in ads in the product today. So if you want to have an experience where your ads aren't, you aren't targeted using uh, all the information that we have available, you can turn off third-party information. What we've found is that even though some people don't like ads, people really don't like ads that aren't relevant. And while there is some discomfort, for sure, with using information in making ads uh, more relevant, the overwhelming feedback that we get from our community is that people would rather have us uh, show relevant content there um, than not. So we offer this control that, you, that you're referencing. Um, some people use it. It's not the majority of people on Facebook. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's a, a good level of control to offer. I think what Cheryl was saying was that in order to not run ads at all, we would still need some sort of business model. And that is your business model. So I take it that, uh, and I use the harmless example of chocolate, but if it got into more personal thing, communicating with friends, and I want to cut it off, I'm going to have to pay you in order not to send me using my personal information something that I don't want. That, in essence, is what I understood Ms. Sandberg to say. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. Although, to be clear, we don't offer an option today for people to pay to not show ads. We think offering an ad-supported service is the most aligned with our mission of trying to help connect everyone in the world because we want to offer a free service that everyone can afford. Okay. That's the only way that we can reach billions of people. So, therefore, you consider my personally identifiable data the company's data, not my data. Is that it? No, Senator. Actually, at the first line of our terms of service say that you control and own the information and content that you put on Facebook. Well, the recent scandal uh, is obviously frustrating, not only because it affected 87 million, but because it seems to be part of a pattern of lax data practices by the company going back years. So back in 2011, it was a settlement with the FTC, and now we discover yet another instance where the data was failed to be protected. When you discovered the Cambridge Analytica that had fraudulently obtained all of this information, why didn't you inform those 87 million? When we learned in 2015 that Cambridge Analytica had bought data from an app developer on Facebook that people had shared it with, uh, we did take action. We took down the app and we 
demanded that both the app developer and Cambridge Analytica delete and stop using any data that they had. They told us that they did this. In retrospect, it was clearly a mistake to believe them. And yeah. we should have followed up and done a full audit then. And that is not a mistake that we will make. Yes, you did that. And you uh, apologize for it. But you didn't <laughs> notify them. And uh, do you think that you have an ethical obligation to notify 87 million Facebook users? Senator, when we heard back from Cambridge Analytica that they had told us that they weren't using the data and had deleted it, we considered it a closed case. <coughs> In retrospect, that was clearly a mistake. We shouldn't have taken their word for it, and we've updated our policies and how we're going to operate the company to make sure that we don't make that mistake again. Did anybody notify the FTC? No, Senator, for the same reason, that we'd considered it a closed, uh, closed case. Senator Thune. And, and Mr. Zuckerberg, would you that, do that differently today, presumably, that in response to Senator Nelson's question? Yes. Having to do it over. Um, this may be your first appearance before Congress, but it's not the first time that Facebook has faced tough questions about its privacy policies. Uh, Wired Magazine recently noted that you have a 14-year history of apologizing for ill-advised decisions regarding user privacy, not unlike the one that you made uh, just now in your opening statement. After more than a uh, decade of promises to do better, how is today's apology different? And why should we trust Facebook to make the necessary changes to ensure user privacy and give people a clearer picture of your privacy policies? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have made a lot of mistakes in running the company. I think it's, it's pretty much impossible, I, I believe, to start a company in your dorm room and then grow it to be at the scale that we're at now without uh, making some mistakes. And because our service is about um, helping people connect and information, um, those mistakes have been different in, in how they, it, we try not to make the same mistake multiple times, but in general, a lot of the mistakes are around um, how people connect to each other just because of the nature of the service. Overall, I would say that we're going through a broader philosophical shift in how we approach our responsibility as a company. For the first 10 or 12 years of the company, I viewed our responsibility as primarily building tools that if we could put those tools in people's hands, then that would empower people to do good things. What I think we've learned now across a number of issues, not just data privacy, but also fake news and foreign interference in elections, is that we need to take a more proactive role and a broader view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just build tools. We need to make sure that they're used for good. And that means that we need to now take a more active view in policing the ecosystem um, and in watching and kind of looking out and, and making sure that all of the members in our community are using these tools in a way that's going to be good and healthy. So um, at the end of the day, this is going to be something where people will measure us by our results uh, on this. Um, it's not that I expect that anything I say here today to, to necessarily change people's view. Uh, but I'm committed to getting this right, and I believe that over the coming years, once we fully work all these solutions through, um, people will see real, real differences. Okay. Well, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you all have gotten that message. Um, as we discussed in my office yesterday, the line between legitimate political discourse and hate speech can sometimes be hard to identify, and especially when you're relying on artificial intelligence and other technologies for the initial discovery. Can you discuss what steps that Facebook currently takes when making these evaluations, the challenges that you face, and any examples of where you may draw the line between what is and what is not hate speech? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'll speak to hate speech, and then um, I'll talk about enforcing our content policies more broadly. Um, so actually, maybe if, if, if you're OK with it, I'll go in the other order. So. From the beginning of the company in 2004, I started it in my dorm room. Um, it was me and my roommate. We didn't have AI technology that could look at the content that people were sharing. So, um, so it, we basically had to uh, enforce our content policies reactively. People could share what they wanted. And, uh, and then if someone in the community found it to be offensive or against our policies, they'd flag it for us and we'd look at it reactively. Now, increasingly, we are developing AI tools that can identify certain classes of bad activity um, proactively and flag it for our team at Facebook. 
Um, by the end of this year, by the way, we're going to have um, more than 20,000 people working on security and content review, um, working across all these things. So when, when content gets flagged to us, we have those, those people look at it, and if it violates our policies, then we take it down. Some problems lend themselves more easily to AI solutions than others. So hate speech is one of the hardest because determining if something is hate speech is very linguistically nuanced, right? It's, you need to understand um, you know, what is a slur and what, um, whether something is hateful, not just in English, but the majority of people on Facebook use it in languages that are different across the world. Um, contrast that, for example, with an area like finding terrorist propaganda, which we've actually been very successful at deploying AI tools on already. Today, as we sit here, 99% of the ISIS and Al-Qaeda content that we take down on Facebook are AI systems flagged before any human sees it. So that's a success in terms of, of rolling out AI tools um, that, can, that can proactively um, police and enforce safety across the community. Um, hate speech, I am optimistic that over a five to 10 year period, we will have AI tools that can uh, get into some of the nuances, the linguistic nuances of, of, of different types of content to be more accurate in flagging things for our systems. But today we're just not there on that. So a lot of this is still reactive. People flag it to us. Um, we, we have people look at it. Um, we have policies to try to make it as not subjective as possible. But until we get it more automated, there's a higher error rate than I'm happy with. Thank you, Senator Mr. Feinstein. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, what is Facebook doing to prevent foreign actors from interfering in U.S. elections? Thank you, Senator. Um, this is one of my top priorities in 2018, um, is to get this right. I, uh, one of my greatest regrets in running the company is that we were slow in identifying the Russian information operations in 2016. We expected them to do a number of more traditional cyber attacks, which we did identify and notify um, the campaigns that they were trying to hack into them, but we were slow at identifying the type of, of new information operations. When did you identify new operations? Uh, it was right around the time of the 2016 election itself. So since then, we 2018 is, is an incredibly important year for elections, not just in, with the U.S. midterms, but around the world. There are important elections in India, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Pakistan, and in Hungary that we want to make sure that we do everything we can to protect the integrity of those elections. Now, I have more confidence that we're going to get this right because since the 2016 election, there have been several important elections around the world where we've had a better record. There's the French presidential election. There's the German election. There was the U.S. Uh, Senate Alabama special election last year. Explain what is better about the record. So we've deployed new AI tools uh, that do a better job of identifying fake accounts that may be trying to interfere in elections or spread misinformation. And between those three elections, we were able to proactively remove tens of thousands of accounts that before they, they could um, contribute significant harm. And the nature of these attacks, though, is that you know, there are people in Russia whose job it is is to try to exploit our systems and other internet systems and other systems as well. So this is an arms race. Right? I mean, they're going to keep on getting better at this, and we need to invest in keeping on getting better at this too, which is why uh, one of the things I mentioned before is we're going to have uh, more than 20,000 people by the end of this year working on security and content review across the company. Speak for a moment about automated bots that spread disinformation what are you doing to punish those who exploit your platform in that regard? Well, you're not allowed to have a fake account on Facebook. Your content has to be authentic. So we build technical tools to try to identify when people are creating fake accounts, especially large networks of fake accounts like the Russians have, in order to remove all of that content. After the 2016 election, our top priority was protecting the integrity of other elections around the world. But at the same time, we had a parallel effort to trace back to Russia um, the IRA activity, the Internet Research Agency activity, that was the part of the Russian government that, uh, that did this activity in, in, in 2016. And just last week, uh, we were able to determine uh, that a number of Russian media organizations that were sanctioned by the Russian regulator were operated and controlled 
by this internet research agency. So we took the step last week, that was a pretty big step for us, of taking down um, sanctioned news organizations in Russia as part of an operation to remove 270 uh, fake accounts and pages, part of their broader network in Russia, um, that was, that was actually not targeting international interference as much as, I'm sorry, let me, let me correct that. It was primarily targeting um, spreading misinformation in Russia itself as well as certain Russian-speaking neighboring countries. How many accounts of this type have you taken down? Across, uh, in the IRA specifically, the ones that we've pegged back to the IRA, um, we can identify the 470 in the American elections and the 270 that we specifically went after in Russia last week. There are many others that our systems catch, which are uh, more difficult to attribute specifically to Russian intelligence. But the number would be in the tens of thousands of fake accounts that we remove. And I'm happy to have my team follow up with you on more information if that would be helpful. Would you please? Uh, I think this is very important. Um, if you knew in 2015 that Cambridge Analytica was using the information of Professor Kogan's why didn't Facebook ban Cambridge in 2015? Why'd you wait another Senator, year? that's a, a great question. Um, Cambridge Analytica wasn't using our services in 2015 as far as we can tell. So th this is, this is uh, clearly one of the questions that I asked our team as soon as I learned about this is why, why did we wait until we found out about the reports last month to, to, to ban them? Um, it's because as of the time that we learned about their activity in 2015, they weren't an advertiser, they weren't running pages, so we actually had nothing to ban. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Now, Senator Hatch. Uh, well, in my opinion, this is the most, uh, this is the most intense public scrutiny I've seen uh, for a tech-related hearing since the Microsoft hearing that, that I chaired back in the late 1990s. The recent stories about Cambridge uh, Analytica and data mining on social media have raised serious concerns about consumer privacy. And naturally, I know you understand that. At the same time, these stories touch on the very foundation of the internet economy and the way the websites uh, that drive our internet economy make money. Some have professed themselves shocked, shocked, that, that companies like Facebook and Google share user data with advertisers. Did any of these individuals ever stop to ask themselves why Facebook and Google didn't, uh, don't, change, don't charge for access? Nothing in life is free. Everything involves trade-offs. If you want something without having to pay money for it, you're going to have to pay for it in some other way, it seems to me. And that's where, what we're seeing here. And these great websites that don't charge for access, they extract value in some other way. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're upfront about what they're doing. To my mind, the issue here is transparency. It's consumer choice. Do users understand what they're agreeing to, to when they access a website or agree to terms of service? Are websites upfront about how they extract uh, value from users or do they hide the ball? Do consumers have the information they need to make an informed choice regarding whether or not to visit a particular website? To my, to my mind, these are questions that we should ask or be focusing on. Now, Mr. Zuckerberg, I remember well your first visit to Capitol Hill back in 2010. You spoke to the Senate Republican High Tech Task Force, which I chair. You said back then that Facebook would always be free. Is that still your objective? Senator, yes. There will always be a version of Facebook that is free. It is our mission to try to help connect everyone around the world and to bring the world closer together. In order to do that, we believe that we need to offer a service that everyone can afford, and we're committed to doing that. Well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. I see. That's great. Whenever a controversy like this arises, there's always a danger that Congress's response will be to step in and overregulate. Now, that's been the experience that I've had in my 42 years here. In your view, what sorts of legislative changes would help to solve the problems the Cambridge Analytica story has revealed, and what sorts of legislative changes would not help to solve this issue? Senator, I think that there are a few categories of legislation that, uh, that make sense to consider. Around privacy specifically, um, 
there are a few principles that I think it would be useful to, to discuss and, um, and potentially codify into law. Uh, one is around having a simple and practical um, set of, of ways that you explain what you're doing with data. And we talked a little bit earlier around the complexity of laying out these, this long privacy policy. It's hard to say that people you know, fully understand something when it's only written out in a long legal document. This, need, this stuff needs to be um, implemented in a way where people can actually understand it, where consumers can, can understand it. Um, but that can also um, capture all the nuances of how uh, these services work in a way that doesn't, that's not overly restrictive on, on pr providing the services. So that's one. The second is around giving people complete control. This is the most important principle for Facebook. Every piece of content that you share on Facebook, uh, you own, and you have complete control over who sees it and, and how you share it, and you can remove it at any time. Um, that's why every day, uh, about 100 billion times a day, um, people come to one of our services and either post a photo or send a message to someone because they know that they have that control um, and that who they say it's going to go to is going to be um, who, who sees the content. And I think that that control is something that's important that I think should apply to, uh, to every service. And go ahead. The, the third point is, is just around enabling innovation. Because some of these use cases that, um, that are, are very sensitive, like face recognition, for example. And I think that there's a balance that's extremely important to strike here, where you obtain special consent for sensitive features like face recognition, but don't but we still need to make it so that American companies can innovate in those areas, or else we're going to fall behind Chinese competitors um, and others around the world who have different regimes um, for, for different new uh, features like that. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, do you know who Palantir is? I do. Some people have referred to them as uh, Stanford Analytica. Do you agree? Senator, I have not heard that. Okay. Do you think Palantir taught Cambridge Analytica, as press reports are saying, how to do these tactics? Senator, I don't know. Do you think that Palantir has ever scraped data from Facebook? Senator, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Do you think that during the 2016 campaign as Cambridge Analytica was providing support to the Trump campaign under Project Alamo. Were there any Facebook people involved in that sharing of technique and information? Senator, we provided support to the Trump campaign similar to what we provide to any advertiser or campaign uh, who, who asks for it. So that was a yes. Is that a yes? Senator, can you repeat the specific question? I just want to make sure I, I, I get specifically what you're asking. During the 2016 campaign, Cambridge Analytica worked with the Trump campaign to refine tactics, and were Facebook employees involved in that? Senator, I'm, I don't know that our employees were involved with Cambridge Analytica, although I know that we did help out the Trump campaign overall in sales support in the same way that we do with other campaigns. So they may have been involved in all working together during that time period. Maybe that's something your investigation will find out. Senator, my, I can certainly have my team get back to you on any specifics there that I don't know sitting here today. Have you heard of total information awareness? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I do not. Okay. Total information awareness was uh, 2003. John Ashcroft and others trying to do similar things to what I think is behind all of this geopolitical forces trying to get data and information to influence a process. So when I look at Palantir and what they're doing, and I look at WhatsApp, which is another acquisition, and I look at where you are from the 2011 consent decree and where you are today, I'm thinking, is this guy out foxing the foxes or is he going along with what is a major trend in an information age to try to harvest information for political forces. And so my question to you is, 
do you see that those applications, that those companies, Palantir, and even WhatsApp are going to fall into the same situation that you've just fallen into over the last several years? Um, Senator, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure specifically. Overall, I, I do think that these issues around information access are challenging. To the specifics about those apps, I'm not really that familiar with what Palantir does. Um, WhatsApp collects very little information and I, I think is less likely to have the kind of issues because of the way that the service is architected. But certainly I think that these are broad issues across the tech industry. Well, I guess given the track record of where Facebook is and why you're here today, I guess people would say that they didn't act boldly enough. And the fact that um, people like John Bolton basically was an investor in a uh, New York Times article earlier, I guess it was actually last month, that the Bolton Pack was obsessed with how America was becoming limp-wristed and spineless and had wanted research and messaging for national security issues. So the fact that you know, there are a lot of people who are interested in this larger effort. And what I think my constituents want to know is, was this discussed at your board meetings? And what are the applications and interests that are uh, being discussed without putting real teeth into this? We don't want to come back to this situation again. I believe you have all the talent. My question is whether you have all the will to help us solve this problem. Yes, Senator. So data privacy and foreign interference in elections are certainly topics that we have discussed at the board meeting. These are some of the biggest issues that the company has faced, and we feel a huge responsibility to get these right. Do you believe the European regulations should be applied here in the U.S.? Senator, I think everyone in the world deserves good privacy protection. And regardless of whether we implement the exact same regulation, I would guess that it would be somewhat different because we have somewhat different sensibilities in the U.S. as to other countries. Um, we're committed to rolling out the controls and the affirmative consent uh, and the uh, special controls around sensitive uh, types of technology like face recognition um, that are required in GDPR. We're doing that around the world. Um, so I think it's certainly worth discussing whether we should have something similar in, in the U.S., uh, but what I would like to say today is that we're going to go forward and implement that regardless of what the regulatory outcome is. Senator Wicker. Uh, Senator Thune will chair uh, next. Senator Wicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for being with us. Uh, my question is going to be sort of a follow-up on what Senator Hatch was talking about. And let me agree with uh, basically uh, his... his um, advice that we don't want to overregulate to the point to the point where we're stifling innovation and investment i understand with regard to suggested rules or suggested legislation there are at least two schools of thought uh, out there uh, one would be the isps the Inter internet service providers who are advocating for privacy protections for consumers that apply to all online entities equally across the entire internet ecosystem. Now, uh, Facebook is an edge provider on the other hand. It's my understanding that many edge providers such as Facebook may not support that effort because edge providers have different business models uh, than the ISPs and should not be considered like services. So um, do you think we need consistent privacy protections for consumers across the entire internet ecosystem that are based on the type of consumer information being collected, used, or shared, regardless of the entity doing the collecting or using or sharing? Senator, this is an important question. I would differentiate between ISPs which I consider to be the pipes of the internet, and the platforms like Facebook or Google or Twitter or YouTube that are the um, apps or, or platforms on top of that. I think in general, the expectations that people have of the pipes 
um, are somewhat different from the platforms. So there might be areas where there needs to be more regulation in one and less in the other, but I think that there are gonna be other places where there needs to be more regulation of, of the other type. Um, specifically though, on the pipes, one of the important issues that um, that I think we face and, and have debated is... is when, you, when you say pipes, you mean... ISPs. The ISPs. Yeah. Um, and I know net neutrality has been a, a hotly debated topic, and one of the reasons why I have been out there um, saying that I think that that should be the case is because, you know, I look at my own story of when I was getting started building Facebook at Harvard, um, you know, I only had one option for an ISP to use, and if I had to pay extra in order to um, make it so that my app could potentially be seen or used by other people, then, uh, then we probably wouldn't be here today. Okay, well, well I'm, but we're talking about privacy concerns, and, and let me just say, we, we'll have to follow up on this, but I, I, I think you and I agree this is gonna be one of the major um, items of debate if we have to go forward and, and do this from a governmental standpoint. Let me just uh, move on to another couple of items. Is it true that, um, as was recently publicized, that Facebook collects the call and text histories of its users that use Android phones. Senator, we have an app called Messenger uh, for sending messages to your Facebook friends, and that app offers people an option to sync uh, their, their text messages into the messaging app and to make it so that, uh, so basically, so you can have one app where it has both your texts and, um, and your Facebook messages in one place. Um, we also allow people the option of You can letting, opt in or out of that? Yes, is it, it is opt-in. opt out? It is opt-in. You, you, you have to affirmatively say that you want to sync that information before we get access so unless, to it. Unless you opt in, they, you don't collect that call and text history. That is correct. And is that true for, uh, is, is this practice done at all with minors or do you make an exception there for persons age 13 to 17? Um, I do not know. We can follow up. On okay, that. do that. Let's do that. One other thing. Uh, there have been reports that Facebook can track a user's internet browsing activity even after that user has logged off of the Facebook platform. Can you confirm whether or not this is true? Um, Senator, I, I want to make sure I get this accurate, so it would probably be better to have my team follow up. So you afterwards. don't know? Um, I know that the people use cookies on the internet, and that you can probably correlate activity between um, between sessions. Um, we do that for a number of reasons, including security and including measuring ads to make sure that the ad experiences are the most effective, which of course people can opt out of. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm precise well, in my when, answer. So well, when you let get me when you get back to me, sir. Uh, would, would you also let us know how Facebook discloses to its users that engaging in this type of tracking uh, uh, gives us that result? Yes. Thank, and thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Wicker. Senator Leahy's up next. <clears throat> thank you. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, I, I assume um, Facebook's been served with subpoenas from the special counsel Mueller's office. Is that correct? Yes. Have you or anyone at Facebook been interviewed by the special counsel's office? Yes. Have you been interviewed? I have not. I, I, I have not. Others have. I, I believe so. And I want to be careful here because that uh, our work with the special counsel is confidential. And I want to make sure that in an open session, I'm not revealing something that's <clears throat> confidential. I understand. That's why I made clear that you have been contacted, you have had subpoenas. Actually, let me clarify that. I, I actually am not aware of, of a subpoena. I believe that there may be, but I know we're working with them. Thank you. Um, six months ago, your general counsel uh, promised us that you were taking steps to prevent Facebook from serving what I would call an unwitting co-conspirator in Russian interference. But these... Um, these unverified divisive pages are on Facebook today. <clears throat> they look a lot like the anonymous groups of Russian agents used to spread propaganda during the 2016 election. Are you able to confirm whether they're 
Russian created groups, yes or no? Senator, are you asking about those specifically? Yes. Um, Senator, last week we actually announced a, a major change to our ads and pages policies that we will be verifying the identity of um, every single Ask advertiser. About the specific ones, do you know whether they are? I am not familiar with those pieces of content specifically. But if you decided this policy of a week ago, you'd be able to verify them? We are working on that now. What we're doing is we're going to verify the identity of any advertiser who's running a political um, or issue-related ad. Uh, this is basically what the Honest Ads Act is proposing, um, and we're following that. Um, and we're also going to do that for pages. But you can't so, answer on these. I, I'm not familiar with those specific will cases. You, will you find out the answer and get back to me? I'll have my team get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think it's worth adding, though, that we're going to do the same verification of the identity and location of admins who are running large pages. So that way, even if they aren't going to be buying ads in our system, um, that will make it significantly harder for Russian um, interference efforts or other inauthentic efforts well, some, um, to try to spread misinformation through the network. And so far, it's been going on for some time. Some might say that's about time. You know, six months ago, I asked your general counsel about Facebook's role as a breeding ground for hate speech against Rohingya refugees. Recently, UN investigators blamed Facebook uh, for playing a role in citing possible genocide in Myanmar, and there has been genocide there. Now, you say you use AI to find this. This is a type of uh, content I'm referring to. It calls for the death of a Muslim journalist. Now, that threat went straight through your detection systems. It spread very quickly. And then it took attempt after attempt after attempt and the involvement of civil society groups to get you to remove it. Why couldn't it be removed within 24 hours? Senator, what's happening in Myanmar is a terrible tragedy, I, and we no, need to we, do more. We, we all agree with that. Okay. But you and investigators have blamed, you, you blame Facebook we're playing a role in the genocide. We all agree it's terrible. How can you dedicate and will you dedicate the resources to make sure such hate speech is taken down within 24 hours? Yes, we're working on this. And there are three specific things that we're doing. One is we're hiring dozens of more Burmese language um, content reviewers because hate speech is very language specific. It's hard to do it without people who speak the local language, and we need to ramp up our effort there dramatically. Second is we're working with civil society in Myanmar to identify specific hate figures so we can take down their accounts rather than specific pieces of content. And third is we're standing up a product team to do specific product changes in Myanmar and other countries that, that may have similar issues in the future um, to prevent this from, from happening. When Senator Cruz and I uh, sent a letter to Apple uh, asking what they're going to do about Chinese censorship. Uh, my question, I'll place it. That'd be great. Thank you, Senator Lee. Place for the record, I want to know what you will do about Chinese censorship when they come to you. Sen Senator Graham's up next. Thank you. Uh, are you familiar with Andrew Bosworth? Yes, Senator, I am. He said, so we connect more people, maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack, coordinated on our uh, tools. The ugly truth is that we believe in connecting people so deeply that anything that allows us to connect more people more often is de facto good. Do you agree with that? No, Senator, I do not. And as context, Boz wrote that, Boz is what we call him internally. Um, he wrote that as an internal note. Um, we have a lot of discussion internally. I disagreed with it at the time that he wrote it. If you looked at the comments on the internal discussion, the Would vast majority of people internally did too. That you did a poor job as a CEO communicating your displeasure with such thoughts. Because if he had understood where you, where you were at, he would never have said it to begin with. Well, Senator, 
We try to run our company in a way where people can express different opinions internally. Well, this is an opinion that really disturbs me. <laughs> and if somebody worked for me that said this, I'd fire them. Uh, who's your biggest competitor? Uh, Senator, we have a lot of competitors. Well, who's your biggest? Mm, I think the categories of, do, do you want just one? I, I'm not sure I can give one, but can I give a, a, a bunch? Mm -hmm. So there are three categories that I would focus on. One are the other tech platforms, so Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. We overlap with them in different ways. Do they, do, do they provide the same service you provide? Um, in different ways, different well, parts me, of it, yes. Let me put this way. If I buy a Ford and it doesn't work well and I don't like it, I can buy a Chevy. If I'm upset with Facebook, what's the equivalent product that I can go sign up for? Uh, well, there's the second category that I was going to talk about. Are I'm not talking about categories. I'm talking about is there real competition you face? Because car companies face a lot of competition. If they make a defective car, it gets out in the world. People stop buying that car. They buy another one. Is it an alternative to Facebook in the private sector? Uh, yes, Senator. The average American uses eight different apps okay. to communicate with their friends and stay in touch with people, okay. ranging from texting Which apps the, to email. Which is the same to service you provide. Well, we is, provide a number of different services. Is Twitter the same as what you do? It overlaps with a portion of what we do. You don't think you have a monopoly? Uh, it certainly doesn't feel like that to me. Okay. <laughs> so it doesn't. So Instagram, you bought Instagram. Why did you buy Instagram? Uh, because they were very talented app developers who were making good use of our platform and understood our values. It was a good business decision. My point is that one way to regulate a company is through competition, through government regulation. Here's the question that all of us got to answer. What do we tell our constituents, given what's happened here, why we should let you self-regulate? What would you tell people in South Carolina that given all the things we've just discovered here, it's a good idea for us to rely upon you to regulate your own business practices? Well, Senator, my position is not that there should be no regulation. Okay. I think the internet is increasingly important. you embrace important. regulation? I, I think the real question, as the internet becomes more important in people's lives, is what is the right regulation, not whether there should but, be but or not. But you as a company welcome regulation? I think if it's the right regulation, then you yes. You think the Europeans have it right? Uh, I think that they get things right. Have you ever submitted? <laughs> That's true. Uh, so would you work with us in terms of what regulations you think are necessary in your industry? Absolutely. Okay, would you submit to us some proposed regulations? Yes, and I'll have my team follow up with you so that way we can have this discussion across the different categories where I think that this discussion needs to happen. Look forward to it. When you sign up for Facebook, you sign up uh, for terms of service. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay, it says, the terms govern your use of Facebook and the products, features, apps, services, technology, software we offer Facebook's products or products, except where we expressly state that separate terms and not these apply. I'm a lawyer, I have no idea what that means. But when you look at terms of service, this is what you get. Do you think the average consumer understands what they're signing up for? I don't think that the average person likely reads that whole document. Yeah. But I think that there are different ways that we can communicate that and have a responsibility to do so. Do you, do you agree with me that you better come up with different ways because this ain't working? Uh, well, Senator, I think in certain areas that is true. And I think in other areas, like the core part of what we do. But right? if, you, if you think about just at the most basic level, people come to Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger about 100 billion times a day to share a piece of content or a message with a specific set of people. And I think that that basic functionality, people understand because we have the controls in line every time, and given the volume of, of, of the activity and the value that people tell us that they're getting from that, um, I think that that control in line does seem to be working fairly well. Now, we can always do better, and there are other and the services are complex, and there is more to it than just uh, you know, you go and you post a photo. Um, so I, I, I agree that, that in many places we could do better. But I think for the core of the service, it actually is um, quite clear. Thank you, Senator Graham. Senator Klobuchar. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, I think we all agree that what happened here was bad. You acknowledged it was a breach of trust. And the way I explain it to my constituents is that if someone breaks into my apartment with a crowbar and they take my stuff, uh, it is just like if the manager gave them the keys or if they didn't have any locks on the doors. It's still a breach. It's still a break-in. And I believe we need to have laws and rules that are sophisticated as the brilliant products that you've developed here. And we just haven't done that yet. And one of the areas that I've focused on is the election. And I appreciate the support that you and Facebook and now Twitter, actually, have given to the Honest Ads Act, a bill uh, that you mentioned that I'm leading with Senator uh, McCain and Senator Warner. And I just want to be clear, as we work to pass this law so that we have the same rules in place to disclose political ads and issue ads um, as we do for TV and radio, as well as disclaimers, that you're going to take early action as soon as June, I heard, uh, before this election, so that people can view these ads, including issue ads. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator, and I just want to take a moment before I go into this in more detail to thank you for your leadership on this. Um, this, I think, is an important area for the whole industry to move on. Um, the two specific things that we're doing are, one is around transparency. So now you're going to be able to go and click on any advertiser or any page on Facebook and see all of the ads that they're running. So that actually brings advertising online on Facebook to an even higher standard than what you would have on TV or print media because there's nowhere where you can see all of the TV ads that someone is running, for example, whereas you will be able to see now on Facebook um, whether this um, campaign or, or third party is saying different messages to different types of people. I think that that's a really important element of transparency. Mm -hmm. Then the other really important piece is around verifying every single um, advertiser who's going to be running political um, or issue ads. I appreciate that. And Senator Warner and I have also called on Google and the other platforms to do the same. So memo to the rest of you. Uh, we have to get this done or we're going to have a patchwork of ads. And I uh, hope that you'll be working with us to pass this bill. Is that right? We will. Okay, thank you. Um, now on the subject of Cambridge Analytica, um, were these people, uh, the 87 million people, users, um, concentrated in certain states? Are you able to figure out where they're from? I do not have that information with me, but, you uh, but we it. can follow up with your, your office. Okay, because as we know, that election was close and it was only thousands of votes in certain states. Uh, you've also estimated that roughly 126 people, million people may have been shown content from a Facebook page associated with the Internet Research Agency. Have you determined when he, whether any of those people were the same Facebook users whose data was shared with Cambridge Analytica? Are you able to make that determination? Senator, we're investigating that now. Um, we believe that it is entirely possible that there will be a connection there. Okay, that seems like a big deal as we look back at that last election. Uh, former Cambridge Analytica employee Christopher Wiley has said that the data uh, that it improperly obtained, that Cambridge Analytica improperly obtained from Facebook users could be stored in Russia. Uh, do you agree that that's a possibility? Uh, s sorry, are you, are you asking if Cambridge Analytica's da data could be stored in Russia? That's what he said this weekend on a Sunday show. Um, Senator, I don't have any specific knowledge that would suggest that, but one of the steps that we need to take now is go do a full audit of all of Cambridge Analytica's systems to understand uh, what they're doing, whether they still have any data, to make sure that they remove all the data. If they don't, we're going to take legal action against them to do so. That audit, um, we have temporarily ceded that in order to let the UK government complete their government investigation first, because of course a government investigation takes precedence over a company doing that. But we are committed to completing this full audit and getting to the bottom of what's going on here, so that way we can have more answers to this. Okay, you um, earlier stated uh, publicly and here uh, that you would support some privacy rules um, so that everyone's um, playing by the same rules here. Um, and you also said here that you should have notified customers earlier. Uh, would you support a rule uh, that would require you to notify your users of a breach within 72 hours? Senator, that makes sense to me, and I think we should um, have our team follow up with, with yours to, to discuss the details around that more. 
Thank you. I just think part of this was when people don't even know that their data has been breached, uh, that's a huge problem. And I also think we get to solutions faster when we get that information out there. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to passing this bill. We'd love to pass it before the election on the honest ads and um, looking forward to better disclosure of this election. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Blunt's up next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, nice to see you. When I saw you not too long after I entered the Senate in 2011, I told you when I sent my business cards down to be printed, they came back from the Senate print shop with the message that was the first business card they'd ever printed a Facebook uh, address on. There are days when I've regretted that, but more days when we get lots of information that we need to get. There are days when I wonder if the Facebook friends is a little misstated. That doesn't seem like I have those every single day. But, you know, the, the platform you've created is really important. Now, my son, Charlie, who's 13, is dedicated to Instagram, so he'd want to be sure I mentioned him while I was here with, uh, uh, with you. I haven't printed that on my card yet. I, I will, will say that, but I think we have that account as well. Lots of ways to connect people. And the the information, obviously, is an important commodity, and it's what makes your business work. I get that. However, I wonder about some of the collection efforts, and maybe we can go through largely just even yes and no, and then we'll get back to more expense, uh, expansive discussion of this. Uh, but do you um, collect user data through cross-device tracking? Uh, Senator, I believe we do link people's accounts between devices in order to make sure that their Facebook and Instagram and their other experiences can be synced between their devices. And that would also include offline data, data that's uh, tracking that's not necessarily linked to Facebook, but linked to one some device they went through Facebook on. Is that right? Senator, I want to make sure we get this right. So I, I want to have my team follow up with you on that afterwards. Well, I, that doesn't seem that complicated to me. Now, you, you understand this better than I do, but maybe, maybe you can explain to me why that's, that, why that's complicated. Do you track devices that an individual who uses Facebook has that is connected to the device that they use for their Facebook connection but not necessarily connected to Facebook? I'm not, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Really? Yes. There, there may be some data that um, is necessary to provide the service that we do, uh, but I don't, I don't have that on, on sitting here today, so that's something that I would want to follow now up. Now, the with. FTC last year flagged cross-device tracking as one of their concerns, generally, that people are tracking devices that the users of something like Facebook don't know that are being tracked. How do you disclose your... Uh, collected collection methods. Is that all in this document that I would see and agree to before I entered into a Facebook? Yes, Senator. So there are, there are two ways that we do this. One is we try to be exhaustive in the legal documents around the terms of service and privacy policies. But more importantly, we try to provide inline controls so that people that are in plain English that people can understand. Um, they can either go to settings or we can show them at the top of the app um, periodically so that people understand all the controls and settings they have um, and can, can configure their experience the way that they want. So do people, do people now give you permission to track specific devices in their contract? And if they do, is that a relatively new addition to what you do? Senator, I'm sorry, Are, I, don't, I, to, I don't have am that. Am I able to opt out? Am I able to say it's okay for you to um, track what I'm saying on Facebook, but I don't want you to track what I'm texting to somebody else off Facebook on an Android phone? Oh, okay. Yes, Senator. In, in general, Facebook is not collecting data from other apps that you use. There may be some specific things about the device that you're using that Facebook needs to understand in order to offer the service. But if you're using Google or you're using um, some texting app, um, unless you specifically opt in that you want to share the texting app information, um, Facebook wouldn't see that. Has it always been that way? Or is I, that a recent uh, addition to how you deal with those other uh, 
ways that I might communicate. Senator, my understanding is that that is how the mobile operating systems are architected. The, um, so do you, you don't have bundled permissions for how I can agree to what devices I may use that you may have contact with? Do you, have, do you bundle that permission, or am I able to want it individually, uh, say, of what I'm willing for you to, con to, to watch and what I don't want you to watch? And I think we may have to take that for the record based on everybody else's time. Thank you, Senator Blunt. Next up, Senator Durbin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um... <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> if you messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that might be what this is all about. Your right to privacy, the limits of your right to privacy, and how much you give away in modern America in the name of, quote, connecting people around the world question basically of um, what information Facebook's collecting, who they're sending it to, and whether they ever ask me in advance my permission to do that. Is that a fair thing for a user of Facebook to expect? Uh, yes, Senator. I think everyone should have control over how their information is used. And as we've talked about in, in some of the other questions, I think that that is laid out in, in some of the documents, but more importantly, you want to give people control in the product itself. So the most important way that this happens across our services is that every day people come As to we reach the 4 o'clock hour in the photos, East, you're watching NBC News live coverage of Facebook CEO something. Mark Zuckerberg's there's, Senate there's testimony. Right there, Some of you right will now be returning to regular programming. For the rest of you, our coverage continues. the Facebook pages who their friends are, but they may not know, as has happened, and you've conceded this point, in the past, that sometimes that information is going way beyond their friends, and sometimes people have made money off of sharing that information. Correct? Senator, you're referring, I think, to our developer platform, um, and it may be useful for me to give some background on how we set that up, if that's useful. I have three minutes left, so maybe you can do that for the record, because I have a couple of the questions I'd like to ask. You have recently announced uh, something that is called um, Messenger Kids. Facebook created an app allowing kids between the ages of 6 and 12 to send video and text messages through Facebook as an extension of their parents' account. You have cartoon-like stickers and other features designed to appeal to little kids, first graders, kindergartners. On January 30th, the Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood and lots of other child development organizations warned Facebook they pointed to a wealth of research demonstrating that excessive use of digital devices and social media is harmful to kids and argued that young children simply are not ready to handle social media accounts at age six. In addition, there are concerns about data that's being gathered about these kids. Now, there are certain limits in the law, we know. There's a Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. What guarantees can you give us that no data from messenger kids is or will be collected or shared with those that might violate that law? All right, Senator, so a number of things I think are, are important here. The background on messenger kids is we heard feedback from thousands of parents that they want to be able to stay in touch with their kids and call them, use apps like FaceTime, um, when they're working late or not around and want to communicate with their kids, but they want to have complete control over that. So I think we can all agree that if you're, when your kid is six or seven, even if they have access to a phone, you want to be able to control everyone who they can contact. And there wasn't an app out there that did that. So we built this service to do that. The app collects a minimum amount of information um, that is necessary to operate the service. So for example, the messages that people send um, is something that we collect in order to operate the service. But um, in general, that data is not going to be shared with third parties. Um, it is not connected to um, the broader Facebook experience. Excuse me. Uh, as a lawyer, I picked up on that word in general, the phrase in general. It seems to suggest that in some circumstances it will be shared with third parties. No. 
It will not. All right. Um, would you be open to the idea that someone having reached adult age, having grown up with messenger kids, should be allowed to delete the data that you've collected? Senator, yes. As a matter of fact, when you become 13, which is our legal limit, our limiter, where we don't allow people under the age of 13 to use Facebook, um, you don't automatically go from having a Messenger Kids a account to a Facebook account. You have to start over and get a Facebook account. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a good idea to consider making sure that all that information is deleted, and in general, people are going to be starting over when they get their, their Facebook or other accounts. I'll close because I just have a few seconds. Illinois has a Biometric Information Privacy Act, our state does, which is to regulate the commercial use of facial, voice, finger, and iris scans and the like. We're now in a fulsome debate on that, and I'm afraid Facebook has come down to the position trying to carve out exceptions to that. I hope you'll fill me in on how that is consistent with protecting privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here. I note in, up until 2014, um, the mantra or motto of Facebook was move fast and break things. Is that correct? I don't know when we changed it. But the mantra is currently move fast with stable infrastructure, which is a much less sexy mantra. Sounds much more boring. But my question is, during the time that it was Facebook's mantra or motto to move fast and break things, do you think some of the misjudgments, perhaps mistakes that you've admitted to here were as a result of that culture or that attitude, particularly as regards to uh, personal privacy of the information of your subscribers? Senator, I do think that we made mistakes because of that, but <clears throat> the broadest mistakes that we made here are not taking a broad enough view of our responsibility. And well, well, that I wasn't a matter, the, the move fast cultural value is more tactical around whether engineers can ship things and and, and different ways that we operate. But I think the big mistake that we've made looking back on this is viewing our responsibility as just building tools rather than viewing our whole responsibility as making sure that those tools are used for good. Well, I, and I appreciate that because previously or early in the past, we've been told that um, platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like, are neutral platforms, and the people who own and run those uh, for profit, and I'm not criticizing doing something for profit in this country, um, but they bore no responsibility for the content. You agree now that Facebook and other, other social media platforms are not neutral platforms, but bear some responsibility for the content. I agree that we're responsible for the content. And I think that there's one of the big societal questions that I think we're going to need to answer is the current framework that we have is based on this reactive model that assumed that there weren't AI tools that could proactively um, tell you know, whether something was terrorist content or something bad. So it naturally relied on um, requiring people to flag for a company and then the company needing to take reasonable action. In the future, we're going to have tools that are going to be able to identify more types of bad content. And I think that there's, there are moral and legal obligation questions um, that I think we'll have to wrestle with as a society about when we want to require companies to take action proactively on certain of those things I, and when I, that gets in the way of... I appreciate that. I have two minutes left All right. to ask you questions. So you, you interestingly, the terms of... Uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the terms of service is a legal document which discloses to your subscribers how their information is going to be used, how Facebook is going to operate. And, um, but you concede that you doubt um, everybody reads or understands uh, that legalese, those terms of service. So are, is that to suggest that the consent that people give um, subject to that terms of service is not informed consent? In other words, they may not read it, and even if they read it, they may not understand it? I just think we have a broader responsibility than what the law requires. So I, no, I think I'm we talking need to... I'm talking about, I appreciate that. What I'm asking about in terms of what your subscribers understand in terms of how their data is going to be used. But 
let me go to the terms of service under paragraph number two. You say you own all of the content and information you post on Facebook. That's what you've told us here today a number of times. So if I choose to terminate my Facebook account, can I bar Facebook or any third parties from using the data that I had previously supplied uh, for any purpose whatsoever? Yes, Senator. If you delete your account, we should get rid of all of your information. You should or we do. do you? We do. How about third parties that you have um, contracted with to use some of that underlying information, perhaps to target advertising uh, for themselves? You can't. Do you, do, you with, do you claw back that information as well, or does that remain in their custody? Well, Senator, this is actually a very important question. I'm glad you brought this up, because there's a, a very common misperception about Facebook that we sell data to advertisers. And we do not sell data to advertisers. Well, we don't you, sell data to advertisers. you clearly rent it. Um, what we allow is for advertisers to tell us who they want to reach, and then we do the placement. So if an advertiser comes to us and says, all right, I'm a ski shop and I want to sell skis to women, um, then we might have some sense because people shared skiing-related content or said they were interested in that. Um, they shared whether they're a woman. And then we can show the ads to the right people without the, that data ever changing hands and going to the advertiser. That's a very fundamental part of how our model works and something that is often misunderstood. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you brought that up. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Um, we had indicated earlier on that we would uh, take a couple of breaks, give our witness an opportunity. And I think we've been going now for just under two hours. So um, I think what we'll do is... We do a few more. Zuckerberger, are you... <laughs> you you, you want to keep going? I mean, maybe, maybe 15 minutes. Okay. Does that work? All right, we'll keep going. Senator Blumenthal is up next. And um, we will commence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here today. Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, you have told us today and you've told the world that Facebook was deceived by Alexander Kogan when he sold user information to Cambridge Analytica, correct? Yes. I want to show you uh, the terms of service that Alexander Kogan provided to Facebook. And note for you that in fact, Facebook was on notice that he could sell that user information. Have you seen these terms of service before? I have not. Who in Facebook was responsible for seeing those terms of service that put you on notice that that information could be sold? Senator, our app review team would be responsible for that. Has and anyone been fired on that app review, review team? Uh, Senator, not because of this. Uh, doesn't that term of service conflict with the FTC order that Facebook was under at that very time that this uh, term of service was, in fact, provided to Facebook? And you'll note that the, face, the FTC order specifically requires Facebook to protect privacy. Isn't there a conflict there? Senator, it certainly appears that we should have been aware that this app developer submitted a term that was in conflict with the rules of the platform. Well, what happened here was, in effect, willful blindness. It was heedless and reckless, which, in fact, amounted to a violation of the FTC consent decree. Would you agree? Uh, no, Senator. Uh, my understanding is that is, is not that this was a violation of the consent decree. But as I've said a number of times today, I think we need to take a broader view of our responsibility around privacy than just what is mandated um, in the current laws. Well, here is decree. my reservation, Mr. Zuckerberg, and I apologize for interrupting you, but my time is limited. We've seen the apology tours before. You have refused to acknowledge even an ethical obligation to have reported this violation of the FTC consent decree. And we have letters, we've had contacts with Facebook employees 
And I'm going to submit a letter for the record from Sandy Parakilis, with your permission, uh, that indicates not only a lack of resources, but lack of attention to privacy. And so my reservation about your testimony today is that I don't see how you can change your business model unless there are specific rules of the road. Your business model is to monetize user information, to maximize profit over privacy. And unless there are specific rules and requirements enforced by an outside agency, I have no assurance that these kinds of vague commitments are going to produce action. So I want to ask you a couple of very specific questions, and they are based on legislation that I've offered, the My Data Act, legislation that Senator Markey is introducing today, the Consent Act, which I'm joining. Don't you agree that companies ought to be required to provide users with clear, plain information about how their data will be used and specific ability to consent to the use of that information. Senator, I do generally agree with, with what you're saying. And I laid that out earlier when I talked about what... Would you agree to an opt-in as opposed to an opt-out? Um, Senator, I think that that certainly um, makes sense to discuss. And I think the details around this matter a lot. Would so you agree that users should be able to access all of their information? Senator, yes, of course. All the information that you collect as a result of purchases from data brokers, as well as tracking them. Senator, we have already a download your information tool that allows people to see and to take out all of the information that Facebook, that they've put into Facebook or that Facebook knows about them. So yes, I agree with that. We already have that. I have a number of other specific requests that you agree to support as part of legislation. I think legislation is necessary. The rules of the road have to be the result of congressional action. Uh, we have, uh, Facebook has participated recently in the fight against scourge, the scourge of sex trafficking and the bill that we've just passed, it will be signed into law tomorrow. SESTA, the Stop Exploiting Sex Trafficking Act was the result of our cooperation. I hope that we can cooperate on this kind of measure as well. Thanks. Senator, I look forward to having my team work with you on this. Thank you, Thank Sen you. Senator Blumenthal. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, welcome. Thank you for being here. Mr. Zuckerberg, does Facebook consider itself a neutral public forum? Senator, we consider ourselves to be a platform for all ideas. Let me ask the question again. Does Facebook consider itself to be a neutral public forum? And representatives of your company have given conflicting answers on this. Are, are you a First well, Amendment speaker expressing your views, or are you a neutral public forum allowing everyone to speak? Uh, Senator, here's how we think about this. I don't believe that... Uh, there is certain content that clearly we do not allow. Right? H hate speech, terrorist content, um, nudity, anything that makes people feel unsafe in, in the community. Um, from that perspective, that's why we generally try to refer to what we do okay. as a platform let, for let all ideas. Let me try just because the time is constrained. It's just a, a simple question. The predicate for, for Section 230 immunity under the CB, CDA is that you are a neutral public forum. Do you consider yourself a neutral public forum? Or are you engaged in political speech, which is your right under the First Amendment? Well, Senator... Our goal is certainly not to engage in political speech. I'm not that familiar with the specific legal language of the, the law that you, that you speak to, so I, I would need to follow up with you on that. I'm just trying to lay out how broadly I think about this. Well, Mr. Zuckerberg, I will say there are a great many Americans who I think are deeply concerned that, that Facebook and other tech companies are engaged in a pervasive pattern of bias and political censorship. Uh, there have been numerous instances with Facebook. In May of 2016, Gizmodo reported that Facebook had purposely and routinely suppressed conservative stories from trending news, 
including stories about CPAC, including stories about Mitt Romney, including stories about the Lois Lerner IRS scandal, including stories about Glenn Beck. In addition to that, Facebook has initially shut down the Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day page, has blocked a post of a Fox News reporter, has blocked over two dozen Catholic pages, and most recently blocked Trump supporters Diamond and Silk's page with 1.2 million Facebook followers after determining their content and brand were, quote, unsafe to the community. To a great many Americans, that appears to be a pervasive pattern of political bias. Do you agree with that assessment? Senator, let me say a few things about this. First, I understand where that concern is coming from because Facebook and the tech industry are located in Silicon Valley, which is an extremely left-leaning place. And uh, I, this is actually a concern that I have and that I try to root out in the company is making sure that we don't have um, any bias in the work that we do. And I think it is a fair concern that, um, that people would, so, would, so would me, at least me, wonder about. Let me ask this now, question. Are, are you aware of any ad or page that has been taken down from Planned Parenthood? Senator, I, I'm not, but let me just uh, How about moveon.org? Sorry? How about moveon.org? I'm not specifically aware of those. How about cases. any Democratic candidate for office? I, I'm not specifically aware. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. In your testimony, you say that you have 15 to 20,000 people working on security and content review. Do you know the political orientation of those 15 to 20,000 people engaged in content review? Uh, no, Senator. We do not generally ask people about their political orientation when they're joining the company. So as CEO, have you ever made hiring or firing decisions based on political positions or what candidates they supported? No. Why was Palmer Lucky fired? That is a specific personnel matter that seems like it would be inappropriate to You just made to a here. specific representation that you didn't make decisions based on political view. Well, is that I, can, I can commit that it was not because of a political view. Do you know of those 15 to 20,000 people engaged in content review, how many, if any, have ever supported financially a Republican candidate for office? Senator, I do not know that. Your testimony says, it is not enough that we just connect people. We have to make sure those connections are positive. It says we have to make sure people aren't using their voice to hurt people or spread misinformation. We have a responsibility not just to build tools, to make sure those tools are used for good. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you feel it's your responsibility to assess users whether they are good and positive connections or ones that those 15 to 20,000 people deem unacceptable or deplorable? Senator, you're asking about me personally? Facebook. Uh, Senator, I think that there are a number of things that we would all agree are clearly bad. Foreign interference in our elections, terrorism, uh, self-harm, I'm Those talking are about things. censorship. Oh, uh, well, I think that you would probably agree that we should remove terrorist propaganda from the service. So that, I, I agree, I think is, is clearly bad activity that we want to get down, and we're generally proud of, of how well we, we do with that. Yeah. Now, what I can say, and, and, I, and I do want to get this in before the end here, is that I am I'm very committed to making sure that Facebook is a platform for all ideas. That is a, a very important founding principle of, of what we do, um, we're proud of the discourse and the different ideas that people can share on the service. And that is something that, as long as I'm running the company, I'm going to be committed to making sure is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Do you want a break now? <laughs> or do you want to keep going? <laughs> sure. I mean, that was, that was pretty good. So, all right. <laughs> all right. We have uh, Senator uh, Whitehouse is up next. But if you want to take a, a, yeah. a five-minute break right now, uh, we have now been going a good two hours, so thank you. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll recess for five minutes and and uh, reconvene. We have been watching uh, the testimony of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, taking a grilling from senators, and there are plenty more to come here. This is a hearing expected to last several hours, and as was noted, we're almost a couple of hours into it. They are taking a short break. We want to bring in now uh, Jolene Kent. Our correspondent uh, who is uh, covering these hearings. Joe Ling, uh, what, what's the perception of, of how Zuckerberg is handling what became a little more aggressive in the last few lines of questioning? 
Yeah, at the beginning here, Zuckerberg really was not pelted with the aggressive questions that a lot of us were expecting. But he has been, uh, Senator Blumenthal, for example, really going after uh, the Facebook CEO for willful, willful ignorance uh, of the issues relating to Cambridge Analytica and some of the other uh, questions that he had for him. But there are a couple of major plot points here that I just want to hit on that we just learned about Facebook that we need to talk about. First, Facebook did not disclose the issue with Cambridge Analytica to the Federal Trade Commission. This is the first time that we have heard this. Second of all, uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg disclosing that he did work with, he is, or Facebook is working rather, with uh, the special counsel office, uh, Robert Mueller's office. And there was a bit of waffling of whether or not there was a subpoena served to the company. But he did confirm for the first time on the record that uh, Facebook is working with the special counsel's office. So we're starting to learn a little bit more around this line of questioning. But Zuckerberg, saying, apologizing for the behavior of the company, but certainly a lighter Zuckerberg here that we're seeing, a, a little bit different of an attitude that we've seen uh, in years past, Lester. All right, Joel and Kent, as they take a break, Savannah Guthrie with me with our coverage. Yeah, that's right, and Kara Swisher has been joining us. She's uh, the executive editor of Recode and a subject matter expert who spends all day long thinking about these issues. So I ask you, Kara, do you feel that any senator here has really laid a glove on Mark Zuckerberg or, uh, you know, grilled him to the extent that it, it would make a real difference? Or does this feel to you like stuff he was prepared for and is handling well? Well, if you think being slapped with wet noodles is hard, I guess it's hard, but it's not. This has been really easy for Mark, and he's done a nice job answering very easy questions. I mean, I think only Senator Blumenthal did, did note, and Senator Durbin also did note, the issues is that these are bigger issues, uh, calling it willful ignorance, which I would agree with, talking about, uh, Senator Durbin brought up the hotel analogy, would you be willing to give up the name of your hotel? I think that shook Mark a tiny bit, but otherwise, this has been a very easy morning for the Facebook CEO, and he's handled it just fine, because it's really easy. What about the issue of this consent decree, which uh, Richard Blumenthal mm -hmm. brought up? Yeah. Is, that, is that an area where Facebook does face some jeopardy, their previous commitments to the government about privacy. Yeah, I think so. I think this is an interesting area. Um, you know, I think that they had agreed to a certain amount of things, and the question is, can they prove that they, they violated these things, or can they just make the excuse, well, we didn't manage it well, we meant to do it, we have the rules in place. And so that's, that's going to be the hard part, is proving uh, that they meant to do it or they, they willfully did it. And that's the, I think it was interesting that Blumenthal used the term, Senator Blumenthal used the term willful. Um, and I, again, I would agree with that description rather strongly. All right, Kara, thank you. And let's turn to Casey Hunt, who's also covering this hearing with us. And as so often happens, Casey, when you watch a hearing on Capitol Hill, and we've got two committees here, and of course, both sides of the <laughs> aisle, there are so many issues that you can get into. You can talk about privacy. You can talk about Russian interference. We just heard Senator Ted Cruz talking about censorship, and each senator is bringing his or her own agenda to the questioning. 40-plus senators questioning Mark Zuckerberg today in a rare joint hearing. And you're absolutely right, each one bringing their own agenda, their own set of questions, and sometimes, uh, you know, frankly, not allowing Zuckerberg to finish an answer because they want to actually make a point. And uh, many of my sources have pointed out that there were instances throughout this hearing where many of these senators who, uh, you know, are in their 60s, 70s, even uh, older, don't necessarily understand the technology that they are asking about and that that was evident here uh, and that frankly you know gave Mark Zuckerberg uh, an opening to defend his company but I do think that what is important from the congressional side of this is what at the end of the day is Congress going to do or not do to regulate big tech to potentially protect uh, users privacy and Mark Zuckerberg has been up there saying yes we support being regulated and there is some truth in that Facebook has supported. Amy Klobuchar talked about the Honest Ads Act that would require disclosure for political ads on Facebook. They have supported that. But the reality is that behind the scenes, there's a mixed record on privacy laws, whether they're in state houses or here uh, in the U.S. Congress. And there's going to be some real tests for these technology companies. Are they actually going to step up and say, OK, we are willing to accept some rules that we can't necessarily make for ourselves? Senator Lindsey Graham hit on this as well. 
while pressing Mark Zuckerberg on whether they have a monopoly. That's another way, of course, the government uh, could regulate big tech. So uh, some very big questions uh, to grapple with here. Uh, and, you know, this Congress, Congress in general, is not known for moving quickly. And this technology has moved uh, much faster than they have. They are, in many ways, uh, behind the eight ball right along with Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, and I forget who it was that brought up the issue of regulation. Would you be willing to accept regulation? I think it was left with Zuckerberg essentially saying, We'll get back to you with some ideas. Well, they are. I mean, and, and there's always the, I call him as a, as a lawyer, a recovering lawyer, weasel words, right? We'll accept regulation where it is appropriate. Well, that's where all the action yes. is, whether or not. And I think what you raised with Kara Swisher is the other big piece of it. So there's two things Facebook's facing, potential regulation, and then perhaps more crucially to their bottom line. And financially is this, whether or not they're in violation of this agreement they made with the Federal Trade Commission stemming from uh, a, a legal action in 2011. Big fines. It could amount huge to fines. huge fines. I mean, Kara, let's go back to you because I know this is something you cover a lot. I mean, that's where you, now you're starting to talk about something hitting Facebook where it hurts. I mean, of course, we've seen the stock right. price tank, but that's got to be when when you see Richard Blumenthal, the former AG, put up a big chart with a term of service that seems to be mm -hmm. on its surface in clear violation of this agreement with the FTC. One imagines that was a difficult moment for Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, absolutely. I think the question is, are they going to face a lot of, that's where Facebook has saw, had most of its problems is with uh, state's attorney generals, which is interesting. Mostly tech companies have been given a pass by the federal government, not just just forever, since forever, pretty much. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if they, they follow up on that, if that happens. Um, these, are, these are big areas. Obviously, public perception is another. Are these people telling the truth? Um, uh, but the stock price has recovered a little bit today because Mark is doing well, largely because these questions are really light light, light questions for him. And so we'll see if it results in anything. I don't know what you think. I just, you know, I don't think they're very tough questions. I'm laughing. Kara Swisher not impressed with, with the members of Congress in not, terms of their in questioning. In not a lot of fireworks until in the last few yeah. minutes, and they're going to be back at it. Live coverage of the Facebook hearing is going to continue on NBCNews.com, but this brings our live coverage on the network to a close. The hearing is, one, of course, just one of the big stories we're covering today, along with possible new U.S. military action in Syria, the resignation of President Trump's Homeland Security Advisor, and the status of the Mueller investigation in the wake of yesterday's FBI raid in the offices of the president's personal lawyer. Savannah, you'll, of course, have much more on all this tomorrow. We see you on today. And I'll have complete details coming up on NBC Nightly News on this busy news day. For now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News, New York. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Here of Mark Zuckerberg's testimony before the Senate Judiciary and Senate Commerce Committees. Uh, that hearing on a break right now after about two hours of testimony by the CEO of Facebook. You see... Heart Room 216 there on Capitol Hill. There is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, the Republican from Iowa. There have been some spirited questions in the last few minutes. There is Senator Ted Cruz, Republican of Texas. Uh, the exchange before the break there was between Mark Zuckerberg and the junior senator from Texas, uh, Ted Cruz. They're concerned about uh, what Facebook is exactly, asking the CEO some existential questions about what Facebook is. Is it a platform, a neutral platform? Uh, he didn't get the answer that he wanted from Mark Zuckerberg in reply to that question. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg taking a break again after two hours. Uh, a variety of questions have, have uh, focused on uh, the 2016 elections, as was expected going into this hearing today. Uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, questioning in great detail about what Facebook knew and when about Russian interference uh, in the 2016 election. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg not holding any punches on how he characterized uh, Russia's role here, Russia's role in electoral interference, saying that uh, there is an arms race uh, when it comes to how countries meddle in each other's uh, elections. Uh, each senator has had five minutes to question Mark Zuckerberg. We've gone through, I think, about 15 or 20 senators thus far. Uh, he'll return in just a few moments to field more questions uh, from, again, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate uh, Commerce Committee. There you see the, the chairman and the ranking member is returning to their seats. Uh, there were some playful moments before the break took place. Mark Zuckerberg indicating he'd be content just to stay there, uh, continue to, to field questions from the senators. He joked uh, after the questioning from Senator Ted Cruz uh, of Texas that uh, that was pretty good uh, in his estimation, the back and forth that he had with uh, Senator Ted Cruz. 
interesting about that exchange between Mark Zuckerberg and Senator Ted Cruz was uh, Mark Zuckerberg's inability to talk about specific cases. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz asking Mark Zuckerberg if posts from Planned Parenthood, from MoveOn.org, were removed in the way that other conservative groups or Catholic groups uh, were removed. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg saying he's unable to do that. And we saw a technique throughout this hearing uh, play out time and time again. He is uh, flanked by members of Facebook's public policy team a sizable team based in Washington, D.C., including the vice president of public policy, Mark Zuckerberg, referring a lot of questions to his team, uh, offering senators the assurance that he will uh, have his team get them the information that they need. I will say there has been a, a lack, of, uh, lack of anger, not a whole lot of spirited uh, back and forth here between Mark Zuckerberg uh, and senators, uh, not a whole lot of anger uh, on display. David Gura here in New York at NBC headquarters uh, with Savannah Sellers as we've watched. Uh, this hearing play out highly anticipated hearing. What stood out to you here uh, in these first two hours? So we were actually just talking about it. We could tell everybody the moment with Durbin on the hotels. That Senator was Dick crazy. Durbin, yes, of Illinois, absolutely. Starts off by saying, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be content telling us essentially where you stayed last night, what hotel uh, you stayed at? And the silence was deafening after yes, that. Yes, exactly. And also, who, what about who else you've texted? Who's in your phone that you've been texting this week? Can we know who you're messaging? And he just said no. You can. I wouldn't want you to know that. And that's kind of the whole point of what we're getting at here. Senator Chuck Grassley there uh, bringing the hearing back into order. He's been sharing chairman duties with John Thune, the senator uh, from South Dakota. Of course, he the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, the, the hearing continuing here. Yeah, there were, there were a number of moments we, we were talking before the hearing began about uh, what kind of facility a lot of these senators would have with the platform itself, how much they would know about social media. Um, another kind of lighter moment was between Senator Lindsey Graham, the Republican from South Carolina, uh, and Mark Zuckerberg. We're talking about competition. I thought that was particularly interesting as well, drawing the analogy to car companies. Uh, you can buy a Ford. If you don't like a Ford, you can buy a Chevy. Trying to pin down Mark Zuckerberg, trying to get the sense of who Facebook's competitors are, who they see. Let's take a little listen here as Mark Zuckerberg is responding uh, to uh, Chuck Grassley, the senator from Iowa. Cambridge Analytica actually did start as an advertiser later in 2015, so we could have, in theory, banned them then. We made a mistake by not doing so, but I just wanted to make sure that I updated that and because I, I, I misspoke or got that wrong earlier. White House. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome back, Mr. Zuckerberg. On the subject of um, bans, I just wanted to explore a little bit what these bans mean. Uh, obviously, Facebook has been done considerable reputational damage by its association with Alexander Kogan and with Cambridge Analytica, which is one of the reasons you're having this enjoyable afternoon with us. Um, your testimony says that Alexander Kogan's app has been banned. Has he also been banned? Yes, my understanding is he has. Um, so if he were to open up another account under a name and you were able to find it out, that would be taken, that would be closed down. Senator, I believe we, we are preventing him from building any more apps. Does he have a Facebook account still? Uh, Senator, I believe the answer to that is no, uh, but I can follow up with you afterwards. Okay. And with respect to Cambridge Analytica, your testimony is that first you required them to formally certify that they had deleted all improperly acquired data. Where did that formal certification take place? That sounds kind of like a quasi-official thing to formally certify. What did that entail? Senator, first, uh, they sent us an email notice from their chief data officer uh, telling us that they didn't have any of the data anymore, that they deleted it and weren't using it. And then later, we followed up with, a, I believe, a full legal uh, contract where they certified that they had deleted the data. In a legal contract? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And then um, you ultimately said that you have banned Cambridge Analytica. Um, who exactly is banned? What if they opened up Cranston, Rhode Island Analytica? Um, different corporate form, same enterprise. Would that enterprise also be banned? Senator, that is certainly the intent. Uh, Cambridge Analytica actually has a parent company, and we banned the parent company. And recently, we also banned a firm called AIQ, which I think is also associated with them. Uh, and if we find other firms that are associated with them, we will block them from the platform as well. Our individual principles PALS principles of the firm also banned? 
Senator, my understanding is we're blocking them from doing business on the platform, but I do not believe that we're blocking people's personal accounts. Okay. Um, can any customer amend your terms of service, or is the terms of service a take it or leave it proposition for the average customer? Senator, I think the terms of service are what they are, but the service is really defined by people because you get to choose what information you share, and the whole service is about which friends you connect to, which people yeah, you choose to connect to. My question would relate to, Senator Graham held up that big fat document. It's easy to put a lot of things buried in a document that then later turn out to be of consequence and all I wanted to establish with you is that that document that Senator Graham held up, that is not a negotiable thing with individual uh, customers. That is a take it or leave it proposition for your customers to sign up to or not use the service. Senator, that's right on the terms of service, yeah. although we offer a lot of controls so people can configure the experience how they want. So um, last question on a different subject having to do with the authorization process that you are undertaking for entities that are putting up political content or so-called issue ad content. Um, you've said that they all have to go through an authorization process before they do it. You said here, we will be verifying the identity. How do you look behind a shell corporation and find who's really behind it through your authorization process? Well, step back. Do you need to look behind shell corporations in order to find out who is really behind the content that's being posted. And if you may need to look behind a shell corporation, how will you go about doing that? How will you get back to the true, what lawyers would call beneficial owner of the site that is putting out the uh, political material? Senator, are you referring to the verification of political and issue ads? Yes. And before that, political ads, yes. Yes. So what we're going to do is require a valid government identity, and we're going to verify uh, the location. So we're going to do that, so that way someone sitting in Russia, for example, um, couldn't say that they're in America, and therefore able to run an election ad. But if they were running through a corporation domiciled in Delaware, you wouldn't know that they were actually a Russian owner. Senator, that's, that's correct. Okay, thank you. My time has expired, and I appreciate the courtesy of the chair for the extra seconds. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, I wanted to follow up on a statement that you made shortly before the break just a few minutes ago. Uh, you said that there are some categories of speech, some types of content that Facebook would never want to have any part of, and it takes active steps uh, to avoid disseminating, including hate speech, nudity, uh, uh, racist speech, uh, I, I assume you also meant uh, terrorist acts, uh, threats of physical violence, things like that. Uh, beyond that, would you agree that Facebook ought not be putting its thumb on the scale with regard to the content of speech, assuming it fits out of one of those categories that, that's prohibited? Senator, yes. There are generally two categories of content that, that we're very worried about. One are things that could cause real-world harm. So terrorism certainly fits into that. Um, Self-harm fits into that. I would consider election interference to fit into that. And those are the types of things that we, I, I don't really consider there to be much discussion around whether those are good or bad sure. topics. Yeah, no, and, and I'm not disputing that. Uh, uh, what I'm asking is, once you get beyond those categories of things that are prohibited and should be, uh, is it Facebook's position that it should not be putting its thumb on the scale? It should not be favoring or disfavoring speech based on its content, based on the viewpoint of that speech? Senator, in general, that's our position. What we, one of the things that is really important, though, is that in order to create a service where everyone has a voice, uh, we also need to make sure that people aren't bullied or, um, or basically intimidated or the environment feels unsafe for them. Okay. So uh, when, when you say in general, that's, that's the, the exception that you're referring to. Uh, uh, the exception being that if someone feels bullied, even if it's not a terrorist act, uh, nudity, terrorist threats, racist speech, or something like that, uh, you, you might step in there. Beyond that, would you step in and put your thumb on the scale as far as the viewpoint uh, of the content uh, being posted? 
Senator, no. I mean, in general, our, our goal is to allow people to have as much expression as possible. Okay. So subject to the exceptions we've discussed, uh, you, you would stay out of that. Let me ask you this. Isn't there a significant free market incentive that a social media company, including yours, has in order to safeguard the data of your users? Don't you have free market incentives? And yep. in that respect, Senator, yes. does, don't your interests align with, with those of us here who want to see data safeguarded? Absolutely. Do you have the technological means uh, uh, available at your disposal to make sure that that doesn't happen and to, to protect, uh, say, an app developer um, from transferring Facebook data to a third party? Senator, a lot of that we do. And some of that happens outside of our systems and will require new measures. So for example, what we saw here was people chose to share information with an app developer. That worked according to how the system was designed. That information was then transferred out of our system to servers that this developer, Alexander Kogan, had. And then that person chose to then go sell the data uh, to Cambridge Analytica. That is going to require much more active intervention and auditing from us to prevent going forward because once it's out of our system, it is a lot harder for us to uh, have a full understanding of what's happening. From what you've said today and from previous statements made by you and, and other officials at your company, data is <clears throat> at the center of your business model. It's, it's how you make money. Your ability uh, to run your business effectively, given that you don't charge your users, uh, is based on monetizing data. And so the, the, the real issue, it seems to me, uh, really comes down to what you tell the public, what you tell users of Facebook about what you're going to do with the data, about how you're going to use it. Uh, can, you, can you give me a couple of examples, maybe two examples, of ways uh, in which data uh, is collected by Facebook uh, in a way that people are not aware of? Um, two examples of types of data that Facebook collects that might be surprising to, to Facebook users? Well, Senator, I would hope that what we do with data is not surprising to people. And has it been at times? Um, well, Senator, I think in, in this case, people certainly didn't expect this developer to sell the data to Cambridge Analytica. Um, in general, there, there are two types of data that, uh, that Facebook has. The vast majority, and then the first category, is content that people chose to share on the service themselves. So that's all the photos that you share, the posts that you make, what you think of as the Facebook service. Right? That's, everyone has control every single time that they go to share that. They could delete that data anytime they want. Full control, the majority of the data. The second category is around specific data that we collect in order to make the advertising experiences better and more relevant and work for businesses. And those often revolve around measuring, okay, if, you, if we showed you an ad and then you click through and you go somewhere else, we can measure uh, that you actually, uh, that, that, the, that the ad worked. That helps make the experience more relevant and better for, uh, for people who are getting more relevant ads and better for the businesses because they perform better. You also have control completely of that second type of data. You can turn off the ability for Facebook to collect that. Your ads will get worse, so a lot of people don't want to do that. Uh, but you have complete control over what you do there as well. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on the questions around the terms of service. Your terms of service are about 3,200 words with 30 links. One of the links is to your data policy, which is about 2,700 words with 22 links. And I think the point has been well made that people really have no earthly idea what they're signing up for. And I understand that at the present time, that's legally binding, but I'm wondering if you can explain to the billions of users in plain language, what are they signing up for? Senator, that's a, a good and important question here. In general, you, know, you, you sign up for the Facebook, you get the ability to share the information that you want with, with people. That's what the service is, right, is that uh, you can connect with the people that you want and you can share whatever content uh, matters to you, whether that's photos or links or posts, um, and you get control over who you share it with, and you can take it down if you want, and you don't need to put anything up in the first place if you don't want. Um, what about the part that people are worried about, not the fun part? 
Well, what's that? The, uh, the part that people are worried about is that the data is going to be improperly used. So people are trying to figure out, uh, are your DMs informing the ads? Uh, are your browsing habits uh, being collected? Everybody kind of understands that when you click like on something, or if you say you like a certain movie or have a, a particular political proclivity, that I think that's fair game. Everybody understands that. What we don't understand exactly, because both as a matter of practice and as a matter of not being able to decipher those terms of service and the privacy policy, is what exactly are you doing with the data? And do you draw a distinction between uh, data collected in the process of utilizing the platform and that which we clearly volunteer to the public to present ourselves to other Facebook users? Senator, I'm not sure I, I fully understand this. In, in general, you're, you're, you, people come to Facebook to share content with other people. We use that in order to also uh, inform how we rank services like newsfeed and ads to provide more relevant experiences. Let, let, me, tr let me try a couple of specific examples. If I'm, email, if I'm emailing, emailing within WhatsApp, does that ever inform your advertisers? No, we don't see any of the content in WhatsApp. It's fully encrypted. Right, but the, is there some algorithm that spits out some information to your ad platform? And then, let's say I'm emailing about Black Panther uh, within WhatsApp. Do I get a WhatsApp? Do I get a Black Panther uh, banner ad? Senator, we don't. Facebook systems do not see the content of messages being transferred over WhatsApp. Yeah, I know, but that's that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking about whether these systems talk to each other without a human being touching it. Senator, I think the answer to your specific question is if you message someone about Black Panther and WhatsApp, it would not inform uh, any ads. Okay. Uh, I want to follow up on Senator Nelson's original question, which is the question of ownership of the data. And I understand as a sort of matter of principle, you're saying, you know, we want our customers to have more rather than less control over the data. But I can't imagine that it's true as a legal matter that I actually own my Facebook data because you're the one monetizing it. Um, do you want to modify that to sort of express that as a statement of principle, a sort of aspirational uh, goal? But it doesn't seem to me that uh, we own our own data, otherwise we'd be getting a cut. Well, Senator, you own it in the sense that you choose to put it there, you could take it down any time, and you completely control the terms under which it's used. When you put it on Facebook, you are granting us a license to be able to show it to other people. I mean, that's necessary in order for the service to operate. Right, but the, so the, the, so your definition of ownership is I sign up, um, I voluntarily, and I may delete my account if I wish, but that's basically it. Uh, well, Senator, I, I think that the control is much more granular than that. You can choose uh, each photo that you want to put up or each message, um, and you can delete those, and you don't need to delete your whole account. You have specific control. You can share different posts with different in the, people. In the time I have left, I want to, I want to propose something to you and take it for the record. Uh, I read an interesting article this week by Professor Jack Balkin at Yale uh, that proposes a concept of an information fiduciary. People think of fiduciaries as responsible primarily in the uh, economic sense, but this is really about a trust relationship, like doctors and lawyers, tech companies, uh, should hold in trust our personal data. Are you open to the idea of a information fiduciary enshrined in statute? Senator, I think it's certainly an interesting idea, and Jack is very thoughtful in this space, so I, I do think it deserves consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Ralph Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, the full scope of a Facebook user's activity can print a um, very personal picture, I think. And additionally, you have those two billion uh, users that are out there every month, and so we all know that's larger than the population of most countries. So how many data categories do you store, does Facebook store, on the categories that you collect? Senator... Can you clarify what you mean by data well, there's, categories? Well, there's some past reports that have been out there that indicate that, it, that Facebook collects about 96 data categories for those 2 billion active users. That's 192 billion data points that are being generated, I think, at any time 
uh, from consumers globally. So how many do you, does Facebook store out of that? Do you store any? Senator, I'm not actually sure what that is referring to. On, on the points that you collect uh, information, if we call those categories, how many do you store of information that you are collecting? Senator, the, the way I think about this is there are two broad categories. I, I, this probably doesn't line up with whatever the, the specific report that you were seeing is, and I can make sure that we follow up with you afterwards to get you the information you need on that. The two broad categories that I think about are content that a person has chosen to share and that they have complete control over. They get to control when they put it into the service, when they take it down, um, who sees it. And then the other category are uh, data that are connected to uh, making the ads relevant. You have complete control over both. You can turn off the data related to ads. You, you can choose not to share any content or control exactly who sees it or take down the content in the former category. And do you, does Facebook store any of that? Yes. How much do you store of that? All of it? All of it? Everything we click on? Is that in storage somewhere? Senator, we store data about what people share on the service and information that's required to do ranking better, to show you what you care about in news feed. Do you, do you store uh, text history, user content, um, activity, device location? Senator, some of that content, with people's permission, we do store. Do you um, disclose any of that? Yes, it, it, Senator, in order to, for people to share that information with Facebook, I, I believe that almost everything that you just said would be opt-in. Right. And the privacy settings, it's my understanding that they limit the sharing of that data with other Facebook users, is that correct? Senator, yes. Okay. Every person gets to control who gets to see their content. And does that also limit the ability for Facebook to collect and use it? Senator, yes, there are other, uh, there are controls that uh, determine what Facebook can do as well. So for example, people have a control about face recognition. If people don't want us to uh, be able to help identify when they're in photos that their friends upload, um, and they can turn that off. Right. And then and we won't store that kind of template for them. And, and there was uh, some action taken by the FTC in 2011. And you wrote a Facebook post at the time um, it, on a public page on the internet that it used to seem scary to people. But as long as they could make their page private, they felt safe sharing with their friends online. Control was key. And you just mentioned control. Uh, Senator Hatch um, um, asked you a question and you responded there about complete control. So you and your company have used that term repeatedly. And I believe you use it to reassure users, is that correct? That you do have control and complete control over this information? Well, Senator, this is how the service works. Is, I mean, the core thing that Facebook is, and all of our services, WhatsApp, right. Instagram, Messenger. So is this, a, is this then a question of uh, Facebook is about feeling safe or are users actually safe? Is Facebook, is Facebook being safe? Senator, I think Facebook is safe. I use it and my family use it and all the people I love and care about use it all the time. These controls are not just to make people feel safe, it's actually what people want in the product. The reality is, is that when you, I mean, just think about how you use this yourself. You don't wanna share, like you take a photo, you're not gonna always send that to the same people. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to text it to one person, sometimes you might send it to a group, I bet you have a page. You'll probably want to put stuff, some stuff out there publicly so you can communicate with your constituents. There are all these different groups of people that someone might want to connect with, and those controls are very important in practice for the operation of the service, not just to build trust, although I think that they, providing people with control also does that, but actually in order to make it so that people can fulfill their goals with the service. 
Senator Coons. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for joining us today. I think the whole reason we're having this hearing is because of a tension between two basic principles you've laid out. Uh, first, you've said about the data that users post on Facebook, you control and own the data that you put on Facebook. You've said some very positive, optimistic things about privacy and data ownership. But it's also the reality that Facebook is a for-profit entity that generated $40 billion in ad revenue last year by targeting ads. In fact, Facebook claims that advertising makes it easy to find the right people, capture their attention, and get results. And you recognize that an ad-supported service is, as you said earlier today, best aligned with your mission and values. But the reality is there's a lot of examples where ad targeting has led to results that I think we would all uh, disagree with or dislike or would concern us. Uh, you've already admitted that Facebook's own ad tools allowed Russians to target users, voters, based on racist or anti-Muslim or anti-immigrant views, and that that may have played a significant role in an election here in the United States. Just today, Time Magazine posted a story saying that wildlife traffickers are continuing to use Facebook tools to advertise illegal sales of protected animal parts. And I am left questioning whether your ad targeting tools would allow other concerning practices like diet pill manufacturers targeting teenagers who are struggling with their weight or allowing a liquor distributor to target alcoholics or a gambling organization to target those with gambling problems. Um, I'll give you one concrete example. I'm sure you're familiar with ProPublica back in 2016. Um, highlighted that Facebook lets advertisers exclude users by race in real estate advertising. Um, there was a way that you could say that this particular ad, I only want to be seen by white folks, not by people of color. And that clearly violates fair housing laws and our basic sense of fairness in the United States. And you uh, promptly announced that uh, that was a bad idea, you were going to change the tools, and that you would build a new system to spot and reject discriminatory ads that violate our commitment to fair housing. And yet a year later, a follow-up story by ProPublica said that those changes hadn't fully been made, and it was still possible to target uh, housing advertisement in a way that was racially discriminatory. And my concern is that this practice of making bold and, and engaging promises about changes in practices and then the reality of how Facebook has operated in the real world uh, are in persistent tension. Several different senators have asked earlier today about the 2011 FTC consent decree that required Facebook to better protect users' privacy. Uh, and there are a whole series of examples uh, where there have been things brought to your attention, where Facebook has apologized and has said we're going to change our practices and our policies, uh, and yet um, there doesn't seem to have been as much follow-up as would be called for. At the end of the day, policies aren't worth the paper they're written on if Facebook doesn't enforce them. And I'll close with a question that's really rooted in an experience I had today as an avid Facebook user. Uh, I woke up this morning uh, and was notified by a whole group of friends across the country uh, asking if I had a new family or if there was a fake Facebook post of Chris Coons. I went to the one they suggested. It had a different middle initial than mine. Uh, and there's my picture with Senator Dan Sullivan's family. Same schools I went to, but a whole lot of Russian friends. Dan Sullivan's got a very attractive family, by the way. You and can keep that for the record there, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> The friends who brought this to my attention included uh, people I went to law school with in Hawaii and our own attorney general in the state of Delaware. And fortunately, I've got you know great folks who work in my office. I brought it to their attention. They pushed Facebook, and it was taken down by midday. Uh, but I'm left worried about what happens to Delawareans who don't have these resources. It's still possible to find Russian trolls operating in the platform. Hate groups thrive in some areas of Facebook, even though your policies prohibit hate speech and you've taken strong steps against extremism and terrorists. But is a Delawarean who's not in the Senate going to get the same sort of quick response? I've already gotten input from other friends who say they've had trouble getting a positive response when they've brought to Facebook's attention a page that's um, frankly clearly violent of your basic principles. My core question is, isn't it Facebook's job to better protect its users? And why do you shift the burden to users to flag inappropriate content and make sure it's taken down? Senator, there are a number of important points in there. And I think it's clear that this is an area, content policy enforcement, that we need to do a lot better on over time. Mm -hmm. The history of how we got here is we started off um, in my dorm room with not a lot of resources and not having the AI technology to be able to proactively identify a lot of this stuff. 
so just because of the sheer volume of content, um, the main way that this works today is that people report things to us and then we have our team review that. And as I said before, by the end of this year, we're gonna have more than 20,000 people at the company working on security and content review because this is important. Over time, we're gonna shift increasingly to a method where more of this content is flagged upfront by AI tools that we develop. We've prioritized the most important types of content that we can build AI tools for today, like terror-related content, where I mentioned earlier that um, our systems that we deploy, I think we're taking down 99% of the ISIS and Al-Qaeda-related content that we take down before a person even flags them to us. If we fast forward five or 10 years, I think we're gonna have more AI technology that can do that in more areas. Um, and I think we need to get there as soon as possible, which is why we're investing in that. I Senator couldn't agree Fred. more. I just think we can't wait five years no. to Senator. get housing discrimination and personally offensive material out of Facebook. Thank I, you, I agree. Chairman. Senator Sass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, thanks for being here. Uh, at current pace, uh, you're due to be done with first round of questioning by about 1 a.m., so congratulations. Um, I, I like Chris Coons a lot, uh, with his own family or with Dan Sullivan's family. Both are great photos. Uh, but I want to ask a similar set of questions from the other side, maybe. Uh, I think the, the line, the conceptual line between mere tech company, mere tools, and an actual content company, I think it's really hard. I think you guys have a hard challenge. I think regulation over time will have a hard challenge. Um, and you're a private company, so you can make policies uh, that may be uh, less than First Amendment full spirit embracing, in my view, but I worry about that. I worry about a world where when you go from violent groups to hate speech in a hurry, in one of your responses to one of the opening questions, um, you may decide, or Facebook may decide, it needs to police a whole bunch of speech um, that I think America might be better off not having policed by one company that has a really big and powerful platform. Can you define hate speech? Senator, I think that this is a really hard question, and I think it's one of the reasons why we struggle with it. There are certain definitions that that we that we have around, um, you know, calling for for violence or. Um, Let's just agree on that. If somebody's calling yeah. for violence, we, that shouldn't be there. I'm worried about the psychological categories around speech. You, you used language of safety and protection earlier. We see this happening on college campuses all across the country. It's dangerous. 40% of Americans under age 35 tell pollsters they think the First Amendment is dangerous because you might use your freedom to say something that hurts somebody else's feelings. Guess what? There are some really passionately held views about the abortion issue on this panel today. Can you imagine a world uh, where you might decide that pro-lifers are prohibited from speaking about their abortion views on your content, on your platform? I certainly would not want that to be the case. But it, it might really be unsettling to people who've had an abortion to have an open debate about that, wouldn't it? It might be, but I don't think that that would, uh, would fit any of the definitions of, of, of what we have. But I do generally agree with the point that you're making, which is, as, we sh as we're able to technologically shift towards especially having AI proactively look at content, I think that that's gonna create massive questions for society about what obligations we wanna require companies to, to fulfill. And, and I do think that that's a question that uh, we need to struggle with as a country because I know other countries are and they're putting laws in place. And I, I think that America needs to uh, figure out and create the set of principles that we want American companies to operate under. Thanks. I, I wouldn't want you to leave here today and think there's sort of a unified view in the Congress that you should be moving toward policing more and more and more speech. I think violence has no place on your platform. Uh, sex traffickers and human traffickers have no place on your platform. But vigorous debates, adults need to engage in vigorous debates. I, I have only a little less than two minutes left, so I want to shift gears a little bit. But that was about adults. Um, you're a dad. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about social media addiction. You started uh, your comments today by talking about how Facebook is and was founded as an optimistic company. You and I have had conversations separate from here. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think as you've aged, you might be a little bit less idealistic and optimistic uh, than you were when you, when you started Facebook. As a dad, uh, do you worry about social media addiction as a problem for America's teens? 
Well, my hope is, is that we can be idealistic but have a broad view of our responsibility. Uh, to your, your point about teens, this is certainly something that I think any parent thinks about, is how much do you want your kids using technology? It, it, at Facebook specifically, uh, I view our responsibility as not just building services that people like, but building services that are good for people and good for society as well. So we study a lot of effects of well-being of our, of our tools and broader technology. And you know, like any tool, um, there are good and, and bad uses of it. What we find in general is that if you're using social media uh, in order to build relationships, right? so you're, you're sharing content with friends, you're interacting, then that is associated with all of the long-term measures of well-being that you would intuitively think of. Long-term health, long-term happiness, long-term feeling connected, feeling less lonely. But if you're using the internet and social media um, primarily to just passively consume content and you're not engaging with other people, then it doesn't have those positive effects and it could be negative. We're, we're almost at time, so I want to I ask you one more. Uh, do social media companies hire consulting firms to help them figure out how to get more dopamine feedback loops so that people don't want to leave the platform? No, Senator. That's not how we talk about this or, or, or how we uh, set up our product teams. We want our products to be valuable to people, and if they're valuable, then people choose to use them. Are you aware of other social media companies that do hire such consultants? Not sitting here today. Thanks. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to Senator Blumenthal's pointed questions, you refused to answer whether Facebook should be required by law to obtain clear permission from users before selling or sharing their personal information. So I'm going to ask it one more time. Yes or no, should Facebook get clear permission from users before selling or sharing sensitive information about your health, your finances, your relationships? Should you have to get their permission? That's essentially the consent decree with the Federal Trade Commission that you signed in 2011. Should you have to get permission? Should the consumer have to opt in? Senator, we do require permission to use the, the system and to, to put information in there and for, for all the uses of it. I, I want to be clear, we don't sell information. So regardless of whether we could get permission to do that, that's just not a thing that we're going to go do. So would you support legislation I have a bill, Senator Blumenthal referred to it, um, the Consent Act, uh, that would just put on the books a law that said that Facebook and any other company that gathers information uh, about Americans has to get their permission, their affirmative permission, before it can be reused for other purposes. Would you support that legislation to make it a national standard for not just Facebook, but for all the other companies out there, some of them bad actors? Would you support that legislation? Senator, I, I, in general, I think that that principle is exactly right, and I think we should have a, a discussion around how to best no, but Would you that. support legislation to back that general principle, that opt-in, that getting permission is the standard? Would you support legislation to make that the American standard? Europeans have passed that as a law. Facebook's going to live uh, with that law beginning on May 25th. Would you support that as the law in the United States. Senator, as a principle, yes, I would. I think the details matter a lot. Right, and but that assuming that we work out the details, you do support opt-in as the standard, getting permission affirmatively as the standard for the United States. Is that correct? Senator, I think that that's the right principle. And 100 billion times a day in our services, when people go to share content, they choose who they want to share so it you, affirmatively. You, you could support a law that enshrines that as the promise that we make to the American people that permission has to be uh, obtained before their information is used. Is that correct? Senator, yes. I, okay. I've said that in principle, I think that that makes sense okay. and the details matter. And I look forward to having our team work with you on, on fleshing that out. Right. So um, the next subject, because I want to, uh, again, I want to make sure that we kind of drill down here. Uh, you, you earlier made reference to the Child Online Privacy Protection Act of 1999, which I am the author of. So that is the Constitution for Child Privacy Protection Online in the country, and I'm very proud of that. 
But there are no protections additionally for a 13, a 14, or a 15-year-old. They get the same protections that a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old get. So I have a separate piece of legislation uh, to ensure that kids who are under 16 absolutely have a privacy bill of rights and that um, permission has to be received from their parents or their children before any of their information is reused for any other purpose other than that which was originally intended. Would you support a child online privacy bill of rights for kids under 16 to guarantee that that information uh, is not reused for any other purpose without explicit permission from the parents or the kids? Senator, I think the, as a general principle, I think protecting, pe protecting minors and protecting their privacy is extremely important. And we do a number of things on Facebook to do that already, which I'm happy to get I, And I appreciate it. I'm helpful. talking about a law. I, I'm talking about a law. Would you support a law to ensure that kids under 16 have this pri I, Piracy Bill of Rights? I had this conversation with you in your office seven years ago about this specific subject in Palo Alto. Um, and, uh, and I think that's really what the American people want to know right now. What is the protections? Uh, this, the, what are the protections that are going to be put on the books for their families, but especially for their children? Would you support a privacy bill of rights for kids where opt-in is the standard? Yes or no? Senator, I think that that's an important principle. And I appreciate I think, that. And I think we should. Do we need a law to protect those children? That's my question to you. Do you believe we need a law to do so? Yes or no? Senator, I'm not sure if we need a law, but I think that this is certainly a thing that, 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 that deserves a lot of discussion. I, and I, 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 again, I couldn't disagree with you more. Other, we're leaving these children to the most rapacious commercial predators in the country who will exploit these children unless we absolutely have a law on the books. Please, and and Senator, I think it is absolutely please give a short. Please give a short answer. Senator, I look forward to having my team follow up to flesh out the details of it. I don't think this is a Senator difficult Senator Flake. Senator Flake. issue to get a, a correct answer. To. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thanks for enduring so far. And uh, I'm sorry if I plow old ground. I had to be away for a bit. Uh, I, myself and uh, Senator Kuhn, Senator Peters, and a few others were in the country of Zimbabwe just a few days ago. Uh, we met with opposition figures uh, who had talked about, you know, their goal is to be able to have access to state-run media in many African countries, many countries around the world, third world countries, small countries, the only traditional media is state-run. And we asked them how they get their message out, and it's through social media. Uh, Facebook provides a very valuable service. Well, back uh, to our streaming countries. coverage here of For the uh, here. Mark Zuckerberg is participating in before the Senate Judiciary and Commerce Committees. I'm David Gurr with Savannah Sellers, and we just heard from the uh, junior senator from Arizona, outgoing junior senator Jeff Flake. Before him, Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, the Democratic senator, talking about an opt-in uh, standard. This hearing continues now into its third uh, hour on Capitol Hill. And what struck me, Savannah, as I've watched all this unfold, is how mm -hmm. there is the issue. What catalyzed this hearing? What made it take place? That is uh, the theft of the disappearance of this data. But there are some larger thornier questions that Mark Zuckerberg is wrestling with, members of the committee are wrestling with, indeed all of us seem to be wrestling with here uh, about ownership of data uh, and what we know about where that data is being used. Right. Uh, on that point, I heard, a I heard Zuckerberg say a lot, you have control, the user has control, they can choose what they like, they can choose what they share. And I think the issue for a lot of us, or maybe me, I know you have there revealed go. that you are not <laughs> a Facebook yeah, user, but yeah. for me, I don't know that I feel that that's true anymore. And you know, Senator Lindsey Graham holds up the terms of service and you see how fat it is and he goes, I'm a lawyer, I have no idea idea what this means. So how are the average user supposed to necessarily know what they're signing up for and then therefore what they have control over? Yeah, That's Senator really Graham, using that prop, looking at those 2,700 <laughs> words, uh, was highlighting the fact there are 19, 20 leaks, uh, links rather, yeah, 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 uh, in yeah, that document. Links out here, it's crazy. In particular, and I think you just see sort of the, the, the existential debate that Mark Zuckerberg is having with uh, the issue of regulation in that back and forth that he just had with uh, Senator uh, Ed Markey. Anna Schechter joins us now. She's on our investigative team. I want to get your perspective on this as well. You've been following this very closely, uh, especially over these last few weeks. Ed Markey talking about opting in, mentioning that this is something that Europeans are going to see go into effect 
expect here uh, in just a couple of weeks' time. What did you make of that exchange, and how big a deal would that be for this company with 2.2 billion users to go to a system like that? This is a huge deal. Ed Marquis was the first one to stand up and show Mark Zuckerberg that he is really on his back foot. He should be more aggressive about this. This is easy. You put up on the screen, you have boxes to tick. Yes, I'm opting in for this. Yes, I'm opting in for this. Yes, I'm opting in for this. And then the user really knows. You don't have to read through thousands of pages of legalese that no one understands. I think Ed Marquis just hit it all out of the ballpark there right now. We should point out that as we were listening, Anna even said, word, Marquis. Right. <laughs> you were Absolutely. so much in agreement. And they, that actually got, that got kind of contentious there at the end. He said, that was an easy question for you to give me a correct answer to, that yeah. he did not agree with and Zuckerberg. And you saw Zuckerberg very uncomfortable there. He would not give a straight answer. Should we have a law? We're talking about 13, 14, 15 year old kids who are being targeted with ads. We're living already in a commercial world. And we talk about, you know, sexual predators online, but what about being bombarded mm. with stuff to buy and maybe stuff that parents don't want their kids buying, but they've searched it somewhere else and so it pops up on Facebook. I want to ask you about an exchange that took place between Mark Zuckerberg and the senior senator from Texas, John Cornyn, uh, about ownership of data. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg said, I want to set the record straight here. There's a misapprehension. That is that Facebook owns data. John Cornyn uh, interrupting him to say, well, at least you guys are renting it. Um, <laughs> but this is a fundamental question as well. Exactly. So many people have given so much information to this company. This issue of ownership is one that's certainly come into fine focus over they've the last few years. They've monetized it. Uh -huh. Maybe he can say they don't own it, but they've certainly monetized it. That's the whole commercial basis of Facebook. They are making money off of people sharing their information. How do you think Zuckerberg was doing in there? I mean, it seems like he's actually getting some, the most of the reviews are that he's been doing pretty well, that he went in there to do what Facebook wanted him to do. What do you think? One out of 10 on the Zuck spectrum, uh -huh. 10. <laughs> he was way better than any of us could have anticipated. This is someone who does not feel comfortable speaking in front of people. He's pretty awkward guy, according to people who know him well. He held his own. I mean, when he walked in the room, the poor guy, he was white. Oh, yeah. He was so nervous. You know, my heart just went into my stomach for him. You but think anyone would be in a room like that and with how many cameras oh on gosh, his yeah. face? It was crazy. He's held his own. It's three hours of, of relatively tough questioning. I think it was pretty softball for a lot of it, to be perfectly honest, not too tough. But what we saw with Ed Marquis, I think, is a lawmaker who has a solution and is questioning a businessman about it. And I think he made his point. And he did not like when, sorry to interrupt no, you, though, Zuckerberg kept saying, uh, we have to flush out the details. He was kind of like, mm, but that's not the point. I'm asking you, are you OK with this? Safety first is essentially the point he was making. And Zuckerberg is not quite there yet. He's still all about connecting the world and making the world a better place by connecting you with your loved ones it's he's not thinking about the consequences in a real way yet and that has come through to me watching this and the democrat from delaware chris coons talking about that <laughs> tension in specific that you have his aspirations these optimistic aspirations for what facebook could be uh, now in tandem with the business side of facebook how does it make money it makes money from ads i just thought like a really funny exchange uh from the last few minutes was you had ben sass the senator from nebraska <laughs> essentially making a joke here about <laughs> facebook using dopamine consultants dopamine. to get more people to stay on facebook uh, mark zuckerberg not appreciating the joke at least maybe <laughs> no sarcasm. Uh, under the setting <laughs> was great. Uh, and let me ask you just about regulation. There was this moment there with um, with Brian Schatz, the senator from Hawaii, Democratic senator from Hawaii, talking about um, regulation. You had uh, Senator Mike Lee of Utah, Republican, talking about this as well. Mike Lee making a very clear point, kind of following off of Senator Ted Cruz uh, from Texas. How much of its thumb should it put on the scale when it comes to self-regulation? I think that Ted Cruz made that um, most vividly, I guess, asking Mark Zuckerberg about certain groups in, in particular. But um, this is a tall order for a company to have to decide this. I was struck by how often Mark Zuckerberg talked about AI and the future of AI. Mm -hmm. He said that I think like 99% of all the things on Facebook that have uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS propaganda are caught initially by AI. He seems yes. to be putting a lot of credence in the fact yeah. that this is what is going to be motivating the way they go through information going forward. Well, he's putting forth more Facebook means better regulation. I think if you talk to any Anybody in Silicon Valley, anybody in the tech world, AI is going to solve everyone's problems. But that is the same mentality that got us into this problem in the first place. We, we just can't rely on a guy like that, I think, to really protect people.
Another moment that I thought um, was pretty amazing was when Senator Richard Blumenthal from Connecticut had his staffers hold up apologies from the past. One of the many props. Yes, exactly. Oh my gosh, the props. Like, the yeah. one with all the with Would current propaganda. Would not be yeah. hearing without, yeah. Uh, but just sort of to your point of the, what got us into this mess in the first, pla first place, how many times have we kind of had a similar conversation that it feels like nothing's been done and not only that, but things have just gotten worse? Well, at least 14 times, so. And what do you think can, is there a, is this the time when things are going to get better this or not is, necessarily? It's a great question. I think we're putting band-aids on things. I think that's what the company is doing now. Every day we have a new press release. Now they're doing a bounty program where they're actually going to pay people to report bad actors. Um, I think Zuckerberg has come to a reckoning with the fact that there will always be malicious actors who will try to take advantage of the platform, but he is still so idealistic, he thinks the good vastly outweighs yeah. the bad, and that's another fundamental question that we are all wrestling with, the senators were wrestling with, and so is Mr. Zuckerberg. Savannah, we were talking before the hearing began just about how much of a mea culpa we were going to hear. Mm. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg having apologized in advance, having claimed responsibility before. Let's just take a listen here to what uh, Mark Zuckerberg had to say uh, to the senators at the beginning, giving his apology to them. We didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, for foreign interference in elections and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. Savannah, I want to ask you about this in particular. Uh, I started it a number of times through this hearing, Mark Zuckerberg going back to his dorm room at Harvard, <laughs> now more than a decade ago, talking about the genesis of this, how this all began. What do you make about the way he sort of infused or suffused his biography uh, into the hearing today? <laughs> you know, that did happen a lot. And I think that we even heard some of the senators commenting on it. We know that you've had the American dream and, and you've gotten here. So I, I think that for him, it's also pointing to the fact that he has said that he is not going anywhere. He does. He's not planning he's to step there, aside. Right. And so I think for him, it's kind of a moment for him to say in this stage when, you know, we're all watching, um, you know, don't forget the good we've done and don't forget that I was the one that got us here. And so that's why I'm not going to go anywhere. And it's like we mentioned earlier, it's him and Sheryl Sandberg who are sort of at the helm and both of them seem to plan to stay that way. Um, what do you think about that, about him not planning to step aside? You know, I think that he seems, as he has always been, very committed to the company. I don't think that that's diminished at all. I think that he's frustrated by what's happened. I think that was evident uh, today. Um, I agree with you, Anna. I think that he has dealt with this as well as he could have um, going into it. And um, there he is re-entering uh, the hearing room there, shaking hands. Um, you know, he, he uh, exudes a sort of, I don't know if it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a level of composure. I don't know mm -hmm. how much comfort there is uh, as well. But Anna, let me just ask you about how this company deals with the human resources issue going forward. There was a series of questions that centered on Myanmar. Um, Facebook has been used in many places around the world for mm -hmm. political gains, and we've seen it, we just heard about a, a trip that uh, one of the senators took to, to Zimbabwe, and that's certainly an issue where this is playing out now. Mark Zuckerberg saying that uh, Facebook intends to hire more Burmese speakers, uh, build up an office there. How difficult is it for this company to expand its footprint geographically like that? Well, there was only one Burmese speaker when... Which is extraordinary. ...when this horrible problem was playing out. So... I think it's extremely difficult, it's expensive, but this is a more than $400 billion company. They have the money, they can hire people. They're hiring another 5,000 security um, operators to take care of data. So I think it's a step in the right direction. Mm, absolutely. And it was interesting to hear him say that they are committing to people who actually speak the local language yes. in that dialect because of how important that is for detecting hate speech. Yeah, and also in Bangladesh, scraping of data, like 70% of people find Facebook friends by putting in a phone number or a personal email. That is gives an enormous opportunity to um, abuse the system. If you had been on the dark web and bought or sold or um, a personal email or a phone number and then you want to get more information on them, you can use that personal information to get more Facebook data. We're a few minutes left here as this hearing continues. Mark Zuckerberg will be back on Capitol Hill tomorrow. He's going to testify before the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. He's going to face more questions, and often the uh, questions are a bit spicier on the, on the House side. There's a little bit more yeah. grandstanding, uh, I think I could say. Where do we go from here? Uh, there have been a number of these questions where Mark Zuckerberg said, 
I'll have my team follow up with you. We'll get back to you. Yeah. I think going back to Ed Markey's questioning, yeah. uh, he wanted a clear answer on whether or not Mark Zuckerberg would support legislation that would deal with and, opting and in. Where do things get stand? It. Where do right. things he kept stand? kept saying that his team would get back. I think maybe that was a way of not promising that he would actually pick up the phone, which was probably a smart move. I think that this Cambridge Analytica story, it's already been three weeks now. It seems like it's never going to die down. I wonder if there's a pause after this hearing. He can collect himself and potentially put forth, I hope what he does is put forth proposals for how to better protect people. I keep mm. going back to what Senator Lindsey Graham was saying. He started with the Ford and the Chevy and all of that, yeah. but it ended kind of extraordinarily. I think I'd like curious what each of you think about this. Um, he says to Mark Zuckerberg, essentially, if there were to be regulation, what would you like to see? Giving Mark Zuckerberg the opportunity to do that. That strikes me as like kind of extraordinary that you're saying to the company that would be regulated, essentially give us what you think you should be regulated for. Absolutely, and I think that that's what everyone's going to be looking at. And he was even challenged, would you come to us with ideas on what should be regulated? And he goes, and to your point of the 10-10 for being Zuck, he was like, yes, I'm excited <laughs> to do that immediately following this. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he was leaning into that, though, not giving a lot of concrete detail. It also shows you have some of these senators are in their 80s. They are not data scientists. Right. And so I think they would welcome some helpful ideas from the company itself but you also have a lot of um, data uh, user advocates and and groups that are springing up in Silicon Valley. Roger McNamara, who was a um, former early mentor, investor, early yeah, investor yeah. and a mentor, and he has his own foundation now coming up with ideas to protect internet users. Chris Hughes is a member as well. Former so there founder, are, sure. That there are a lot of smart people thinking about these issues, and I hope that their voices will be heard. The other thing that I thought was kind of interesting, and I think we forget this a lot, knowing you you know, we think of Zuckerberg as this boy genius brainiac, is that he is also a dad. And that wasn't really pushed on until Senator Ben Sasson saying, sort of, you have two kids. What do you think about them being, you know, overexposed to social media, addicted to it? And it was sort of a humanizing moment within the whole yeah, thing. He brought up, at one point, I remember Mark Zuckerberg saying, uh, I trust it, my family trusts it, but you're right. He wasn't really honing into that yeah. uh, as much as, as he might have. And at several times, conversations centered on in terms of use, in terms of how young you could be on Facebook, mm -hmm. or if there's a difference yeah. between kids using it and adults using it. Again, I just think it strikes me that it shows that there's a there's a, a lot of degrees of difference when you look at these terms of agreement, or terms of privacy, terms of data. Um, yes, it may be clearer than it has been in the past, but it still is a pretty confusing document. It Especially for 13. It's That's true. Right. It is confusing. <laughs> it's confusing. And <laughs> even if you were to clarify it, I think it would be hard to police who really is the one using the internet. So even like take a, a page like backpage.com, you have to be 18 or older. Well, all you had to do was say, yes, I'm 18 or older mm. and you get access to backpage.com. So the, this is the wild west and I think it's gonna take years and maybe never, maybe we'll never be able to fully police it. <laughs> That's a great point is that really all you do is check a box saying that you are what age you say That's you right. are. It's like, it could be affecting people much younger. Mm. Well, Anna, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for joining us today. Stay here for the rest of Zuckerberg's hearing. Make sure you come back tomorrow for day two of the Facebook CEO's testimony. He's before the House Commerce and Energy Committee tomorrow. Have a good night. And privacy and uh, in a number of other areas, adds transparency, elections. Let me, let me get, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me get to one final question that kind of relates to what you're talking about in terms of content regulation and what exactly what exactly Facebook is. You know, you, you mentioned you're a tech company, a platform, but there's some who are saying that you're the world's biggest publisher. I think about 140 million Americans get their news from Facebook. And when you talked to Sen when you mentioned to Senator Corn Cornyn, uh, he you said you are responsible for your content. So, which are you? Are you a tech company? Or are you the world's largest publisher? Because I think that goes to a really important question on what form of regulation or government action, if any we would take? Senator, this is a, a really big question. I, I, I view us as a tech company because the primary thing that we do is build technology and products. But you said you're responsible for your content, which makes exactly. you kind of a publisher, right? Well, I agree that we're responsible for the content, but we don't produce the content. I, I think that when people ask us if we're a media company or a publisher, my understanding of what the heart of what they're really getting at is do we feel a responsibility for the content on our platform? The answer to that, I think, is clearly yes. And 
but I don't think that that's incompatible with fundamentally at, at our core being a technology company where the main thing that we do is have engineers and build products. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Sullivan, Senator Udall. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being uh, here today. You, you spoke uh, very idealistically about your company, and you talked about the strong values, and you said you wanted to be a positive force in the community and the world. Uh, and you were hijacked by Cambridge Analytica for political purposes. Are you angry about that? Absolutely. And, and you're determined... Uh, and I assume you want changes made in the law. That's what you've talked about today. Senator, the most important thing that I care about right now is making sure that no one interferes in the various 2018 elections around the world. We have an extremely important U.S. midterm. We have major elections in India, Brazil, Mexico, Pakistan, Hungary coming up. And we're going to take a, a number of measures from building and deploying new AI tools that take down fake news, to growing our security team to more than 20,000 people, to m making it so that we verify every advertiser who's doing political and issue ads, um, to make sure that that kind of interference that the Russians were able to do in 2016 is going to be much harder for anyone to pull off in the future. And, and I think you've said earlier that you support the Honest Ads Act, and so I assume that means you want changes in the law in order to, to effectuate exactly what you talked about. Senator, Correct? yes, we support yeah. the Honest Ads Act. And so We're are you implementing gonna, it. Are you going to come back up here and be a strong advocate to see that that law is passed? Senator, the biggest thing that I think we can do is implement it. Well, that's a kind and of we're doing yes that. or no question there. I hate to interrupt you, but are you going to come back and be a strong advocate? You're angry about this. You think there ought to be change. There ought to be a law put in place. Are you going to come back and be an advocate to get a law in place like that? Senator, our team is certainly going to work on this. What I can say is the biggest thing... I'm talking thing about I... you, not your team. Just... Well, Senator, <laughs> I try not to come back here to and be an advocate for that law. That's what I want to see. I mean, you're upset about this. We're upset about this. Uh, I'd like a yes or no answer on that one. Senator, I'm, I'm posting and speaking out publicly about how important this is. Um, I don't come to Washington, D.C. too often. Uh, I'm going to direct my team to focus on this. And the biggest thing that I feel like we can do is implement it, which we're doing. Well, the biggest thing you can do is to be a strong advocate yourself, personally, here in Washington. Just let me make that clear. But... Many of us have seen the kinds of images shown earlier by Senator Leahy. You saw those images that he held up. Can you guarantee that any of those images that can be attributed or associated with the Russian company, Internet Research Agency, have been purged from your platform? Senator, no, I can't guarantee that because this is an ongoing arms race. As long as there are people sitting in Russia whose job it is, is to try to interfere with elections around the world, this is going to be an ongoing conflict. What I can commit is that we're going to invest significantly because this is a top priority to make sure that people aren't spreading misinformation or trying to interfere in elections on Facebook. But I don't think it would be a realistic expectation to assume that as long as there are people who are employed in Russia for whom this is their job, that we're going to have zero amount of that or that we're going to be 100% successful at preventing that. Now, beyond disclosure of online ads, what specific steps are you taking to ensure that foreign money is not financing political or issue ads on Facebook in violation of U.S. law? Just because someone submits it a disclosure that says paid for by some 501c3 or PAC, if that group has no real person in the U.S., how can we ensure it is not Foreign, interf foreign interference. Senator, our verification program involves two pieces. One is verifying the identity of the person who's buying the ads, that they have a valid government identity. The second is verifying their location. So if you're sitting in Russia, for example, and uh, you say that you're in the U.S., then we'll be able to uh, to make it a lot harder to do that because what we're actually going to do is mail a code to the address that you say you're at. And if you can't get access to that code, then you're not going to be able to run ads. Yeah. Now, Facebook is creating an independent group to study the abuse of social media in elections. You've talked about that. Will you commit that all findings of this group are made public no matter what they say about Facebook or its business model? 
yes or no answer. Senator, that's the purpose of this group, is that Facebook does not get to control uh, what these folks publish. These are going to be independent academics, and Facebook has no prior publishing um, control. They'll be able to do the studies that, that, um, that they're doing and publish the results. And you're fine with them being public. And what's the timing on getting those out? Senator, we're kicking off the research now. Our goal is to focus on both providing ideas for preventing interference in 2018 and beyond, and also for holding us accountable to making sure that the measures that we put in place um, are, are successful in doing that. So I would hope that we will start to see the first results uh, later this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Udall. Uh, Senator Moran is up next, and I would just say again, for the uh, benefit of those who are here, that after a couple of more questioners, we'll probably give the witness another short break. Thank you. We're, we're getting about almost two-thirds through the, uh, the list of uh, members who are here to ask questions. Senator Moran. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for your, I'm over here, thank you for your testimony and thank you for your presence here today. Um, on March the 26th of this year, the FTC confirmed that it was investigating Facebook to determine whether its privacy practices violated the FTC Act or the consent order that Facebook entered into with the agency uh, in 2011. Uh, I chair the Commerce Committee subcommittee that has jurisdiction over the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, I remain interested in Facebook's assertion that it rejects any suggestion of violating that consent order. Part two of that consent order requires that Facebook, quote, clearly and prominently display notice and obtain users' affirmative consent before sharing their information with, quote, any third party. My question is, how does the case of approximately 87 million Facebook friends having their data shared with a third party due to the consent of only 300,000 consenting users not violate that agreement? Well, Senator... Like I said earlier, I mean, our, our view is that, is that we believe that we are, are in compliance with the consent order, but I think that we have a broader responsibility to protect people's privacy even beyond that. And in, in this specific case, the way that the platform worked, or that you could sign into an app and bring some of your information and some of your friends' information, is how we explained it would work. People had settings to that effect. Uh, they, uh, we, we explained and they, and they consented to, to it working that way. And the, the system basically worked as it was designed. The issue is that we designed the system in a way that wasn't good. And now we, starting in 2014, have changed the design of the system so that, that way it just massively restricts the amount of, um, of data access that a developer can get. The Going forward... I'm sorry, the 300,000 people, mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, treated in a way that uh, it was appropriate. They consented, but you're not suggesting that the friends consented. Senator, I believe that, that we uh, rolled out this developer platform and that we explained to people uh, how it worked and that they did consent to it. Okay. It, it makes sense, I think, to, to go through the, the way the platform works. I mean, it's, uh, in 2007, uh, we, we announced the Facebook developer platform, and the idea was that you wanted to make uh, more experiences social, right? So, uh, for example, if you, like, you might want to have a calendar that can have your friend's birthdays on it, or you might want your address book to have your friend's pictures in it, or you might want a map that can show your friend's addresses on it. In order to do that, we needed to build a tool that allowed people to sign into an app and bring some of their information uh, and some of their friend's information to those apps. We made it very clear that this is how it worked, uh, and, and when people signed up for Facebook, they signed up for that as well. Now, a lot of good use cases came from that. I mean, there were games that were built. Uh, there were integrations with companies that I think we're familiar with, like Netflix and Spotify. But over time, what became clear was that that also enabled some abuse. And that's why in 2014, we took the step of changing the platform. So now, when people sign into an app, you do not bring some of your friends' information with you. You're only bringing your own information, and you're able to connect with friends who have also authorized that app directly. Let me uh, turn to the bug, your bug bounty program. Uh, our subcommittee has had a, hearings in, a hearing in regard to bug bounty. Your press release uh, indicated that was one of the six changes that Facebook initially offered to crack down on platform abuse, abuses was to reward outside parties who find vulnerabilities. Um, one concern I have regarding the utility of this approach is that the vulnerability disclosure programs are normally geared toward identifying 
unauthorized access to data, not pointing out data sharing arrangement that likely could harm someone, but technically abide by complex consent agreements. How do you see the bug bounty program that you've announced uh, addressing the issue of that? Sorry, could you, could you clarify what, what specific? How do, you, how do you see that the bug bounty program that you are and have announced will deal with the sharing of information not permissible as compared to just unauthorized access to data? Senator, I'm not, uh, I'm not actually sure I, I understand this enough to, to speak to, to that specific point, and I can have my team follow up with you on the details of that. In general, bounty programs are an important part of the security arsenal for hardening a lot of systems. Uh, I think we should expect that we're going to invest a lot in hardening our systems ourselves and that we're going to audit and investigate a lot of the folks in our ecosystem, but even with that, having the ability to enlist other third parties outside of the company to be able to help us out by giving them an incentive to point out when they see issues, I think is likely going to help us improve the security of the platform overall, which is why we did this. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thank you, Senator Moran. Next up, Senator Booker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Mr. Zuckerberg. As you know, much of my life has been focused on low-income communities, poor communities, working-class communities, and trying to make sure they have a fair shake. This country has a very bad history of discriminatory practices towards low-income Americans and Americans of color from the redlining, FHA practices, even to more recently, really dis discriminatory practices in the mortgage business. I've always seen technology as a promise to democratize our nation, expand access, expand opportunities. Uh, but unfortunately, we've also seen how platforms, technology platforms like Facebook, uh, can actually be used to double down on discrimination and, and give people more sophisticated t tools with which to discriminate. Now, in, in, 19, in, 2000, in 2016, ProPublica revealed that advertisers could use ethnic affinity, uh, a user's race, uh, uh, to market categories to potentially discriminate overall against Facebook users uh, in the areas of housing, employment, and credit, echoing a dark history in this country. Uh, in vi and also in violation of federal law. In 2016, Facebook committed to fixing this, that the advertisers who have access to this data, to fixing it. Uh, but unfortunately, a year later, as, as, as ProPublica's article showed, they found that the system Facebook built was still allowing housing ads uh, uh, without uh, uh, applying to go forward, without applying these new restrictions that were put on. Uh, Facebook then opted on a system that's very similar to what we've been talking about with uh, Cambridge Analytica, that they could self-certify that they were not engaging in these practices uh, uh, and complying with federal law, using this self-certification uh, a way uh, 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 to, to overcome and to comply with, rather, Facebook's uh, anti-discrimination policy. Uh, unfortunately, in a recent lawsuit, um, as of February 2018, uh, alleges that discriminatory ads were still being created on Facebook, still disproportionately impacting low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, given the fact that you allowed Cambridge Analytica to self-certify in a way that I think, at least I think you've expressed regret over, is self-certification the best and strongest way to safeguard guard against the misuse of your platform and protect the data of users and not let it be manipulated in such a discriminatory fashion? Senator, this is a, a, a very Im important question. And, you know, in, in general, I think over time we're going to move towards more proactive review with more AI tools to help flag problematic content. Um, in the near term, we have a lot of content on the platform, uh, and we, it's, it's hard to review every single thing up front. We do a quick screen. Um, but I, I agree with you that I think in, in this specific case, uh, I'm not happy with where we are, and I, I think it makes sense to, to really focus on making sure that these areas get more review sooner. And, and I know you understand that there is uh, a growing uh, uh, distrust, and I know a lot of civil rights organizations have met with you, um, about Facebook's sense of urgency to address these issues. Um, uh, uh, there's a distrust that stems from the fact, and I know uh, I've had conversations with leaders in Facebook about the lack of diversity in the tech sector as, uh, as well, people who are writing these algorithms, people who are 
actually policing for this data, policing for these problems, uh, are they going to be a part of a more diverse group that's looking at this? You're looking to hire, as you said, 5,000 new positions for, among other things, reviewing content. But we know in your industry, uh, the inclusivity, that it's a real serious problem that you are an industry that lacks diversity in a very dramatic fashion. It's not just true with Facebook, it's true with uh, the tech area as well. And, and so it's very important for me to, to communicate uh, uh, that larger sense of urgency and, and what a lot of civil rights organizations are concerned with. And, and we should be working towards more, um, uh, a more collaborative approach. And I'm wondering if you'd be open to opening your platform for civil rights organizations to really audit uh, a lot of these companies dealing in areas of credit and housing to really audit what is actually happening and better have more transparency in working with your platform. Senator, I think that's a very good idea, and I think we should follow up on the details of that. Um, I also want to say that, that there was an investigation, uh, uh, something that's very disturbing to me, is the fact that there have been uh, law enforcement organizations that use Facebook's platform uh, to, uh, to, to, su to surveil African American organizations like Black Lives Matter. I know you've expressed uh, um, uh, support for the group and Philandro Castile's uh, uh, killing uh, was broadcast live on Facebook. Um, but there are a lot of communities of color worried that that data uh, can be used uh, to surveil uh, um, uh, groups like Black Lives Matter, like folks who are trying to uh, organize against uh, substantive issues of discrimination in this country. Is this something that you're committed to addressing and to ensuring uh, uh, that the freedoms uh, that civil rights activists and others uh, are not targeted uh, or their work not being undermined or people not using your platform uh, to un unfairly surveil uh, and try to uh, um, undermine the activities that those groups are doing? Yes, Senator. Uh, I think that that's very important. We're, we're committed to that. Uh, and in general, unless law enforcement has a very clear uh, subpoena or ability or, or reason to get access to information, we're going to push back on that across the board. And then I'd just like for the record, because my time has expired, yeah. uh, but there's a lawsuit against Facebook about discrimination, and you uh, move for the lawsuit to be dismissed because no harm was shown. Could you please submit to the record, uh, could you believe that people of color who are not uh, recruited for various uh, uh, economic opportunities are being harmed? Can you please uh, uh, clarify why you move for, to dismiss that lawsuit for the record? For the record. Thank you. Senator Heller is up next. <clears throat> to you. All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Appreciate the time, and thank you for being here. I'm over here. Thanks. Um, and thank you for taking time. I know it's been a long day, and uh, I think you're at the, uh, at the final stretch here, but I'm glad that you are here. Yesterday, uh, Facebook sent out a notification to 87 million users that information was given to Cambridge Analytica without their consent. Uh, my daughter was one of the 87 million, and six of my uh, uh, staff uh, uh, all from Nevada received this notification. Can you tell me um, how many Nevadans were among the 87 million uh, that uh, received this notification? Senator, I don't have this broken out by state right now, but I can have my team follow up with you to get you the information. Okay, okay, I figured that would be the answer. Uh, if uh, after hearing this, uh, going through this hearing and Nevadans no longer want to have a Facebook account, if, if that's the case, if a Facebook user deletes their account, uh, do you delete their data? Yes. Um, my kids have been on Facebook and Instagram for years. How long do you keep a user's data? Sorry? Can How long do you keep a user's data? Once they, uh, uh, after, after they've left. If they, if they uh, choose to delete their account, how long do you keep their data? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I know we try to delete it as quickly as is reasonable. We have a lot of complex systems and it work, takes a while to work through all that. Uh, but I think we try to move as quickly as possible and I can follow up or have my team yeah. follow up to get you the, the data on that. Okay. Have you ever said that you won't sell an ad based on um, personal information, simply that, that you wouldn't sell this data because of the uh, usage of it goes too far? Um, Senator, could you clarify that? Um, have you ever drawn the line on selling data to an advertiser? Yes, Senator. We don't sell data at all. 
so the, the way the ad system works is advertisers can come to us and say, I, I have a message that I'm trying to reach a certain type of people. Uh, they might be interested in something, they might live in a place, and then we help them get that message in front of people. But this is one of the, it's widely mischaracterized about our system that we sell data. And it's actually one of the most important parts of how Facebook works is we do not sell data. Advertisers do not get access to people's individual data. Have you ever collected the content of phone calls or messages uh, through any Facebook application or service? Um, Senator, I don't believe we've ever collected the content of, of phone calls. Um, we have an app called Messenger that allows people to message their, uh, mostly their Facebook friends. And we do, on the Android operating system, allow people to use that app as their client for both Facebook messages and texts. Uh, so we do allow people to import their texts into that. Okay. Let me ask you about government surveillance. Uh, for years, Facebook said that, there'd be, that there should be strict limits on the information the government can access uh, on Americans. And by the way, I agreed with you uh, that uh, privacy, because privacy is important to Nevadans. You argued that Facebook users wouldn't trust you if they thought you were giving their private information to the intelligence community yet you use and sell the same data to make money. And in the case of Cambridge Analytica, you don't even know how it's used after you sell it. Can you uh, tell us why this isn't hypocritical? Well, Senator, once again, we don't sell any data to anyone. We don't sell it to advertisers, and we don't sell it to developers. What we do allow is for people to sign into apps and bring their data, uh, and it used to be the data of some of their friends, but now it isn't. Yeah. Um, with them. And that, I think, makes sense. I mean, that's basic data portability, the ability that you own the data, you should be able to take it uh, from one app to another if you'd like. Do you believe you're more responsible with millions of Americans' personal data than the federal government would be? Yes. Uh, but, Senator, the, your point about surveillance, I think that there's a very important distinction to draw here, which is that when when organizations do surveillance, people don't have control over that. Right on Facebook, everything that you share there, you have control over. You can, uh, you can say, I don't want this information to be there. You have full access to understand ev all, every piece of information that Facebook might know about you, and you can get rid of all of it. And I, I don't know of any, other sur uh, any surveillance organization in the world that operates that way, which is why I think that that comparison just isn't really apt here. With you here today, do you think you're a victim? No. Do you think uh, Facebook as a company is a victim? Senator, no. I think we have a responsibility to protect everyone in our community from anyone in, in our ecosystem who is uh, going to potentially harm them. And I think consider, that we haven't done enough historically, do you consider and the, we need to step up okay, and do more. Do you consider the 87 million users, do you consider them victims? Uh, Senator, I think... Yes. I mean, they, they did not want their information to be sold to Cambridge Analytica by a developer. And, and that happened, and it happened on our watch. So even though we didn't do it, I think we have a responsibility to be able to prevent that and be able to take action sooner. And we're committing to make sure that we do that going forward, which is why the steps that, that I announced before are now, uh, they're the two most important things that we're doing are locking down the platform to make sure that developers can't get access to that much data so this can't happen again going forward, which I think is largely the case since 2014. And going backwards, we need to investigate every single app that might have had access to a large amount of people's data to make sure that no one else was misusing it. And if we find that they are, we're going to get into their systems, do a full audit, make sure they delete it, and we're going to tell everyone who's affected. Mr. Thank, Chairman, thank, thank you. you, Senator Heller. We'll go to Senator Peters and then into the break, and then Senator Tillis coming out of the break. So, Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for being uh, here today. You know, you've uh, talked about uh, your very humble beginnings in, in starting uh, Facebook in, in your dorm room, which I appreciated uh, that story, but certainly Facebook has changed an awful lot over a relatively short period of time. When Facebook launched its uh, timeline feature, consumers saw their friends post uh, chronologically as the process. But Facebook has uh, since then changed to a timeline driven by some very sophisticated uh, algorithms. And I think it has left uh, many people as a result of that uh, asking, you know, why, why am I seeing this, uh, this feed uh, and why am I seeing this uh, right now? 
And now in light of uh, the, uh, the uh, Cambridge Analytica issue, Facebook users are asking, I think, some new questions right now. Can I believe what I'm seeing? And who has access uh, to this information uh, about me? So I think it's safe to say, uh, very simply, that uh, Facebook is losing the trust uh, of an awful lot of uh, Americans uh, as a result of this uh, incident. And, and I think an example of this is something that I've been hearing a, a lot from folks that have been coming up to me and talking about uh, uh, really kind of an experience they've had uh, where they're having a conversation uh, with friends, uh, not on the phone, just talking. Uh, and then they see ads popping up fairly quickly uh, uh, on their Facebook. So I've heard constituents fear that Facebook is mining audio from uh, their mobile devices uh, for the purpose of, of ad targeting, which I think speaks to this lack of trust that we're seeing here. But, uh, and I understand there's some technical issues and logistical issues for that to happen. But for the record, I think it's clear, seeing I hear it all the time, including from my own staff. Uh, yes or no, does Facebook use audio obtained from mobile devices to enrich personal information about its users? No. Good. The, uh, well, Senator, let, let, me be, let me be clear on this. I mean, so you're, you're talking about this um, conspiracy theory that gets passed around that we listen to what's going on on your microphone and use that for ads. Right. We don't do that. To be clear, we do allow people to take videos on their, on their devices and, um, and share those. And of course, videos also have audio. So, um, so we do, while you're taking a video, um, record that and use that to make the service better by making sure that your videos have audio. But I, I mean, that I think is, is pretty clear, but I just wanted to make sure I was exhaustive there. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully that'll dispel a lot of what I've been hearing. So thank you for saying that. Certainly, uh, the, uh, today, uh, uh, in the era of uh, mega data, uh, we are finding that data drives uh, everything, including uh, consumer behavior. And so consumer information is probably the most valuable information you can get in the data ecosystem. And certainly, folks, as you've mentioned in your testimony here, people like the fact that they can have targeted ads that they're going to be interested in, as opposed to being bombarded by a lot of ads that they don't have any interest in. Uh, and that consumer information is important in order for you to tailor that. Uh, but also people are now beginning to wonder, uh, is there an expense to that uh, when it comes to perhaps exposing them to being manipulated or through uh, deception? Uh, you've talked about artificial intelligence. You brought that up uh, many times during your testimony. And I know you're, you've employed some new algorithms to target bots, bring down fake accounts, deal with terrorism, things that you've talked about in this hearing. But you also know that artificial intelligence is not without its risk and that you have to be very transparent about how those uh, algorithms uh, are constructed. Uh, how do you see uh, artificial intelligence, more specifically, uh, dealing with the ecosystem by helping to get consumer insights, but also keeping consumer privacy safe? Senator, I think the, the core question you're asking about AI transparency is a really important one that people are just starting to very seriously study, and that's ramping up a lot. And I think this is going to be a very central question for how we think about AI systems over the next decade and beyond. Right now, a lot of our AI systems um, make decisions in ways that uh, people don't really understand. Right. And I don't think that in 10 or 20 years in the future that we all want to build, um, we want to end up with systems that people don't understand how they're making decisions. So having doing the research now um, to make sure that the, the an extremely important thing. Well, you bring up the, the principles because uh, as, you, as you're well aware, uh, AI systems, especially in very complex uh, environments when you have machine learning, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to understand, as you mentioned, exactly how those decisions were arrived at. There's examples of how decisions are made in a discriminatory basis and that it can, can compound if you're not very careful about how that occurs. And so is your company, you mentioned principles, is your company developing a set of principles that are going to guide that development? And would you provide details to us as to what those principles are and how they will help uh, deal with this issue? Yes, Senator. I can make sure that our team follows up and gets you the information on that. And we have a whole AI ethics team that is working on developing um, basically the technology. It's not just about philosophical principles, it's also a technological foundation for making sure that this goes in the direction that we want. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, we'll recess for five and um, come back in. So we'll give uh, Mr. Zuckerberg a quick break here. Thanks.
Peter's asked it, right? So I'll just say, hey, he said, he said no. Um, but then, how, like, everybody has anecdotes, right? And just use the one. This is my dog.
uh, Senator Tillis is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here. I think you've done a good job. I've been here for most of it, the session, except for about 20 minutes. I watched on television back in my office. Um, I, I was Googling earlier, actually going on my Facebook app on my phone earlier, and I found one of your Facebook page, or yeah, one of your Facebook presences. It was the same one on March 30th. I think you posted a pic of a first Seder. But um, further down, you listed out the facts uh, since the new platform was uh, released in 2007, sort of a timeline. You start with 2007, then you jump to the Cambridge Analytica um, issue. I actually think that we need to fully examine what Cambridge Analytica did. They either broke a kind of code of conduct, if they broke any other rules or agreements with you all, I hope that they suffer the consequences. But I think that timeline needs to be updated. And it really needs to go back. Uh, I've read a series of three articles that were published in the MIT Technology Review back in 2012. And it talks about how proud the Obama campaign was of exploiting data on Facebook in the 2012 campaign. In fact, somebody asked you earlier if it made you mad about what Cambridge Analytica did, and you rightfully answered yes. But I think you should probably be equally mad when a former campaign director of the Obama campaign proudly tweeted, Facebook was surprised we were able to suck out the whole social graph. But they didn't stop us once they realized that was what we were doing. So you clearly had some people in your employ that apparently knew it, at least that's what this person said on Twitter, and thank goodness for way back and some of the other history grabber machines. I'm sure we can get this tweet back and get it in the right context. Um, I think when you do your research, it's important to get the whole view. I've worked in data analytics practice for a good part of my career. And for anybody to pretend that Cambridge Analytica was the first person to exploit data clearly doesn't work or hasn't worked in the data analytics field. So when you go back and do your research on Cambridge Analytica, I would personally appreciate it if you'd start back from the first known high-profile national campaign that exploited Facebook data. In fact, they published an app that said it would grab information about my friends, their birth dates, locations, and likes. So presumably, if I downloaded that app that was published by the Obama campaign, I've got 4,900 uh, friends on my Facebook page. I delete the haters and save room for family members and true friends on my personal page, as I'm sure everybody does. Then that means if I clicked yes on that app, I would have approved the access of birth dates, locations, and likes of some 4,900 people without their consent. So as you do the chronology, I think it'd be very helpful so that we can take away the partisan rhetoric that's going on, like this is a Republican-only issue. It's a, it's a broad-based issue that needs to be fixed. And bad actors at either end of the political spectrum need to be held accountable, and I, and I trust that you all are going to work on that. Um, I think the one thing uh, that I, so for that, I just want to get to the facts, and there's no way you can answer any of the questions. I'm not going to burden you with that. But I think getting that chronology would be very helpful. The one thing I would encourage people to do is go to Facebook. I'm a proud member of Facebook. Just got a post from my sister on this being National Sibling Day. So I've connected with four or five of my staff while I was giving you my undivided or family undivided attention. But go to the privacy tab. If you don't want to share something, don't share it. This is a free service. Go on there and say, I don't want to allow third party search engines to get to my Facebook page. Go on there and say, only my friends can look at it. Go in there and understand what you're signing up for. It's a free app. Now, you need to do more, and I think it would be helpful. I didn't read your disclaimer page or the terms of use because I didn't see anywhere in there that I could get an attorney and negotiate the terms. So it was a terms of use. I went on there, then I used the privacy settings to be as safe as I could be with a presence on Facebook. Last thing, we talk about all these proposed legislation, good ideas, but I have one question for you. When you were developing this app in your dorm, how many people did you have in your regulatory affairs division? <laughs> exactly. So if government takes a handy, heavy-handed approach to fix this problem, then we know very well that the next Facebook, the next thing that you're going to wake up and worry about how you continue to be relevant as the behemoth that you are today is probably not going to happen. So we've, I think that there's probably a place for some regulatory guidance here, but there's a huge place for Google, Snapchat, Twitter, all the other social media platforms to get together and create standards. And I also believe that that person who may have looked the other way when the whole social graph was extracted for the Obama campaign, if they're still working for you, they probably shouldn't 
or at least there should be a business code of conduct that says you don't play favorites. You're trying to create a fair place for, uh, for people to share their ideas. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Harris. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I've been here for, for on and off for the last four hours that you've been testifying, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm concerned about how much Facebook values trust and transparency if we agree that a critical component of a relationship of trust and transparency is we speak truth and we get to the truth. Uh, during the course of this hearing, these last four hours, you've been asked several critical questions for which you don't have answers. And those questions have included whether Facebook can track users' browsing activity even after the user has logged off of Facebook, whether Facebook can track your activity across devices even when you aren't logged into Facebook. Who is Facebook's biggest competition? Whether Facebook may store up to 96 categories of users' information. Whether you knew whether Kogan's terms of service and whether you knew if that Kogan could sell or transfer data. And then another case in point specifically as it relates to Cambridge Analytica is in a concern of mine is that you, meaning Facebook, and I'm going to assume you personally as CEO, became aware in December of 2015 uh, that Dr. Kogan and Cambridge Analytica misappropriated data from 87 million Facebook users. That's 27 months ago that, that you became as Facebook and perhaps you personally became aware. Um, however, a decision was made not to notify the users. So my question is, did anyone at Facebook have a conversation at the time that uh, you became aware of this breach and have a conversation wherein the decision was made not to contact the users? Senator, uh, I don't know if there were any conversations at Facebook overall, because I was in, in a lot of them, but... Um, On that subject. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure what other people discussed. Um, our, at the time, in 2015, we heard the report that this developer, Alexander Kogan, had sold data to Cambridge Analytica. And That's in you, violation of our terms. Correct. And were you a part of a decision? Were you part of a discussion that resulted in a decision not to inform your users? I don't remember a conversation like that. But the reason why... Are you aware of anyone in leadership at Facebook who was in a conversation where a decision was made not to inform your users, or do you believe no such conversation ever took place? I, I'm not sure whether there was a conversation about that, but I can tell you the thought process at the time of the company, which was that in 2015, when we heard about this, we banned the developer, and we demanded that they delete all the data and stop using it, and same with Cambridge Analytica. And I, and they told I us they had. testimony in that regard, but I'm talking about notification of the users. And, and, and this relates to the issue of transparency and the relationship of trust, informing the user about what you know in terms of how their personal information has been misused. And I'm also concerned that when you personally became aware of this, did you or senior leadership do an inquiry to find out who at Facebook had this information and did they not have a discussion about whether or not the users should be informed back in December of 2015? Senator, in retrospect, I think we clearly view it as a mistake that we didn't inform people. And we did that based on false information that we thought that the case was closed and that the data had been deleted. So there was a decision made on that basis not to inform the users, is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And, um, but I, I, in retrospect, I think that was a mistake, and knowing what we know now, we should have handled a lot of things here differently. And I appreciate that point. Do you know when that, when that decision was made not to inform the users? I don't. Okay. Um, last November, the Senate Intelligence Committee held a hearing on social media influence. I was a part of that hearing. I submitted 50 written questions to Facebook and other companies, and um, the responses that we received were unfortunately evasive, and some were frankly non-responsive. So I'm going to ask the question again here. 
How much revenue did Facebook earn from the user engagement that resulted from foreign propaganda? Well, Senator, what we do know is that the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, the, the Russian firm, ran about $100,000 worth of ads. How I can't say Facebook that we've identified all of the foreign actors who are involved here. So I, I, I can't say that that's all of the money, but that is what we have identified. Okay, my time is up. I'll submit more questions for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Harris. Next up is Senator Kennedy. <clears throat> Mr. Zuckerberg, I come in peace. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to vote to have to regulate Facebook, but my God, I will. But that, a lot of that depends on you. Uh, I'm a little disappointed in this hearing today. I just don't feel like that we're connecting. So, so let me try to lay it out for you from my point of view. I think you're a really smart guy. And I think you have built an extraordinary American company. And you've done a lot of good. Some of the things that you've been able to do are magical. But our, our promised digital utopia, we have discovered, has minefields. There, there's some impurities in the Facebook punch bowl. And they got to be fixed. And I think you can fix them. Now, here, here's what's going to happen. There are going to be a whole bunch of bills introduced to regulate Facebook. It's up to you whether they pass or not. You can go back home, uh, spend $10 million on lobbyists and fight us, or you can go back home and uh, help us solve this problem. And there are two. One's a privacy problem. The other one is what I call a propaganda problem. Let's start with the privacy problem first. Let's start with the user agreement. Here's what everybody's been trying to tell you today, and I, I, I say this gently. Your user agreement sucks. <laughs> You're a, you, you, you can spot me 75 IQ points. If I can figure it out, you can figure it out. The purpose of that user agreement is to cover Facebook's rear end. It's not to inform your users about their rights. Now, you know that, and I know that. I'm going to suggest to you that you go back home and rewrite it and tell your $1,200 an hour lawyers, no disrespect, they're good, but, but tell them you want it written in English, in non-Swahili, so the average American can understand it. That would be a start. I, are, are you willing, as a Facebook user, are you, are you willing to give me more control over my data? Senator, as someone who uses Facebook, I believe that you should have complete control over your data. Okay. Are, are you willing to uh, go back and, and, and work on, on giving me a greater right to erase my data? Senator, you can already delete any of the data that's there, or are, are delete all of your data. Are you willing to expand that, work on expanding that? Uh, Senator, I think we already do what you're referring to, but certainly we're always working on trying to make these controls easier. Are, are you willing to expand my right to know who you're sharing my data with? Senator, we already give you a list of apps that, that you're using and you signed into those yourself and provided affirmative consent. Right. As on I've said user, before, that, we don't share on any that, data on with... that user agreement. Uh, are, are you willing to uh, expand my right to prohibit you from sharing my data? Senator, again, I believe that you already have that control. So, I mean, I think people have that, that full control in the system already today. Uh, if we're not communicating this clearly, then that's a big thing that we should work on. Because I think the principles that you're articulating are the ones that we believe in and try to codify in the product that we build. Are, are you willing to give me the right to take my data on Facebook and move it to another social media platform? Senator, you can already do that. We have a download your information tool where you can go, 
get a file of all the content there and then do whatever you want with it. And you're, are you, then I assume you're willing to give me the right to say, I'm going to go on your platform and you're going to be able to tell a lot about me as a result, but I don't want you to share it with anybody. Yes, Senator. And I believe you already have that ability today. People can sign on and choose to not share things and just follow some friends or some pages and read content if that's what they want to do. Okay. Um, let me be sure I understand. I'm about out of time. Boy, it goes fast, doesn't it? Let me ask you one final question in my 12 seconds. Could somebody call you up and say, I want to see John Kennedy's file? Absolutely not. Could you, if it, not, not, could you, not would you do it, could you do it? Uh, in, in theory. Do you have the right to put my data, a name on my data, and share it with somebody? I do not believe we have the right to do that. Do you have the ability? Senator, the data is in the system. Do so you have the ability? Technically, I think someone could do that, but that would be a massive breach. So we would never do that. It would be a breach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Kennedy. Senator Baldwin's up next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, being here and uh, enduring a long day, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, I want to start with what I hope can be a quick round of, of questions, just so I uh, make sure I understand your previous testimony. Um, specifically with regard to uh, uh, the process by which Cambridge Analytica uh, was able to purchase uh, Facebook users' data. So it was an app developer, Alexander uh, Kogan. He collected data via a personality quiz. Uh, uh, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And he thereby is able to gain access of not only the people who took the quiz, but their network. Is that correct, too? Senator, yes, the terms of the platform at the time allowed for uh, people to share their information and some basic information about their friends as well. And we've since changed that. As of 2014, and, now that's not possible. And so uh, in total, about 87 million uh, Facebook users. You earlier testified about the two t types of ways you gain data. One is what is voluntarily shared by Facebook members and users. And the other is um, in order to, I think you said, improve your advertising experience, whatever that exactly means, the data that Facebook collects in order to customize or, or focus on that. Did, was, uh, Alexander Kogan able to get both of those sets of data or just what was voluntarily entered by the user? Yes, that's a good question. It was just a subset of what was entered by the person. And so a subset of the 95 uh, uh, categories of data that you keep? Yes. And when you sign okay. into an app, you, the app developer has to say, here are the types of data that from you that I'm asking for, mm -hmm. including public information like your name and profile, the pages you follow, other interests on your profile, that kind of content. Okay. The app developer has to disclose that up front, and you agree to it. OK. Uh, so in answer to a couple of other senators' questions, uh, specifically Senator Fisher, you uh, talked about Facebook storing this data. And I think you just talked about the data being in the system. Um, I wonder if uh, outside of the way in which uh, Alexander Kogan was able to access this data, whether you, uh, could Facebook be vulnerable to a data breach or hack? Why or why not? Well, there are many kinds of security threats that a company like ours faces, including people trying to break into our security systems. Okay. And if you believe that you had been hacked, do you believe you would have the duty to inform those who were impacted? Yes. OK. Um, do you know whether uh, uh, Alexander Kogan sold any of the data he collected with anyone other than Cambridge Analytica? Senator, yes, we do. He sold it to a couple of other firms. Uh, Can you identify them? 
Yes, there was one called uh, Unoya, and there may have been a couple of others as well. And can I you can furnish follow that up to me you. after? Thank yes. you. I appreciate that. And then, um, how much do you know, or have you tried to find out uh, how Cambridge Analytica used the data while they had it before um, you believe they deleted it? Since we just heard that they didn't delete it about a month ago, we've kicked off an internal investigation to see if they use that data in any of their ads, for example. That investigation is still underway, and we will we can come back to you with the results of that once we have that. Okay. I want to switch to my home state of Wisconsin. According to press reports, my home state of Wisconsin was a major target of Russian-bought ads on Facebook in the 2016 election. These divisive ads, um, touching on a number of very polarizing issues, were designed to interfere with our election. We've also learned that um, Russian actors using another platform, Twitter, uh, similarly targeted Wisconsin with divisive content aimed at sowing uh, division and dissent, including in the wake of a police-involved shooting in Milwaukee's Sherman Park neighborhood in August of 2016. Now, I, I find some uh, encouragement in the steps you've outlined today to provide greater transparency regarding political ads. Um, I do want to get further information on how you can be confident um, that you have uh, excluded entities based outside of the United States. Uh, we will follow up on that. And then uh, I think on that uh, topic, um, if you require uh, disclosure of a political ads sponsor, um, what sort of transparency uh, will you be able to provide with regard to people who weren't the subject of that ad seeing its content? Senator, you'll be able to go to any page and see all of the ads that that page has run. So if someone is running a political campaign, for example, and they're targeting one district with one ad and another district with another. Historically, it's been hard to track that down, but now it'll be very easy. You'll just be able to look at all of the ads that they've run, the targeting associated with each to see what they're saying to different, to different folks, uh, and in, in some cases, how much they're spending on, on the ads, uh, and all, all of the relevant information. This is an area where I think more transparency will really help discourse overall and root out foreign interference in elections. Thank you, and Senator you Baldwin. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for testifying here today. Do you have any idea how many of your users actually read the terms of service, the privacy policy, the statement of rights and responsibilities? I mean, actually read it? Senator, I do not. Would you imagine it's a very small percentage? Senator, who read the whole thing? I would imagine that probably most people do not read the whole thing, but everyone has the opportunity to and consents to it. Well, I agree, but that's kind of true of every application where you, know, you want to get to it and you have to agree to it and people just press that agree. The vast majority, correct? Senator, it's really hard for me to make a full assessment, but... Common sense would tell you that would be probably the case. Um, with all this publicity, have you documented any kind of backlash from Facebook users? I mean, has there been a dramatic fall off in the number of people who utilize Facebook because of these concerns? Senator, there has not. Uh, you haven't even witnessed any? Um, Senator, there, there was a movement where some people were encouraging their friends to uh, delete their account, and I think that that got shared a bunch. So, so it's kind of safe to say that Facebook users don't seem to be overly uh, concerned about all these revelations, although obviously Congress apparently is. Um, well, Senator, I think people are concerned about it, and I think these are incredibly important issues that people want us to address, and I think people have told us that very clearly. Well, it seems like Facebook users still want to use the platform because they enjoy sharing photos and they, they sh share the co connectivity with the family members, that type of thing, and that overrides their concerns about privacy. You talk about the user owns the data. You know, there are a number of been a number of proposals of having that data stay at the user and allow the user to monetize it themselves. Uh, your COO, uh, Ms. Sandberg, mentioned possibly if, if you can't utilize that data to sell advertising, perhaps we'd charge people to 
go on to Facebook. Have you thought about that model where the user data is actually monetized by the actual user? Senator, I'm not sure exactly how, how it would work for it to be monetized by the, the, the person directly. In general, we're, we believe that the ads model is the right one for us because it aligns with our social mission of trying to connect everyone and bring the world closer together. But, but you're aware of people making that kind of proposal, correct? Yeah, I, Senator, a number of people um, suggest that, that we should offer a version where people can not have ads if they pay a monthly subscription. And um, certainly we consider ideas like that. I think that they're reasonable ideas to, to think through. But overall, the, I think that the ads experience is going to be uh, the best one. I think in general, people like not having to pay for a service. A lot of people can't afford to pay for a service around the world. And this aligns with our mission the best. You, you answered Senator Graham when he asked you if you thought you were a monopoly that you didn't think so. Uh, you're obviously a big player in this space. Uh, that might be an area for competition, correct? If somebody else wants to create a social platform that allows a user to monetize their own data. Senator, yes. There are lots of new social apps all the time. And as I said before, the average American, I think, uses eight different communication and social apps. So there's a lot of different choice and a lot of innovation and activity going on in this space. I want to, in a very short period of time here, talk about the difference between advertisers and application developers, because those, again, you, you said in an earlier testimony that advertisers have no access to data whatsoever, but application developers do. Now, is that only through their own service agreements with their customers, or do they actually access data as they're developing applications? Senator, this is an important distinction, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to clarify this. People, we give people the ability to take their data to another app if they want. And this is a question that Senator Kennedy asked me uh, just a few minutes ago. The reason why we designed the platform that way is because we, we thought it would be very useful to make it so that people could easily bring their data to other, to other services. Some people inside the company argued against that at the time because they were worried that uh, they said, hey, we should just make it so that we can be the only ones who develop this but stuff. Again, that's, but that's we the thought that that was a, a useful thing for people that's to That's the do, user so agreeing it. to allow you to share, when they're using that app, to allow Facebook to share that data. Does the developer ever have access to that prior to users using it? I mean, in developing the application, because it used the term scraped data. What, what does that mean? Who scraped the data? Yes, Senator, this is a good question. So there's the developer platform, which is the sanctioned way that an app developer can ask a person to access information. We also have certain features and certain things that are public, right? A lot of the information that people choose to put on Facebook, they're sharing with everyone in the world, not privately, but um, you know, you put your name, you put your profile picture, that's public information um, that people put out there. And sometimes people who aren't registered developers of Facebook try to load a lot of pages in order to get access to a bunch of people's public information and aggregate it. We fight back hard against that because we don't want anyone to aggregate information even if people made it public and chose to share it with everyone. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. Um, I, I want to talk to a couple of broader issues. I'm concerned that Facebook's profitability rests on two potentially problematic, problematic foundations. And we've heard other senators talk about this a little today. The foundations are maximizing the amount of time people spend on your products and collecting people's data. I've looked at Facebook's 2017 corporate financial statement where you lay out some of the major risks to your business. One risk is a decrease in, and I quote, user engagement, including time spent on our products. That concerns me because of the research we've seen suggesting that too much time spent on social media can hurt people's mental health, especially young people. Another major risk to your business is a potential decline in, and here's another quote, the effectiveness of our ad targeting or the degree to which users opt out of certain types of ad targeting, including as a result of changes that enhance the user's privacy. There's clearly tension, as other senators have pointed out, between your bottom line and what's best for your users. You've said in your testimony that Facebook's mission is to bring the world closer together, and you've said that you will never prioritize advertisers over that mission, and I believe that you believe that. But at the end of the day, 
your business model does prioritize advertisers over the mission. Facebook is a for-profit company, and as a CEO, you have a legal duty to do what's best for your shareholders. So given all of that, why should we think that Facebook on its own will ever truly be able to make the changes that we need it to make to protect Americans' well-being and privacy? Well, Senator, you raise a number of important points in there. So, um, so let me respond in, in sure. a couple of different ways. The, the first is that I think it's really important to think about what we're doing as building this community over the long term. Any business has the opportunity to do things that might increase revenue in the short term, but at the expense of trust or building engagement over time. What we actually find is not necessarily that increasing time spent, especially not just in the short term, is going to be best for our business. It actually it aligns very closely with, um, with the well-being research that we've done, that when people are interacting with other people uh, and, and posting and, and, and basically building relationships, that is both correlated with higher uh, measures of well-being, health, happiness, um, not feeling lonely, um, and that ends up being better for the business than when they're doing lower value things like just passively consuming content. So I think that that's, that's an important point to... Okay, to but, and, and I understand the point that you're trying to make here, but here's what I'm concerned about. We have heard this point from you over the last decade plus. Since you founded Facebook, and I understand it, you've, you founded it pretty much as a solo entrepreneur with your roommate, but now you know, you're sitting here the head of a bazillion dollar company, and we've heard you apologize numerous times and promise to change, but here we are again, right? So I really firmly believe in free enterprise, but when private companies are unwilling or unable to do what's necessary, public officials have historically, in every industry, stepped up to protect our constituents and consumers. You've supported targeted regulations such as the Honest Ads Act, and that's an important step for election integrity. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of that bill. But we need to address other broader issues as well. And today you've said you'd be open to some regulation, but this has been a pretty general conversation. So will you commit to working with Congress to develop ways of protecting constituent privacy and well-being, even if it means that that results in some laws that will require you to adjust your business model? Senator, yes, we will commit to that. I think that that's an important conversation to have. Our position is not that regulation is bad. I think the internet is so important in people's lives and it's getting more important. Yep. The expectations on internet companies and technology companies overall are growing. And I think the real question is, what is the right framework for this, not should there be one? That is very helpful. And I think the other question, and it, it doesn't just go to Facebook, is whether the framework should include financial penalties when large providers like Facebook uh, are breached and privacy is compromised as a result. Because right now there is very little incentive for whether it's Facebook or Equifax to actually be aggressive in protecting customer privacy and looking for potential breaches or vulnerabilities in their system. So what we hear after the fact, after people's privacy has been breached, after they've uh, taken the harm that comes with that and considerable inconvenience in addition to the harm, we've heard apologies, but there is no financial incentive right now, it seems to me, uh, for these companies to aggressively stand in their consumers' stead and protect their privacy, and I would really look forward to working with you on that and getting your considered opinion about it. Well, Senator, we, we look forward to, to discussing that with you. I would disagree, however, that we have no financial incentive or incentive overall to, to do this. Um, this episode has clearly hurt us and has clearly um, made it harder for us to achieve the social mission that we care about, and we now have to do a lot of work around building trust uh, back, which, which is, is just a really important part of this. Well, I thank you. My time is up, uh, and, and I'll follow up with you on that. Senator Capito. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. Um, I, I want to ask just kind of a process question. You've said uh, more than a few times that Facebook users can delete from their own account at any time. Well, we know in the course I do, uh, I've got grandchildren now, but children, you tell your children, once you make that mark, in uh, in cyber or in in the uh, internet system, it never really goes away. 
So my question to you is, if once an, and I think you answered that, that once an individual deletes the information from their page, it's gone forever from Facebook's archives. Is that correct? Yes. And I think you raise a good point, though, which is that it, it, we will delete it from our systems. But if you've shared something to someone else, then we can't guarantee that they don't have it somewhere else. OK, so if somebody leaves Facebook and then rejoins and asks Facebook, can you recreate my past, your answer would be? If they delete their account, the answer is no. That's why we actually offer two options. We offer deactivation, which allows you to shut down or suspend your account but not delete the information. Because actually, a lot of people want to, at least for some period of time, I mean, we hear you know, students with exams coming up want to not be on Facebook because they, they want to make sure that they can focus on the exam. Um, so they deactivate their account temporarily, but then want the ability to turn it back on when they're ready. You can also delete your account, which is wiping everything. And if you so do that, then you can't get it back. You can't get it back. It's gone from your archives. Yes. But is it ever really gone? From our systems, it from, is. From the cloud or wherever it, wherever it is. I mean, it always seems to be able to reappear in investigations and other things. Not necessarily Facebook, but other emails uh, and, and other things of that nature. Um, what about the information going from the past, the information that's already been uh, in the Cam uh, Cambridge Analytica case? You can't really go back and redo that. So I'm going to assume that what we've been talking with and the improvements that you're making now at Facebook are from this point forward. Is that a correct assumption? Senator, I actually do think we can go back in some cases. And that's why one of the things that I announced is that we're going to be investigating every single app that had access to a large amount of information before we locked down the platform in 2014. And if we find any pattern of suspicious activity, then we're going to go do a full audit of their systems. And if we find that anyone's improperly using data, then we'll take action to make sure that they delete the data and we'll inform everyone who, um, who may have had their data misused. Okay, the now, other, I, other suggestion I would make, because we're kind of running out of time here, is you've heard more than a few uh, complaints, and I joined the course, of the, the lapse in the time of when you discovered and when you became transparent. And I understand you sent out two messages just today to, to users. So. Um, I would say, you say you regret that decision, that you wish you'd been more tr transparent at the time. So I would imagine if, in the course of your investigation, you find more um, breaches, so to speak, that you will be re-informing your Facebook uh, uh, customers. Yes, that is correct. We have already committed that if we find any improper use, we will inform everyone affected. Okay, thank you. You've said also that um, you want to have an active view on uh, controlling your ecosystem. Uh, last week, the FDA uh, Commissioner Scott Gottlieb addressed a drug summit in Atlanta and spoke on the national opioid epidemic. My state, I'm from West Virginia, and thank you for visiting. And next time you visit, if you would please bring some fiber because we don't have connectivity uh, in, in our rural areas like we really need, and Facebook could really help us with that. So, so Commissioner Gottlieb called, up, uh, called upon social media and Internet service providers, and he mentioned Facebook when he talked about it, to... Um, try to disrupt the, sal the sale of illegal drugs and particularly powerful opioid fentanyl, which has been advertised and sold online. I know you have policies against this. The uh, commissioner is announcing his intention to convene a meeting of chief executives and senior leaders. And I want to know, can I get a commitment from you today that Facebook will commit to having a representative with Commissioner Gottlieb to finalize with this meeting? Senator, that sounds like an important initiative, and we will send someone. Okay, and let me also say that on your point about connectivity, we do have a, a group at Facebook that is working on trying to spread internet connectivity in rural areas, and we would be happy to follow up with you on that as well. That's something that I'm very passionate about. That's good. That's good news. Last question I have just on the advertising. If somebody advertises on Facebook and somebody purchases something, does Facebook get a uh, percentage or any kind of um, a fee associated with a successful purchase from an advertiser? Senator, no. The way that the system works is people, advertisers bid uh, how much it's worth it to them to show an ad or when an action happens. So um, it's not that we would get a percent of the sale, but let's, let's just use an example. So let's say you have, you're an app developer and you, your goal is you want to get more people to install your app. You could bid in the ad system and say, I will pay $3 anytime someone installs this app. 
and then we basically calculate on, on our side um, which ads are going to be relevant for people. And we have an incentive to show people ads that are going to be relevant because we only get paid when it delivers a business result. And, um, and, and that's, that's how the system works. So it, it could be one, you could be paid for the advertise, I mean for the sale. We, we get paid when the action that the advertiser wants to, to happen uh, happens. All right, thank you. Sen uh, Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you. It's been a long afternoon, and I, I appreciate you being here and, and taking the time with every single one of us. Um, I, I'm going to echo a lot of what I've heard my colleagues say today as well. Um, appreciate you being here. Appreciate the apology, but stop apologizing and let's make the change. Um, I, I think it's time to really change the conduct. I appreciate the fact that you talked about their principles um, for Facebook. Notice to users on the use of the data and that users have complete control of their data. But the skepticism that I have, and I'm hoping you can help me with this, is over the last, what, seven years, seven, 14 years, seven years, um, I haven't seen really much change in ensuring that the privacy is there and that individual users have control over their data. So, so let, me, uh, let me ask you this. Um, back in 2009, uh, you made two changes uh, to your privacy policy. Um, and in fact, prior to that, um, most users could either identify only friends or friends of friends as part of their, their privacy, correct? if they wanted to protect their data. They could uh, identify only friends or friends of friends who could see their data. Isn't that correct? Senator, I believe that we've had the option for people to share with friends, friends of friends, a custom audience, or publicly for a long time. Okay. I, don't, I don't remember exactly when we put that in place, but I believe it was before 2009. So either you can choose only friends or friends of friends to decide how you're going to share that, protect that data, correct? Those are two of the options, yes. Okay, and in 2011, when the FTC started taking a look at this, they um, were concerned that if somebody chose only friends, um, that the individual user was under the impression they could continue to restrict sharing of data to limited audience, but that wasn't the case. And in fact, um, selecting friends only did not prevent users' information from being shared with third, third party, party applications their friend used. Isn't that the case? And that's why the FTC was looking at at uh, you and making that change because there was concern that uh, if you had friends on your page, a third party could access that information. Isn't that correct? Uh, Senator, I, I don't remember the exact context that the... So l let, me, let me help you here because David Vladek, who was uh, spent nearly four years as director of the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection, uh, where he worked, uh, including on uh, the FTC's enforcement case against Facebook, basically um, identifies uh, in this article that that was the case, that not only did um, Facebook misrepresent, and that's why there were eight counts of deceptive acts and practices, the actual FTC in November's 2011 um, decree basically stated, required Facebook to give users clear and conspicuous notice and to obtain affirmative, let me jump back here, to do three things. Uh, the decree barred Facebook from making any further deceptive privacy claims, uh, uh, and it required Facebook get consumers' approval before changing the way it shares their data. And most importantly, the third thing, it required Facebook to give users clear and conspicuous notice and to obtain affirmative express consent before sharing their data with third parties. That was part of the FTC consent decree, correct? Uh, Senator, that sounds right to me. Okay. So at that time, you were on notice that there were concerns about the sharing of uh, data and information, users' data, including those friends with third parties, correct? Senator, my understanding... Well, let me ask you this. Let me do it this way. In response to the FTC consent uh, to make those changes, did you make those changes, and what did you do to ensure individuals' user data was protected and they had notice of that information and that potentially third parties would be accessing that and they had to give express consent. What did you specifically do in response to that? Senator, a number of things. One of the most important parts of the FTC consent decree that we signed was establishing a robust privacy program at the company headed by our chief privacy officer, Aaron Egan. 
Uh, can you give me now... specifics? And, and I know, I, and, and I've heard this over and over again, and I'm running out of time. But he, here's the concern that I have. Um, it can't be a privacy policy because that's what the consent said it couldn't be. It had to be something very specific, something very simple, like you've heard from um, my colleagues, and that did not occur. Had that occurred, we wouldn't be here today talking about Cambridge Analytica. Isn't that really true? It, had you addressed those issues then, had you done an audit, had you looked at um, not only the uh, third-party applications, but their audited their associated data storage as well, you would have known that this type of data information was being shared. And that's our concern, and that's what I'm saying now. Time just to make the change. It's time to really address the privacy issue. It's time to really come and lead the country on this issue and how we can protect individual users' data and information. I know my time is running out, but I, I appreciate you being here, and I'm just hoping that you're committed to working with us in the future and addressing these concerns. Thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for your patience uh, and testimony today. The end is near, uh, I think, one, two, three or four people. So uh, that's good news uh, to get out uh, of this hearing. Um, a couple questions for you. To clarify one of the comments made about deleting uh, accounts from Facebook, in the user agreement it says, when you delete IP content, if, if it is deleted in a manner similar to, it is deleted in a manner similar to emptying the recycle bin on a computer. However, you understand that removed content may persist in backup copies for a reasonable period of time. How long is that? Senator, I don't know sitting here what our current systems are on that, but the intent is to get all the content out of the system as quickly as possible. And does that mean your user data as well? It talks about IP content. Is that the same thing as your user data? It could sit in backup copies? Senator, I think that that is probably right. I, I don't, I'm not sitting here today having full knowledge of, of our current state of the systems around wiping all of the data out of backups. So I can follow up with you on that afterwards. But what I can tell you is but that all backups get wiped. Is, that is certainly the way it's, it, it, it's supposed to work. Has there ever been a failure uh, of that? Senator, I, I don't know. It, uh, this is, if we tell people that we're going to delete their data, we, we need to do that. And you do do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. A couple of other questions. I think that gets to the heart of this expectation gap, as I call it, with, with users. Uh, Facebook, uh, as I understand it, if you're logged into Facebook with a separate browser and you log into another, uh, brow log into another uh, article, uh, open a new tab in the browser, while well, you have the Facebook tab open, and that new tab has a Facebook uh, you know, tr button on it, uh, you track the article that you're reading. Is that correct? Senator, I think I think that there, there is functionality like that, yes. Do you think users understand that? Senator, I think that, they, that there is a reasonable, I think the answer is probably yes for the following reason. Because when we show a like button on a website, we show social context there. So it says, here are your friends who liked that. So in order to do that, we would have to but if, but if you've got your Facebook browser open and you open up the article in the Denver Post and it has a Facebook button on it, you think they know, consumers, users know, that Facebook now knows what article you're reading in the Denver Post? Well, we would need to have that in order to serve up that, the, the like button and show you who your friends were who would also like that. So I, I, I think that goes to the heart of this expectation gap, because I don't think consumers, users necessarily understand that. I mean, and going through this user agreement, as others have, uh, you do need a lawyer uh, to understand it. And I hope that you can close that expectation gap by simplifying the user agreement, making sure that people understand their privacy. Has there ever been a violation outside of the, 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 the talk about Cambridge Analytica uh, about uh, the privacy settings? Has a privacy setting violation ever occurred outside of Cambridge Analytica? Um. I'm not aware that we have had systems that have So the privacy shown setting a, a consumer, a user uses have always been respected. There's never been an instance where those privacy settings have been violated. That's my understanding. I mean, this is the core thing that our company does is you come to Facebook, you say, hey, I want to share this photo or I want to understand. send this message to these people. Has there, ever been, a, we have to, has there ever been a breach uh, of uh, Facebook data, a hack? Um, there have been, I, I don't believe that there has been a breach of data that we are aware of. Has there ever been a hack? 
Yes. And, and, and have those hacks accessed user data? I don't believe so. I think we had an instance back in 2013 where someone was able to install some malware on a few employees' computers and had access to um, some of the content on their computers, but I, I don't believe that they had the access user to data. Page. Never affected the user page? I do not believe so. Okay. Uh, has the government ever asked to remove a page, uh, have a page removed? Uh, Senator, I believe so. Okay. And, and has the government ever, can you get a warrant uh, to join a page, to get to be uh, on a page, pretending you're a separate user, to be liked by that, to track what that person's doing? Do you need a warrant for that, or can the government just do that, the FBI, anybody? Senator, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand. You're saying to... We can, we can follow up on that because I do want to have one final question I want to ask you. Um, a couple days ago, I think Facebook talked about uh, that it would label traditional advocacy as political ads. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, if the Sierra Club was to run a climate change ad, that would be labeled political. Uh, political ad. If the Chamber of Commerce wanted to run an, or place an ad as uh, this would be a, this would have an impact on, the, the, the climate change regulations would have an impact and to talk about that through an ad, that would be labeled as political, which is different than, uh, than current standards of what is political, what is issue advocacy. Um, is it your intent to, to label things political that would be in contradiction to federal law? Senator, the, the intent of what we're trying to get at is the foreign election interference that we've seen has taken more the form of issue ads than direct political electioneering advertising. So because of that, we think it's very important to extend the verification and transparency to issue ads uh, in order to block the kind of um, interference that the Russians attempted to do uh, and, and I think will likely continue to attempt to do. That's why I think that those measures are, are important to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Garner. Uh, Senator Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for being here today, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, I appreciate you coming in. I hope this isn't the last time we see you in front of committee. I know this is, we're approaching five hours, so it's uh, been a little tenuous. Some mental gymnastics for all of us, and I just want to thank you for, for being here. Facebook is an American company. And with that, I believe you've got a responsibility to protect American liberties central to our privacy. Facebook allowed a foreign company to steal private information. They allowed a foreign company to steal private information from tens of millions of Americans, largely without any knowledge of their own. Who and how we choose to share our opinions is a question of personal freedom. Who we share our likes and dislikes with is a question of personal freedom. Uh, this is a troubling ep uh, episode that uh, completely shatters that liberty so that you understand the magnitude of this. Montanans uh, deeply concerned, they are deeply concerned with this breach of privacy and trust. So you've been at this for nearly five hours today. So besides taking reactive steps, and I want you to be as concise as you possibly can, what are you doing to make sure what Cambridge Analytica did never happens again? Thank you, Senator. There are three important steps that we're taking here. For Cambridge Analytica, first of all, we need to finish resolving this by doing a full audit of their systems to make sure that they delete all the data that, that they have and so we can fully understand what happened. There are two sets of steps that we're taking to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The most important is restricting the amount of access to information that developers will have going forward. The good news here is that back in 2014, we actually had already made a large change to restrict access on the platform that would have prevented this issue with Cambridge Analytica from happening again today. Clearly, we did not do that soon enough. Uh, if we'd done it a couple of years earlier, then we probably wouldn't be sitting here today. But this isn't a change that we had to take now in 2018. It's uh, largely a change that we made back in 2014. Okay. There are other parts of the platform that we also similarly can lock down now to make sure that other issues that might have been exploited in, in the future um, won't be able to. And we've taken a number of those steps, and I've outlined those in, in my written statement as well. I appreciate that, and you feel confident that the actions you've taken thus far, whether it was the ones back in 2014 or the one that you just talked about, about locking down the other parts, will uh, adequately protect the folks who use Facebook? Senator, I believe so. 
Okay, Although great. security That's is never a solved problem. So all I need, you talked about a full audit of, the, of Cambridge Analytica systems. Can you do a full audit if that information is stored somewhere, uh, some other country? Senator, if right now uh, we're waiting on the audit because the UK government is doing a government investigation of them. Okay, but and I do believe that the government will have the ability to get into the systems even if we can't. If information what, is stored in the UK, but what if it's stored in some other country? What if the information is stored in some other country? Can, is, is an audit even possible? Well, Senator, we believe a bunch of the information that we, that we will be able to audit. Um, I, I think you raise an important question. And if we have issues, then we, if we are not able to do an audit to our satisfaction, we are going to take legal action to enable us to do that. And, if, and, and also, I know that the UK and US governments are also involved in working on this yeah, as well. I don't, I don't really, I'm telling you, I, I have faith in the US government. I, I really actually have faith in the UK, too. I, uh, there have been claims that this information is being stored in Russia. I don't care. It could be stored anywhere in the world. I don't know how you get access to the, that information. I'm not as smart as you are about tech information. And so the question really becomes, and, and i got to move on, but the question is, it, it, I don't see how you can perform a full audit if they've got stuff stored somewhere else that we can't get access to. That's all. Maybe you have other ideas on how to do that. Well, I think we'll know once we get in there whether we feel like we can fully investigate everything. Just real quickly, uh, Senator Schatz asked a question earlier about, uh, about data and who owns the data. I want to dig into it a little bit more. You said and I think multiple times during this hearing that I own the data on Facebook if it's my data. Yes. And, and I'm going to tell you that I think that that sounds really good to me. But in practice, let's think about this for a second. You're making about 50, 40 billion bucks a year on the data. I'm not making any money on it. It feels like you own the data. And in fact, I would say that the, the data that was um, – that was breached through Cambridge Analytica, which impacted, and correct me if these numbers are wrong, some 80 million Americans. My guess is that few, if any, knew that that information was being breached. If I own that data, I know it's being breached. So could, could you give me some sort of idea on how you can really honestly say it's, it's my data when, quite frankly, uh, they may have goods on me. I don't, I don't want them to have any information on me. Senator, when and I say I it's... If I own it, I can stop it. Yes. So, Senator, when I say it's your data, what we mean is that you have control over how it's used on Facebook. You clearly need to give Facebook a license to use it within our system yeah, or, else, uh, or else the service doesn't work. Yeah, I, I know. And this license has brought, been brought up many times a day, and I'm going to be quiet in just one second, Mr. Chairman. But the fact is, is the license is very thick, maybe intentionally so, so people get tired of reading it and don't want to. Look, Mark, I appreciate you being here. I look forward to having you at another hearing. Thank you. Senator Young. Mr. Zuckerberg, thanks so much for being here and, and uh, enduring uh, the many questions today. I think it's important you're here because uh, social, your social media platform happens to be the ubiquitous social media platform. And uh, there's not a senator that uh, you heard from today that isn't on Facebook, that doesn't communicate with our constituents through Facebook. In a sense, we have to be on it. And um, so I think it's especially important uh, that you're here, not just for Facebook, but uh, really for our country and, and uh, beyond. The threshold question that, that continues to emerge here today is, uh, what are the reasonable expectations of privacy that uh, users ought to have? And uh, I'll tell you, my neighbors are unsatisfied by an answer to that question that involves, uh, you know, take a look at the user agreement. And um, I, I think there's been a fair amount of discussion here about whether or not people actually read that user agreement. I would encourage you to uh, uh, you know, survey that, get all the information you can with respect to that, and uh, make, sure that, uh, uh, make sure that user agreement is, is easy to understand and streamlined and, and so forth. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, earlier in today's hearing, uh, you drew a distinction that I thought was um, interesting. It caught my attention. It was a distinction between consumer expectation of privacy, depending upon whether they were on an ISP, or the pipes of the internet as you characterized it, or on an edge platform like Facebook. I find this distinction uh, somewhat unsatisfying because uh, 
most folks who use the internet uh, just think of it as one place, if you will. Uh, they think of it as the internet as opposed to uh, various places requiring uh, different degrees of privacy. Um, could, you, could you speak to this issue and indicate whether you'd support a comprehensive privacy policy that applies in the same manner uh, to all entities across the entire net, internet ecosystem? Senator, sure. I think that people's expectations of how they use these different systems are different. Some, some apps are very lightweight and as are, and, and you can fully encrypt the data going across them in a way that the app developer or the, the pipes in the ISP case um, you probably shouldn't be able to see any of the content. And I, I think you, you probably should have a full expectation that no one is going to be introspecting or looking at that content. Give me Other some quick services. examples, if you would, kindly, sir. Sure. Well, when data is going over the Verizon network, I think it would be good for that to be as encrypted as possible and such that Verizon um, wouldn't look at it. Right? I think that that's what people expect. And I don't know that being able to look at the data is required to, uh, to deliver their service. That's how WhatsApp works, too. So that's an app. Um, it's a very lightweight app. It doesn't require us to know a lot of information about you. Uh, so we can offer that with full encryption and, and therefore we're not looking, we, we don't see the content. For a service like Facebook or Instagram where you're sharing photos and then they, people wanna access them from lots of different places, people kinda of wanna store that in a central place so that way they can go access it from, from lots of different devices. In order to do that, uh, we need to have an understanding of what that content is so I think the uh, the expectations of, of what Facebook will have knowledge of versus what an ISP will have knowledge of are just different. I think that needs to be clearly communicated uh, to your users, and, and uh, uh, we'll leave it at that, that those, those uh, different uh, levels of privacy that uh, the user uh, can ex expect to enjoy when they're on your platform. I'd like to uh, sort of take a different tack to Internet <coughs> privacy policy with you, sir. Um, might we create stronger privacy rights for consumers, either through creating a stronger general property right regime online, uh, say a new law that states unequivocally, something that you said before, that users own their online data, uh, or through stronger affirmative opt-in requirements on platforms like yours? Now, if we were to do that, would you need to retool your model? if we were to adopt one of those two approaches. Senator, can you repeat what, what the approaches are again? Yeah, so one is to uh, create a stronger uh, property right uh, for the individual online through a law that states unequivocally users okay. own their data. The other one is a stronger affirmative opt-in requirement uh, to be a user on Facebook. Would you have to fundamentally change the Facebook architecture to accommodate those policies? Senator, those policies and the principles that you articulated are generally how we view our service already. So depending on the details of what, what you, your, the proposal actually ends up being, and the details do just matter a huge amount here, um, it's not clear that it would be a fundamental shift. But the details really matter, and if this is something you're considering or working on, uh, we would love to follow up with you on this because this is very important to get right. I'd love to work with you. Um, I'm out of time. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Senator Thune has a closing comment. And yeah, I, just a. And I have a process uh, statement for everybody to listen to. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, and thanks to all of our members for their patience. Uh, been a long hearing, particularly long hearing for you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thank you for for uh, sitting through this, but I think this is important. Uh, I do have a letter here from the Motion Picture Association of America that I want to get. Uh, into the record uh, without objection. Without objection, so order. And then, and just a quick, quick sort of uh, wrap-up question, if you will, and maybe one quick comment. But you've answered several questions uh, about today about efforts to keep bad actors, whether that's a terrorist group to a malicious foreign agent, uh, off of your platform. You've also heard concerns about bias at Facebook, particularly bias against conservatives. And I just was is a. a Final question, can you assure us that when you are improving tools to stop bad actors, that you will err on the side of protecting speech, especially political speech, from all different corners? Senator, yes, that's our, that's our approach. Uh, 
if there is an imminent threat of harm, we're going to take a conservative position on that and make sure that we flag that and understand that more broadly. But overall, I want to make sure that we provide people with the most voice possible. I want the widest possible expression, and I don't want anyone at our company to make any decisions based on the, the uh, political ideology of the content. Yeah. And just one final observation, uh, Chairman Grassley. I, the, the, Mr. Zuckerberg has answered a lot of questions today, um, but there are also a lot of promises to follow up with some of our members, and um, sometimes on questions about Facebook practices that seem fairly straightforward. But I don't think we have, I think it's going to be hard for us to fashion solutions to, to solve some of this stuff uh, until we have some of those answers. And you had indicated earlier that you're continuing to try and find out who among these other um, analytics companies um, may have had access to user data that, uh, that they were able to use. And hopefully, as you get those answers, you will be able to forward those to, uh, to us. And uh, it'll help shape our thinking in terms of how, where we go from here. So, but overall, I think it's a very uh, informative hearing, yeah. Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm ready to wrap it up. Yeah, I probably wouldn't make this comment, but your response to him in regard to political speech, uh, I won't identify the CEO I had a conversation with yesterday, but uh, one of our platforms, and he admitted to being uh, more left than right, or I mean being left, I guess, is what he admitted, and I don't want to, I'm not asking you what you are, but it, uh, but just so you understand that, uh, that probably as liberals have a lot of concerns about uh, you, you know, the leaning of, uh, of uh, Fox News or uh, conservatives have questions about the leaning of, uh, of MSNBC, let's say. Uh, it seems to me that when, you, when we get, whether it's from the right or the left, so I'm speaking to you for your platform, uh, there's a great deal of cynicism in American society about government generally. And then when there is suspicions, legitimate or not, that maybe uh, you're playing it one way unfairly towards the other, it seems to me that everything you can do to lean over backwards to make sure that you are fair in protecting political speech, right or left, that you ought to do it. And I'm not telling you how to do it, and I'm not saying you, you don't do it, but uh, we've we got to do something to reduce this cynicism. Um, at my town meetings in Iowa, I always get this question. How come you guys in D.C. can't get along? You know, meaning Republicans and Democrats. Well, I try to explain to them that they kind of get an uh, obtuse, uh, 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 what would you say, review of what goes on here because controversy makes news. So if people are getting along, you never hear about that. So they get a distorted view of it. And, uh, and, and really, we uh, congressmen get along more than the public thinks. But uh, the, uh, these attitudes of the public, we got to change. And people of your position and your influence, you can do a lot to change this. Whether I, I know you got plenty of time to run your corporation, through your corporation or privately, anything you can do to reduce this cynicism, because we have uh, a perfect constitution. Maybe it's not perfect, but we got a very good constitution, the longest one uh, written constitution in the history of, of ma mankind. And But if people don't have faith in the institutions of government, and then it's, uh, it's our responsibility to enhance that faith so they have less cynicism in us, you know, we don't have a very strong democracy just because we got a good constitution. So I hope that everybody will do whatever they can to help enhance respect for government, including speaking to myself. I got to bend over backwards to do what I can uh, so they don't, so I don't add to that cynicism. So sorry you had to listen to me. Uh, and uh, so this concludes today's hearing. Thanks to all the witnesses for attending. The record will be open for 14 days for the members to submit additional written questions and for the witness, Mr. Zuckerberg, to make any corrections to his testimony. The hearing is adjourned.